Various introductory essays and preface of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. Various introductory essays and preface abraham lincoln the great storytelling president whose emancipation proclamation freed more than four million slaves was a keen politician profound statesman shrewd diplomatist a thorough judge of men and possessed of an intuitive knowledge of affairs he was the first chief executive to die at the hands of an assassin without school education he rose to power by sheer merit and willpower born in a kentucky log cabin in 1809 his surroundings being squalid his chances for advancement were apparently hopeless president lincoln died april 15 1865 having been shot by j wilkes booth the night before preface dean swift said that the man who makes two blades of grass grow where one grew before serves well of his kind considering how much grass there is in the world and comparatively how little fun we think that a still more deserving person is the man who makes many laughs grow where none grew before sometimes it happens that the biggest crop of laugh is produced by a man who ranks among the greatest and wisest such a man was abraham lincoln whose wholesome fun mixed with true philosophy made thousands laugh and think at the same time he was a firm believer in the saying laugh and the world laughs with you whenever abraham lincoln wanted to make a strong point he usually began by saying now that reminds me of a story and when he had told a story every one saw the point and was put into a good humour the ancients had Aesop and his fables. The moderns had Abraham Lincoln and his stories. Aesop's fables have been printed in book form in almost every language, and millions have read them with pleasure and profit. Lincoln's stories are scattered in the recollections of thousands of people in various parts of the country. The historians who wrote histories of Lincoln's life remembered only a few of them but the most of lincoln's stories and the best of them remained unwritten more than five years ago the author of this book conceived the idea of collecting all the yarns and stories the droll sayings and witty and humorous anecdotes of abraham lincoln into one large book and this volume is the result of that idea before lincoln was ever heard of as a lawyer or politician he was famous as a storyteller as a politician, he always had a story to fit the other side. As a lawyer, he won many cases by telling the jury a story which showed them the justice of his side better than any argument could have done. While nearly all of Lincoln's stories have a humorous side, they also contain a moral which every good story should have. They contain lessons that could be taught so well in no other way. Every one of them is a sermon lincoln like the man of galilee spoke to the people in parables nothing that can be written about lincoln can show his character in such a true light as the yarns and stories he was so fond of telling and at which he would laugh as heartily as any one for a man whose life was so full of great responsibilities lincoln had many hours of laughter when the humorous fun-loving side of his great nature asserted itself every person to keep healthy ought to have one good hearty laugh every day lincoln did and the author hopes that the stories at which he laughed will continue to furnish laughter to all who appreciate good humor with a moral point and spiced with that true philosophy bred in those who live close to nature and to the people around them in producing this new lincoln book the publishers have followed an entirely new and novel method of illustrating it the old shop-worn pictures that are to be seen in every history of lincoln and in every other book written about him such as a flatboat on the sangamon river state capitol at springfield old log cabin etc have all been left out and in place of them 
the best special artists that could be employed have supplied original drawings illustrating the point of lincoln's stories these illustrations are not copies of other pictures but are original drawings made from the author's original text expressly for this book in these high-class outline pictures the artists have caught the true spirit of lincoln's humor and while showing the laughable side of many incidents in his career they are true to life in the scenes and characters they portray in addition to these new and original pictures the book contains many rare and valuable photograph portraits together with biographies of the famous men of lincoln's day whose lives formed a part of his own life history no lincoln book heretofore published has ever been so profusely so artistically and expensively illustrated the parables yarns stories anecdotes and sayings of the immortal abe deserve a place beside aesop's fables bunyan's pilgrim's progress and all other books that have added to the happiness and wisdom of mankind lincoln's stories are like lincoln himself the more we know of them the better we like them by colonel alexander k mcclure while lincoln would have been great among the greatest of the land as a statesman and politician if like washington jefferson and jackson he had never told a humorous story his sense of humor was the most fascinating feature of his personal qualities he was the most exquisite humorist i have ever known in my life his humor was always spontaneous and that gave it a zest and elegance that the professional humorist never attains as a rule the men who have become conspicuous in the country as humorists have excelled in nothing else s s cox proctor knott john p hale and others were humorists in congress when they arose to speak if they failed to be humorous they utterly failed and they rarely strove to be anything but humorous such men often fail for the professional humorist however gifted cannot always be at his best and when not at his best he is grievously disappointing i remember corwin of ohio who was a great statesman as well as a great humorist but whose humor predominated in his public speeches in senate and house warning a number of the younger senators and representatives on a social occasion when he had returned to congress in his old age against seeking to acquire the reputation of humorists he said it was the mistake of his life he loved it as did his hearers but the temptation to be humorous was always uppermost and while his speech on the mexican war was the greatest ever delivered in the senate excepting webster's reply to hayne he regretted that he was more known as a humorist than as a statesman his first great achievement in the house was delivered in eighteen forty in reply to general crary of michigan who had attacked general harrison's military career corwin's reply in defense of harrison is universally accepted as the most brilliant combination of humor and invective ever delivered in that body the venerable john quincy adams a day or two after corwin's speech referred to crary as the late general query and the justice of the remark from the old man eloquent was accepted by all mr lincoln differed from the celebrated humorists of the country in the important fact that his humor was unstudied he was not in any sense a professional humorist but i have never in all my intercourse with public men known one who was so apt in humorous illustration as mr lincoln and i have known him many times to silence controversy by a humorous story with pointed application to the issue his face was the saddest in repose that i have ever seen among accomplished and intellectual men and his sympathies for the people for the untold thousands who were suffering bereavement from the war often made him speak with his heart upon his sleeve about the sorrows which shadowed the homes of the land and for which his heart was freely bleeding 
i have many times seen him discussing in the most serious and heartfelt manner the sorrows and bereavement of the country and when it would seem as though the tension was so strained that the brittle cord of life must break his face would suddenly brighten like the sun escaping from behind the cloud to throw its effulgence upon the earth and he would tell an appropriate story and much as his stories were enjoyed by his hearers none enjoyed them more than mr lincoln himself i have often known him within the space of a few minutes to be transformed from the saddest face i have ever looked upon to one of the brightest and most mirthful it was well known that he had his great fountain of humor as a safety valve as an escape and entire relief from the fearful exactions his endless duties put upon him in the gravest consultations of the cabinet where he was usually a listener rather than a speaker he would often end dispute by telling a story and none misunderstood it and often when he was pressed to give expression on particular subjects and his always abundant caution was baffled he many times ended the interview by a story that needed no elaboration i recall an interview with mr lincoln at the white house in the spring of eighteen sixty five just before lee retreated from petersburg it was well understood that the military power of the confederacy was broken and that the question of reconstruction would soon be upon us colonel forney and i had called upon the president simply to pay our respects and while pleasantly chatting with him general benjamin f butler entered forney was a great enthusiast and had intense hatred of the southern leaders who had hindered his advancement when buchanan was elected president and he was bubbling over with resentment against them he introduced the subject to the president of the treatment to be awarded to the leaders of the rebellion when its power should be confessedly broken and he was earnest in demanding that davis and other conspicuous leaders of the confederacy should be tried condemned and executed as traitors general butler joined colonel forney in demanding that treason must be made odious by the execution of those who had wantonly plunged the country into civil war lincoln heard them patiently as he usually heard all and none could tell however carefully they scanned his countenance what impression the appeal made upon him i said to general butler that as a lawyer preeminent in his profession he must know that the leaders of a government that had beleaguered our capital for four years and was openly recognized as a belligerent power not only by our government but by all the leading governments of the world could not be held to answer to the law for the crime of treason butler was vehement in declaring that the rebellious leaders must be tried and executed lincoln listened to the discussion for half an hour or more and finally ended it by telling the story of a common drunkard out in illinois who had been induced by his friends time and again to join the temperance society but had always broken away he was finally gathered up again and given notice that if he violated his pledge once more they would abandon him as an utterly hopeless vagrant he made an earnest struggle to maintain his promise, and finally he called for lemonade and said to the man who was preparing it, Couldn't you put just a drop of the crater in, unbeknownst to me? After telling the story, Lincoln simply added, If these men could get away from the country unbeknownst to us, it might save a world of trouble. All understood precisely what Lincoln meant although he had given expression in the most cautious manner possible and the controversy was ended lincoln differed from professional humorists in the fact that he never knew when he was going to be humorous it bubbled up on the most unexpected occasions and often unsettled the most carefully studied arguments i have many times been with him when he gave no sign of humor and those who saw him under such conditions would naturally suppose that he was incapable of a humorous expression at other times he would effervesce with humor and always of the most exquisite and impressive nature his humor was never strained his stories never stale and even if old the application he made of them gave them the freshness of originality 
i recall sitting beside him in the white house one day when a message was brought to him telling of the capture of several brigadier generals and a number of horses somewhere out in virginia he read the dispatch and then in an apparently soliloquizing mood said sorry for the horses i can make brigadier generals there are many who believe that mr lincoln loved to tell obscene or profane stories but they do great injustice to one of the purest and best men i have ever known his humor must be judged by the environment that aided in its creation as a prominent lawyer who traveled the circuit in illinois he was much in the company of his fellow lawyers who spent their evenings in the rude taverns of what was then almost frontier life the western people thus thrown together with but limited resources of culture and enjoyment logically cultivated the storyteller and lincoln proved to be the most accomplished in that line of all the members of the illinois bar they had no private rooms for study and the evenings were always spent in the common bar room of the tavern where western wit often vulgar or profane was freely indulged in and the best of them at times told stories which were somewhat broad but even while thus indulging in humor that would grate harshly upon severely refined hearers they despised the vulgarian none despised vulgarity more than lincoln i have heard him tell at one time or another almost all or quite all of the stories he told during his presidential term and there were very few of them which might not have been repeated in a parlor and none descended to obscene vulgar or profane expressions i have never known a man of purer instincts than abraham lincoln and his appreciation of all that was beautiful and good was of the highest order it was fortunate for mr lincoln that he frequently sought relief from the fearfully oppressive duties which bore so heavily upon him he had immediately about him a circle of men with whom he could be at home in the white house any evening as he was with his old-time friends on the illinois circuit david davis was one upon whom he most relied as an adviser and leonard sweat was probably one of his closest friends while ward layman whom he made marshal of the district of columbia to have him by his side was one with whom he felt entirely at home davis was one of a more sober order but loved lincoln's humor although utterly incapable of a humorous expression himself sweat was ready with lincoln to give and take in storyland as was layman and either of them and sometimes all of them often dropped in upon lincoln and gave him an hour's diversion from his exacting cares they knew that he needed it and they sought him for the purpose of diverting him from what they feared was an excessive strain his devotion to layman was beautiful i well remember at harrisburg on the night of february twenty two eighteen sixty one when at a dinner given by governor curtin to mr lincoln then on his way to washington we decided against the protest of lincoln that he must change his route to washington and make the memorable midnight journey to the capital it was thought to be best that but one man should accompany him and he was asked to choose there were present of this suite colonel sumner afterwards one of the heroic generals of the war norman b judd who was chairman of the republican state committee of illinois colonel layman and others and he promptly chose colonel layman who alone accompanied him on his journey from harrisburg to philadelphia and thence to washington before leaving the room governor curtin asked colonel layman whether he was armed and he answered by exhibiting a brace of fine pistols a huge bowie knife a blackjack and a pair of brass knuckles curtin answered uh, you'll do and they were started on their journey after all the telegraph wires had been cut we awaited through what seemed almost an endless night until the east was purpled with the coming of another day when Colonel Scott, who had managed the whole scheme, reunited the wires, and soon received from Colonel Lehman this dispatch, Plums delivered nuts safely, which gave us the intensely gratifying information that Lincoln had arrived in Washington. 
of all the presidents of the united states and indeed of all the great statesmen who have made their indelible impress upon the policy of the republic abraham lincoln stands out single and alone in his individual qualities he had little experience in statesmanship when he was called to the presidency he had only a few years of service in the state legislature of illinois and a single term in congress ending twelve years before he became president but he had to grapple with the gravest problem ever presented to the statesmanship of the nation for solution and he met each and all of them in turn with the most consistent mastery and settled them so successfully that all have stood unquestioned until the present time and are certain to endure while the republic lives in this he surprised not only his own cabinet and the leaders of his party who had little confidence in him when he first became president but equally surprised the country and the world he was patient tireless and usually silent when great conflicts raged about him to solve the appalling problems which were present at various stages of the war for determination and when he reached his conclusion he was inexorable the wrangles of faction and the jostling of ambition were compelled to bow when lincoln had determined upon his line of duty he was much more than a statesman he was one of the most sagacious politicians i have ever known although he was entirely unschooled in the machinery by which political results are achieved his judgment of men was next to unerring and when results were to be attained he knew the men who should be assigned to the task and he rarely made a mistake i remember one occasion when he summoned colonel forney and myself to confer on some political problem he opened the conversation by saying you know that i never was much of a conniver i don't know the methods of political management and i can only trust to the wisdom of leaders to accomplish what is needed lincoln's public acts are familiar to every schoolboy of the nation but his personal attributes which are so strangely distinguished from the attributes of other great men are now the most interesting study of young and old throughout our land and i can conceive of no more acceptable presentation to the public than a compilation of anecdote and incidents pertaining to the life of the greatest of all our presidents a k mcclure lincoln and mcclure from harper's weekly april thirteenth nineteen o one colonel alexander k mcclure the editorial director of the philadelphia times which he founded in eighteen seventy five began his forceful career as a tanner's apprentice in the mountains of pennsylvania threescore years ago he tanned hides all day and read exchanges nights in the neighboring weekly newspaper office the learned tanner's boy also became the aptest inner in the county and the editor testified his admiration for young mcclure's attainments by sending him to edit a new weekly paper which the exigencies of politics called into being in an adjoining county the lad was over six feet high and had the thews of ajax and the voice of boanerges and knew enough about shoe leather not to be afraid of any man that stood in it he made his paper a success went into politics and made that a success studied law with william mcclellan and made that a success and actually went into the army and made that a success by an interesting accident which brought him into close personal relations with abraham lincoln whom he had helped to nominate serving as chairman of the republican state committee of pennsylvania through the campaign in eighteen sixty two the government needed troops badly and in each pennsylvania county republicans and democrats were appointed to assist in the enrollment under the state laws mcclure working day and night at harrisburg saw conscripts coming in at the rate of a thousand a day only to fret in idleness against the army red tape which held them there instead of sending a regiment a day to the front as mcclure demanded should be done the military officer continued to dispatch two companies a day leaving the mass of the conscripts to be fed by the contractors 
mcclure went to washington and said to the president you must send a mustering officer to harrisburg who will do as i say i can't stay there any longer under existing conditions lincoln went into another room for adjutant general thomas general said he what is the highest rank of military officer at harrisburg captain sir said thomas bring me a commission for an assistant adjutant general of the united states army said lincoln so adjutant general mcclure was mustered in and after that a regiment a day of boys in blue left harrisburg for the front colonel mcclure is one of the group of great celt american editors which included medell mcculloch and mclean end of introductory essays part one of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part one lincoln asked to be shot lincoln was naturally enough much surprised one day when a man of rather forbidding countenance drew a revolver and thrust the weapon almost into his face in such circumstances abe at once concluded that any attempt at debate or argument was a waste of time and words what seems to be the matter inquired lincoln with all the calmness and self-possession he could muster well replied the stranger who did not appear at all excited some years ago i swore an oath that if i ever came across an uglier man than myself i'd shoot him on the spot a feeling of relief evidently took possession of lincoln at this rejoinder as the expression upon his countenance lost all suggestion of anxiety shoot me he said to the stranger for if i am an uglier man than you i don't want to live time lost didn't count thurlow weed the veteran journalist and politician once related how when he was opposing the claims of montgomery blair who aspired to a cabinet appointment that mr lincoln inspired of mr weed whom he would recommend henry winter davis was the response david davis i see has been posting you up on this question retorted lincoln he has davis on the brain i think maryland must be a good state to move from the president then told a story of a witness in court in a neighboring county who on being asked his age replied sixty being satisfied he was much older the question was repeated and on receiving the same answer the court admonished the witness saying the court knows you to be much older than sixty oh i understand now was the rejoinder you're thinking of those ten years i spent on the eastern shore of maryland that was so much time lost and didn't count blair was made postmaster general no vices no virtues lincoln always took great pleasure in relating this yarn riding at one time in a stage with an old kentuckian who was returning from missouri lincoln excited the old gentleman's surprise by refusing to accept either of tobacco or french brandy when they separated that afternoon the kentuckian to take another stage bound for louisville he shook his hand warmly with lincoln and said good-humouredly see here stranger you're a clever but strange companion i may never see you again and i don't want to offend you but i want to say this my experience has taught me that a man who has no vices has damned few virtues good day lincoln's dues miss todd afterward mrs lincoln had a keen sense of the ridiculous and wrote several articles in the springfield illinois journal reflecting severely upon general james shields who won fame in the mexican and civil wars and was united states senator from three states then auditor of state lincoln assumed the authorship and was challenged by shields to meet him on the field of honor meanwhile miss todd increased shields ire by writing another letter to the paper in which she said i hear the way of these fire-eaters is to give the challenged party the choice of weapons which being the case i'll tell you in confidence that i never fight with anything but broomsticks or hot water or a shovelful of coals the former of which being somewhat like a shillelagh may not be objectionable to him 
Lincoln accepted the challenge and selected broadswords as the weapons. Judge Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, gives the closing of this affair as follows. The laws of Illinois prohibited dueling, and Lincoln demanded that the meeting should be outside the state. Shields undoubtedly knew that Lincoln was opposed to fighting a duel, that his moral sense would revolt at the thought, and that he would not be likely to break the law by fighting in the state. Possibly he thought Lincoln would take a humble apology. Shields was brave, but foolish, and would not listen to overtures for explanation. It was arranged that the meeting should be in Missouri, opposite Alton. They proceeded to the place selected, but friends interfered, and there was no duel. There is little doubt that the man who had swung a beetle and driven iron wedges into gnarled hickory logs could have cleft the skull of his antagonist, but he had no such intention. He repeatedly said to the friends of Shields that in writing the first article he had no thought of anything personal. The auditor's vanity had been sorely wounded by the second letter, in regard to which Lincoln could not make any explanation, except that he had had no hand in writing it. The affair set all Springfield to laughing at Shields. Done with the Bible. Lincoln never told a better story than this. A country meeting house that was used once a month was quite a distance from any other house. The preacher, an old line Baptist, was dressed in coarse linen pantaloons and shirt of the same material. The pants, manufactured after the old fashion with baggy legs and a flap in the front, were made to attach to his frame with the aid of suspenders. A single button held his shirt in position, and that was at the collar. He rose up in the pulpit and with a loud voice announced his text, thus, I am the Christ whom I shall represent today. About this time a little blue lizard ran up his roomy pantaloons. The old preacher, not wishing to interrupt the steady flow of his sermon, slapped away on his leg, expecting to arrest the intruder, but his efforts were unavailing and the little fellow kept on ascending higher and higher. Continuing the sermon, the preacher loosened the central button, which graced the waistband of his pantaloons, and with a kick off came that easy-fitting garment. But meanwhile, Mr. Lizard had passed the equatorial line of the waistband and was calmly exploring that part of the preacher's anatomy which lay beneath the back of his shirt. Things were now growing interesting, but the sermon was still grinding on. The next movement on the preacher's part was for the collar button, and with one sweep of his arm, off came the toe linen shirt. The congregation sat for an instant as if dazed. At length, one old lady in the rear part of the room rose up and, glancing at the excited object in the pulpit, shouted at the top of her voice, If you represent Christ, then I'm done with the Bible. His Knowledge of Human Nature once, when Lincoln was pleading a case, the opposing lawyer had all the advantage of the law. The weather was warm, and his opponent, as was admissible in frontier courts, pulled off his coat and vest as he grew warm in the argument. At that time, shirts with buttons behind were unusual. Lincoln took in the situation at once. Knowing the prejudices of the primitive people against pretension of all sorts, or any affectation of superior social rank, arising, he said, Gentlemen of the jury, having justice on my side, I don't think you will be at all influenced by the gentleman's pretended knowledge of the law, when you see he does not even know which side of his shirt should be in front. There was a general laugh, and Lincoln's case was won. A Mischievous Ox President Lincoln once told the following story of Colonel W., who had been elected to the legislature and had also been judge of the county court. His elevation, however, had made him somewhat pompous, and he became very fond of using big words. On his farm he had a very large and mischievous ox called Big Brindle, which very frequently broke down his neighbor's fences and committed other depredations, much to the colonel's annoyance. One morning, after breakfast, in the presence of Lincoln, who had stayed with him overnight and who was on his way to town, he called his overseer and said to him, 
mr allen i desire you to impound big brindle in order that i may hear no animadversions on his eternal depredations allen bowed and walked off sorely puzzled to know what the colonel wanted him to do after colonel w left for town he went to his wife and asked her what the colonel meant by telling him to impound the ox why he meant to tell you to put him in a pen said she allen left to perform the feat for it was no inconsiderable one as the animal was wild and vicious but after a great deal of trouble and vexation succeeded well said he wiping the perspiration from his brow and soliloquizing this is impounding is it now i am dead sure that the colonel will ask me if i impounded big brindle and i'll bet i puzzle him as he did me the next day the colonel gave a dinner party and as he was not aristocratic allen the overseer sat down with the company after the second or third glass was discussed the colonel turned to the overseer and said ah, mr allen did you impound a big brindle sir allen straightened himself and looking around at the company replied uh, yes i did sir but old brindle transcended the impanel of the impound and uh, slaughter schlippicated all over the equanimity of the forest the company burst into an immoderate fit of laughter while the colonel's face reddened with discomfiture what do you mean by that sir demanded the colonel why i mean colonel replied allen that old brindle being prognosticated with an idea of the cholera ripped and teared snorted and pawed dirt jumped the fence tucked to the woods and would not be impounded nohow this was too much the company roared again and the colonel being forced to join in the laughter and in the midst of the jollity allen left the table saying to himself as he went i reckon the colonel won't ask me to impound any more oxen the presidential chin fly some of mr lincoln's intimate friends once called his attention to a certain member of his cabinet who was quietly working to secure a nomination for the presidency although knowing that mr lincoln was to be a candidate for re-election his friends insisted that the cabinet officer ought to be made to give up his presidential aspirations or be removed from office the situation reminded mr lincoln of a story my brother and i he said were once ploughing corn, I driving the horse and he holding the plough. The horse was lazy, but on one occasion he rushed across the field, so that I, with my long legs, could scarcely keep pace with him. On reaching the end of the furrow, I found an enormous chin-fly fastened upon him, and knocked him off. My brother asked me what I did that for. I told him I didn't want the old horse bitten in that way. Why, said my brother, that's all that made him go now said mr lincoln if mr blank has a presidential chin fly biting him i'm not going to knock him off if it will only make his department go squire bagley's precedent mr t w s kidd of springfield says that he once heard a lawyer opposed to lincoln trying to convince a jury that precedent was superior to law and that custom made things legal in all cases when lincoln arose to answer him he told the jury he would argue his case in the same way old squire bagley from meenard came into my office and said lincoln i want your advice as a lawyer as a man what's been elected justice of the peace a right to issue a marriage license i told him he had not when the old squire threw himself back in his chair very indignantly and said lincoln i thought you was a lawyer now bob thomas and me had a bet on this thing and we agreed to let you decide but if this is your opinion i don't want it for i know a thundering sight better for i have been squire now for eight years and have done it all the time he'd need his gun when the president early in the war was anxious about the defenses of washington he told a story illustrating his feelings in the case General Scott, then Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army, had but 1,500 men, two guns, and an old sloop of war, the latter anchored in the Potomac, with which to protect the national capital, and the President was uneasy. To one of his queries as to the safety of Washington, General Scott had replied, "'It has been ordained, Mr. President, that the city shall not be captured by the Confederates.' 
but we ought to have more men and guns here was the chief executive answer the confederates are not such fools as to let a good chance to capture washington go by and even if it has been ordained that the city is safe i'd feel easier if it were better protected all this reminds me of the old trapper out in the west who had been assured by some city folks who had hired him as a guide that all matters regarding life and death were prearranged. It is ordained, said one of the party to the old trapper, that you are to die at a certain time, and no one can kill you before that time. If you met a thousand Indians, and your death had not been ordained for that day, you would certainly escape. I don't exactly understand this ordained business, was the trapper's reply. I don't care to run no risk. I always have my gun with me, so that if I come across some reds, I can feel sure that I won't cross the Jordan without taking some of them with me. Now, for instance, if I met an Indian in the woods, he drew a bead on me, saying, too, that he wasn't more than ten feet away, and I didn't have nothing to defend myself. Say it was as bad as that, the redskin being dead, ready to kill me. Now, even if it had been ordained that the Indian, saying he was a good shot, was to die that very minute, and I wasn't. What would I do without my gun? There you are, the President remarked, even if it has been ordained that the city of Washington will never be taken by the Southerners. What would we do in case they made an attack upon the place without men and heavy guns? Kept up the argument. Judge T. Lyle Dickey of Illinois related that when the excitement over the Kansas-Nebraska bill first broke out, he was with Lincoln and several friends attending court. One evening, several persons, including himself and Lincoln, were discussing the slavery question. Judge Dickey contended that slavery was an institution which the Constitution recognized and which could not be disturbed. Lincoln argued that ultimately slavery must become extinct. After a while, said Judge Dickey, we went upstairs to bed. There were two beds in our room, and I remember that Lincoln sat up in his nightshirt on the edge of the bed, arguing the point with me. At last, we went to sleep. Early in the morning, I woke up, and there was Lincoln half sitting up in bed. Dicky said he, I tell you, this nation cannot exist half slave and half free. Oh, Lincoln, said I, go to sleep. Equine Ingratitude President Lincoln, while eager that the United States troops should be supplied with the most modern and serviceable weapons, often took occasion to put his foot down upon the mania for experimenting with which some of his generals were afflicted. While engaged in these experiments, much valuable time was wasted, the enemy was left to do as he thought best, no battles were fought, and opportunities for winning victories allowed to pass. The president was an exceedingly practical man, and when an invention, idea, or discovery was submitted to him, his first step was to ascertain how any or all of them could be applied in a way to be of benefit to the army. As to experimenting with contrivances, which to his mind could never be put to practical use, he had little patience. Some of these generals, said he, experiment so long and so much with newfangled fancy notions that when they are finally brought to a head, they are useless. Either the time to use them has gone by, or the machine, when put in operation, kills more than it cures. One of these generals, who has a scheme for condensing rations, is willing to swear his life away that his idea, when carried to perfection, will reduce the cost of feeding the Union troops to almost nothing, while the soldiers themselves will get so fat that they'll bust out of their uniforms. Of course, uniforms cost nothing, and real fat men are more active and vigorous than lean skinny ones, but that is getting away from my story. There was once an Irishman, a cabman, who had a notion that he could induce his horse to live entirely on shavings. The latter he could get for nothing, while corn and oats were pretty high priced. So he daily lessened the amount of food to the horse, substituting shavings for the corn and oats abstracted, so that the horse wouldn't know his rations were being cut down. 
However, just as he had achieved success in his experiment, and the horse had been taught to live without other food than shavings, the ungrateful animal up and died, and he had to buy another. So far as this general referred to is concerned, I'm afraid the soldiers will be dead at the time when his experiment is demonstrated as thoroughly successful. Twas moving day. Speed, who was a prosperous young merchant of Springfield, reports that Lincoln's personal effects consisted of a pair of saddlebags containing two or three law books and a few pieces of clothing. Riding on a borrowed horse, he thus made his appearance in Springfield. When he discovered that a single bedstead would cost $17, he said, It is probably cheap enough, but I have not enough money to pay for it. When Speed offered to trust him, he said, if I fail here as a lawyer, I will probably never pay you at all. Then Speed offered to share large double bed with him. Where is your room? Lincoln asked. Upstairs, said Speed, pointing from the store, leading to his room. Without saying a word, he took his saddlebags on his arm, went upstairs, set them down on the floor, came down again, and with a face beaming with pleasure and smiles exclaimed, Well, Speed, I'm moved. Abe's hair needed combing. By the way, remarked President Lincoln one day to Colonel Cannon, a close personal friend, I can tell you a good story about my hair. When I was nominated at Chicago, an enterprising fellow thought a great many people would like to see how Abe Lincoln looked, and as I had not long before sat for a photograph, the fellow, having seen it, rushed over and bought the negative. He at once got no end of woodcuts, and so active was their circulation, they were soon selling in all parts of the country. Soon after they reached Springfield, I heard a boy crying them for sale on the streets. "'Here's your likeness of Abe Lincoln,' he shouted. "'Buy one. Price only two shillings. Will look a great deal better when he gets his hair combed.' Would uh, take to the woods. Secretary of State Seward was bothered considerably regarding the complication into which Spain had involved the United States government in connection with San Domingo and related his troubles to the president. Negotiations were not proceeding satisfactorily, and things were mixed generally. We wished to conciliate Spain while the Negroes had appealed against Spanish oppression. The president did not, to all appearances, look at the matter seriously, but instead of treating the situation as a grave one, remarked that Seward's dilemma reminded him of an interview between two Negroes in Tennessee. One was a preacher who, with the crude and strange notions of his ignorant race, was endeavoring to admonish and enlighten his brother African of the importance of religion and the danger of the future. "'Dar are,' said Josh the preacher, "'to rose before you, Joe, and be careful which of these you take.' narrow am de way dat leads straight to destruction but broad am de way dat leads right to damnation joe opened his eyes with a fright and under the spell of the awful danger before him exclaimed josh take which road you please i shall go true to woods i am not willing concluded the president to assume any new troubles or responsibilities at this time and shall therefore avoid going to the one place with spain or with the negro to the other but shall take to the woods we will maintain an honest and strict neutrality lincoln carried her trunk my first strong impression of mr lincoln says a lady of springfield was made by one of his kind deeds i was going with a little friend for my first trip alone on the railroad cars it was an epoch of my life I had planned for it and dreamed of it for weeks. The day I was to go came, but as the hour of the train approached, the hackman, through some neglect, failed to call for my trunk. As the minutes went on, I realized in a panic of grief that I should miss the train. I was standing by the gate, my hat and gloves on, sobbing as if my heart would break, when Mr. Lincoln came by. "'Why, what is the matter?' he asked and I poured out all my story. How big's the trunk? There's still time if it isn't too big. And he pushed through the gate and up to the door. 
my mother and i took him up to my room where my little old-fashioned trunk stood locked and tied oh he cried wipe your eyes and come on quick and before i knew what he was going to do he had shouldered the trunk was downstairs and striding out of the yard down the street he went fast as his long legs would carry him i trotted behind drying my tears as i went we reached the station in time mr lincoln put me on the train kissed me good-bye and told me to have a good time it was just like him boat had to stop lincoln never failed to take part in all political campaigns in illinois as his reputation as a speaker caused his services to be in great demand as was natural he was often the target at which many of the smart alecks of that period shot their feeble bolts but lincoln was so ready with his answers that few of them cared to engage him a second time in one campaign lincoln was frequently annoyed by a young man who entertained the idea that he was a born orator he had a loud voice was full of language and so conceited that he could not understand why the people did not recognize and appreciate his abilities this callow politician delighted in interrupting public speakers and at last lincoln determined to squelch him one night while addressing a large meeting at springfield the fellow became so offensive that abe dropped the threads of his speech and turned his attention to the tormentor i don't object said lincoln to being interrupted with sensible questions but i must say that my boisterous friend does not always make inquiries which properly come under that head he says he is afflicted with headaches at which i don't wonder as it is a well-known fact that nature abhors a vacuum and takes her own way of demonstrating it this noisy friend reminds me of a certain steamboat that used to run on the illinois river it was an energetic boat was always busy when they built it however they made one serious mistake this error being in the relative sizes of the boiler and the whistle the latter was usually busy too and people were aware that it was in existence this particular boiler to which i have reference was a six-foot one and did all that was required of it in the way of pushing the boat along but as the builders of the vessel had made the whistle a six-foot one the consequence was that every time the whistle blew the boat had to stop end of part one part two of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part two mcclellan's special talent president lincoln one day remarked to a number of personal friends who had called upon him at the white house general mcclellan's tardiness and unwillingness to fight the enemy or follow up advantages gains reminds me of a man back in illinois who knew a few law phrases but whose lawyer lacked aggressiveness the man finally lost all patience and springing to his feet vociferated why don't you go at him with a fee fi a demurrer a capias a suraberta or a na exet or something or a nundum pactum or a non est i wish mcclellan would go at the enemy with something i don't care what general mcclellan is a pleasant and scholarly gentleman he is an admirable engineer but he seems to have a special talent for a stationary engine how jake got away one of the last if not the very last story told by president lincoln was to one of his cabinet who came to see him to ask if it would be proper to permit jake thompson to slip through maine in disguise and embark for portland the president as usual was disposed to be merciful and to permit the arch rebel to pass unmolested but secretary stanton urged that he should be arrested as a traitor by permitting him to escape the penalties of treason persisted the war secretary you sanction it well replied mr lincoln let me tell you a story there was an irish soldier here last summer who wanted something to drink stronger than water and stopped at a drug shop where he espied a soda fountain 
mr doctor said he give me please a glass of soda water and if you was can put a few drops of whiskey unbeknownst to any one i'd be obliged now continued mr lincoln if jake thompson is permitted to go through maine unbeknownst to any one what's the harm so don't have him arrested more light and less noise the president was bothered to death by those persons who boisterously demanded that the war be pushed vigorously also those who shouted their advice and opinions into his weary ears but who never suggested anything practical these fellows were not in the army nor did they ever take any interest in a personal way in military matters except when engaged in dodging drafts that reminds me remarked mr lincoln one day of a farmer who lost his way on the western frontier night came on and the embarrassments of his position were increased by a furious tempest which suddenly burst upon him to add to his discomfort his horse had given out leaving him exposed to all the dangers of the pitiless storm the peals of thunder were terrific the frequent flashes of lightning affording the only guide on the road as he resolutely trudged onward leading his jaded steed the earth seemed fairly to tremble beneath him in the war of the elements one bolt threw him suddenly upon his knees our traveller was not a prayerful man but finding himself involuntarily brought to an attitude of devotion he addressed himself to the throne of grace in the following prayer for his deliverance o oh god hear my prayer this time for thou knowest it is not often that i call upon thee and o oh lord if it is all the same to thee give us a little more light and a little less noise i wish the president said sadly that there was a stronger disposition manifested on the part of our civilian warriors to unite in suppressing the rebellion and a little less noise as to how and by whom the chief executive office shall be administered one bullet and a hatful lincoln made the best of everything and if he couldn't get what he wanted he took what he could get in matters of policy while president he acted according to this rule he would take perilous chances even when the result was to the minds of his friends not worth the risk he had run one day at a meeting of the cabinet it being at the time when it seemed as though war with england and france could not be avoided secretary of state seward and secretary of war stanton warmly advocated that the united states maintain an attitude the result of which would have been a declaration of hostilities by the european powers mentioned why take any more chances than are absolutely necessary asked the president we must maintain our honor at any cost insisted secretary seward we would be branded as cowards before the entire world secretary stanton said but why run the greater risk when we can take a smaller one queried the president calmly the less risk we run the better for us that reminds me of a story i heard a day or two ago the hero of which was on the firing line during a recent battle where the bullets were flying thick finally his courage gave way entirely and throwing down his gun he ran for dear life as he was flying along at top speed he came across an officer who drew his revolver and shouted go back to your regiment at once or i will shoot you shoot and be hanged the racer exclaimed what's one bullet to a whole hatful lincoln's story to peace commissioners among the reminiscences of lincoln left by editor henry j raymond is the following among the stories told by lincoln which is freshest in my mind one which he related to me shortly after its occurrence belongs to the history of the famous interview on board the river queen at hampton roads between himself and secretary seward and the rebel peace commissioners it was reported at the time that the president told a little story on that occasion and the inquiry went round among the newspapers what was it the new york herald published what purported to be a version of it but the point was entirely lost and it attracted no attention being in washington a few days subsequent to the interview with the commissioners my previous sojourn there having terminated about the first of last august i asked mr lincoln one day if it was true that he had told stevens hunter and campbell a story 
why yes he replied manifesting some surprise but has it leaked out i was in hopes nothing would be said about it lest some oversensitive people should imagine there was a degree of levity in the intercourse between us he then went on to relate the circumstances which called it out you see said he we had reached and were discussing the slavery question mr hunter said substantially that the slaves always accustomed to an overseer and to work upon compulsion suddenly freed as they would be if the south should consent to peace on the basis of the emancipation proclamation would precipitate not only themselves but the entire southern society into irremediable ruin no work would be done nothing would be cultivated and both blacks and whites would starve said the president i waited for seward to answer that argument but as he was silent i at length said mr hunter you ought to know a great deal better about this argument than i for you have always lived under the slave system i can only say in reply to your statement of the case that it reminds me of a man out in illinois by the name of case who undertook a few years ago to raise a very large herd of hogs it was a great trouble to feed them and how to get around this was a puzzle to him at length he hit on the plan of planting an immense field of potatoes and when they were sufficiently grown he turned the whole herd into the field and let them have full swing thus saving not only the labor of feeding the hogs but also that of digging the potatoes charmed with his sagacity he stood one day leaning against the fence counting his hogs when a neighbor came along well well said he mr case this is all very fine your hogs are doing very well just now but you know out here in illinois the frost comes early and the ground freezes for a foot deep then what are you going to do this was a view of the matter which mr case had not taken into account butchering time for hogs was uh, way on in december or january he scratched his head and at length stammered well it may come pretty hard on their snouts but i don't see but that it will be root hog or die abe got the worst of it when lincoln was a young lawyer in illinois he and a certain judge once got to bantering one another about trading horses and it was agreed that the next morning at nine o'clock they would make a trade the horses to be unseen up to that hour and no backing out under a forfeiture of twenty five dollars at the hour appointed the judge came up leading the sorriest looking specimen of a horse ever seen in those parts in a few minutes mr lincoln was seen approaching with a wooden sawhorse upon his shoulders great were the shouts and laughter of the crowd and both were greatly increased when lincoln on surveying the judge's animal set down his sawhorse and exclaimed well judge this is the first time i ever got the worst of it in a horse trade it depended upon his condition the president had made arrangements to visit new york and was told that president garrett of the baltimore and ohio railroad would be glad to furnish a special train oh i don't doubt it a bit remarked the president for i know mr garrett and like him very well and if i believed which i don't by any means all the things some people say about his success principles he might say to you as was said by the superintendent of a certain railroad to a son of one of my predecessors in office some two years after the death of president harrison the son of his successor in this office wanted to take his father on an excursion somewhere or other and went to the superintendent's office to order a special train this superintendent was a whig of the most uncompromising sort who hated a democrat more than all other things on the earth and promptly refused the young man's request his language being to the effect that this particular railroad was not running special trains for the accommodation of presidents of the united states just at that season the son of the president was much surprised and exceedingly annoyed why he said you have run special presidential trains and i know it didn't you furnish a special train for the funeral of president harrison certainly we did calmly replied the superintendent with no relaxation of his features and if you will only bring your father here in the same shape as general harrison was you shall have the best train on the road 
when the laughter had subsided the president said i shall take pleasure in accepting mr garrett's offer as i have no doubts whatever as to his loyalty to the united states government or his respect for the occupant of the presidential office got down to the raisins a b chandler chief of the telegraph office at the war department occupied three rooms one of which was called the president's room so much of his time did mr lincoln spend there here he would read over the telegrams received for the several heads of departments three copies of all messages received were made one for the president one for the war department records and one for secretary stanton mr chandler told a story as to the manner in which the president read the dispatches president lincoln's copies were kept in what we called the president's drawer of the cipher desk he would come in at any time of the night or day and go at once to this drawer and take out a file of telegrams and began at the top to read them his position in running over these telegrams was sometimes very curious he had a habit of sitting frequently on the edge of his chair with his right knee dragged down to the floor i remember a curious expression of his when he got to the bottom of the new telegrams and began on those he had read before it was well i guess i've got down to the raisins the first two or three times he said this he made no explanation and i did not ask one but one day, after he had made the remark, he looked up under his eyebrows at me with a funny twinkle in his eyes and said, I used to know a little girl out west who sometimes was inclined to eat too much. One day she ate a good many more raisins than she ought to, and followed them up with a quantity of other goodies. They made her very sick. After a time the raisins began to come. She gasped and looked at her mother and said, well i will be better now i guess for i've got down to the raisins honest abe swallows his enemies honest abe taking them on the half shell was one of the cartoons published in eighteen sixty by one of the illustrated periodicals as may be seen it represents lincoln in a political oyster house preparing to swallow two of his democratic opponents for the presidency douglas and breckinridge he performed the feat at the November election. The Democratic Party was hopelessly split in 1860. The Northern Wing nominated Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois as their candidate, the Southern Wing naming John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. The Constitutional Unionist, the old American of Know Nothing Party, placed John Bell of Tennessee in the field, and against these was put Abraham Lincoln, who received the support of the abolitionist lincoln made short work of his antagonist when the election came round he received a large majority in the electoral college while nearly every northern state voted majorities for him at the polls douglas had but twelve votes in the electoral college while bell had thirty-nine the votes of the southern states then preparing to secede were for the most part thrown for breckinridge the popular vote was lincoln one million eight hundred and fifty seven thousand six hundred and ten douglas one million three hundred and sixty five thousand nine hundred and seventy six breckinridge eight hundred and forty seven thousand nine hundred and fifty three bell five hundred and ninety thousand six hundred and thirty one total votes four million six hundred and sixty two thousand one hundred and seventy in the electoral college lincoln received a hundred and eighty douglas twelve breckinridge seventy two bell thirty nine lincoln's majority overall fifty seven saving his wind judge h w beckwith of danville illinois said that soon after the ottawa debate between lincoln and douglas he passed the shinnery house then the principal hotel in springfield the lobby was crowded with partisan leaders from various sections of the state and mr lincoln from his greater height was seen above the surging mass that clung about him like a swarm of bees to their ruler the day was warm and at the first chance he broke away and came out for a little fresh air wiping the sweat from his face as he passed the door he saw me said judge beckwith and taking my hand inquired for the health and views of his friends over in vermilion county 
he was assured they were wide awake and further told that they looked forward to the debate between him and senator douglas with deep concern from the shadow that went quickly over his face the pained look that came to give way quickly to a blaze of eyes and quiver of lips i felt that mr lincoln had gone beneath my mere words and caught my inner and current fears as to the result and then in a forgiving jocular way peculiar to him he said sit down i have a moment to spare and will tell you a story having been on his feet for some time he sat on the end of the stone step leading into the hotel door while i stood closely fronting him you have he continued seen two men about to fight yes many times well one of them brags about what he means to do he jumps high in the air cracking his heels together smites his fist and waits his breath trying to scare somebody you see the other fella he says not a word here mr lincoln's voice and manner changed to great earnestness and repeating you see the other man says not a word his arms are at his sides his fists are closely doubled up his head is drawn to the shoulder and his teeth are set firmly together he is saving his wind for the fight and as sure as it comes off he will win it or die a trying right for once anyhow where men bred in courts accustomed to the world or versed in diplomacy would use some subterfuge or would make a polite speech or give a shrug of the shoulders as the means of getting out of an embarrassing position lincoln raised a laugh by some bold west country anecdote and moved off in the cloud of merriment produced by the joke when attorney general bates was remonstrating apparently against the appointment of some indifferent lawyer to a place of judicial importance the president interposed with oh come now bates he's not half as bad as you think besides that i must tell you he did me a good turn long ago when i took to the law i was going to court one morning with some ten or twelve miles of bad road before me and i had no horse the judge overtook me in this carriage hello lincoln are you not going to the courthouse come in and i will give you a seat well i got in and the judge went on reading his papers presently the carriage struck a stump on one side of the road then it hopped off to the other i looked out and i saw the driver was jerking from side to side in his seat so i says judge i think your coachman has been taking a little too much this morning well i declare lincoln said he i should not much wonder if you were right for he has nearly upset me half a dozen times since starting so putting his head out of the window he shouted why you infernal scoundrel you are drunk upon which pulling up his horses and turning round with great gravity the coachman said begorra that's the first rightful decision that you have given for the last twelve month while the company were laughing the president beat a quiet retreat from the neighborhood pity the poor orphan after the war was well on and several battles had been fought a lady from alexandria asked the president for an order to release a certain church which had been taken for a federal hospital the president said he could do nothing as the post surgeon at alexandria was immovable and then asked the lady why she did not donate money to build a hospital we have been very much embarrassed by the war she replied and our estates are much hampered you are not ruined asked the president no sir but we do not feel that we should give up anything we have left the president after some reflection then said there are more battles yet to be fought and i think god would prefer that your church be devoted to the care and alleviation of the sufferings of our poor fellows so madam you will excuse me i can do nothing for you afterward in speaking of this incident president lincoln said that the lady as a representative of her class in alexandria reminded him of the story of the young man who had an aged father and mother owning considerable property the young man being an only son and believing that the old people had outlived their usefulness assassinated them both he was accused tried and convicted of the murder 
when the judge came to pass sentence upon him and called upon him to give any reason he might have why the sentence of death should not be passed upon him he with great promptness replied that he hoped the court would be lenient upon him because he was a poor orphan bat mcnab's booster it is true that lincoln did not drink never swore was a stranger to smoking and lived a moral life generally but he did like horse racing and chicken fighting new salem illinois where lincoln was clerking was known the neighborhood around as a fast town and the average young man made no very desperate resistance when tempted to join in the drinking and gambling bouts bap mcnab was famous for his ability in both the raising and the purchase of roosters of prime fighting quality and when his birds fought the attendance was large it was because of the flunking of one of bap's roosters that lincoln was enabled to make a point when criticizing mcclellan's unreadiness and lack of energy one night there was a fight on the schedule one of bap mcnab's birds being a contestant bap brought a little red rooster whose fighting qualities had been well advertised for days in advance and much interest was manifested in the outcome as the result of these contests was a generally a quarrel in which each man charging foul play seized his victim they chose lincoln umpire relying not only on his fairness but his ability to enforce his decisions judge herndon in his abraham lincoln says of this notable event i cannot improve on the description furnished me in february eighteen sixty five by one who was present they formed a ring and the time having arrived lincoln with one hand on each hip and in a squatting position cried ready into the ring they tossed their fowls bap's red rooster along with the rest but no sooner had the little beauty discovered what was to be done than he dropped his tail and ran the crowd cheered while bap in disappointment picked him up and started away losing his quarter entrance fee and carrying home his dishonored fowl once arrived at the latter place he threw his pet down with a feeling of indignation and chagrin the little fellow out of sight of all rivals mounted a woodpile and proudly flirting out his feathers crowed with all his might bap looked on in disgust yes you little cuss he exclaimed irreverently you're a great on dress parade but not worth a darn in a fight it is said according to judge herndon that lincoln considered mcclellan as a great on dress parade but not so much in a fight a low-down trick when lincoln was a candidate of the know-nothings for the state legislature the party was overconfident and the democrats pursued a still hunt lincoln was defeated he compared the situation to one of the camp followers of general taylor's army who had secured a barrel of cider erected a tent and commenced selling it to the thirsty soldiers at twenty-five cents a drink but he had sold but little before another sharp one set up a tent at his back and tapped the barrel so as to flow on his side and peddled out number one cider at five cents a drink of course getting the latter's entire trade on the borrowed capital the democrats said mr lincoln had played know nothing on a cheaper scale than had the real devotees of sam and had raked down his pile with his own cider end for end judge h w beckwith of danville illinois in his personal recollections of lincoln tells a story which is a good example of lincoln's way of condensing the law and the facts of an issue in a story a man by vile words first provoked and then made a bodily attack upon another the latter in defending himself gave the other much the worst of the encounter the aggressor to get even had the one who thrashed him tried in our circuit court on a charge of an assault and battery mr lincoln defended and told the jury that his client was in the fix of a man who in going along the highway with a pitchfork on his shoulder was attacked by a fierce dog that ran out at him from a farmer's dooryard in parrying off the brute with the fork its prongs stuck into the brute and killed him what made you kill my dog said the farmer 
What made him try to bite me? But why did you not go at him with the other end of the pitchfork? Why did he not come after me with his other end? At this, Mr. Lincoln whirled about in his long arms an imaginary dog and pushed its tail end toward the jury. This was the defensive plea of son assault de man, loosely, that the other fellow brought on the fight quickly told and in a way the dullest mind would grasp and retain end of part two part three of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part three let six skunks go the president had decided to select a new war minister, and the leading Republican senators thought the occasion was opportune to change the whole seven cabinet ministers. They therefore earnestly advised him to make a clean sweep and select seven new men and to restore the waning confidence of the country. The president listened with patient courtesy, and when the senators had concluded, he said with a characteristic gleam of humor in his eye gentlemen your request for a change of the whole cabinet because i have made one change reminds me of a story i once heard in illinois of a farmer who was much troubled by skunks his wife insisted on his trying to get rid of them he loaded his shotgun one moonlit night and awaited developments after some time the wife heard the shotgun go off and in a few minutes the farmer entered the house what luck have you asked she i hid myself behind a woodpile said the old man with the shotgun pointed towards the hen roost and before long there appeared not one skunk but seven i took aim blazed away killed one and he raised such a fearful smell that i concluded it was best to let the other six go the senators laughed and retired how he got blackstone the following story was told by mr lincoln to mr a j conant the artist who painted his portrait in springfield in eighteen sixty one day a man who was migrating to the west drove up in front of my store with a wagon which contained his family and household plunder he asked me if i would buy an old barrel for which he had no room in his wagon and which he said contained nothing of special value i did not want it but to oblige him i bought it and paid him i think half a dollar for it without further examination i put it away in the store and forgot all about it some time afterward in overhauling things i came upon the barrel and emptying it upon the floor to see what it contained i found at the bottom of the rubbish a complete edition of blackstone's commentaries i began to read those famous works and i had plenty of time for during the long summer days when the farmers were busy with their crops my customers were few and far between the more i read this he said with unusual emphasis the more intensely interested i became never in my whole life was my mind so thoroughly absorbed i read until i devoured them a job for the new cabinet maker this cartoon labeled a job for the new cabinet maker was printed in frank leslie's illustrated newspaper on february second eighteen sixty one a month and two days before abraham lincoln was inaugurated president of the united states the southern states had seceded from the union the confederacy was established with jefferson davis as its president the union had been split in two and the task lincoln had before him was to glue the two parts of the republic together in his famous speech delivered a short time before his nomination for the presidency by the republican national convention at chicago in eighteen sixty lincoln had said a house divided against itself cannot stand this nation cannot exist half slave and half free after his inauguration as president, Mr. Lincoln went to work to glue the two pieces together, and after four years of bloody war, and at immense cost, the job was finished. The house of the great American Republic was no longer divided. The severed sections, the North and the South, were cemented tightly, the slaves were freed, 
peace was firmly established and the union of states was glued together so well that the nation is stronger now than ever before lincoln was just the man for that job and the work he did will last for all time the new cabinet maker knew his business thoroughly and finished his task of gluing in a workmanlike manner at the very moment of its completion five days after the surrender of lee to grant at appomattox the martyr president fell at the hands of the assassin j wilkes booth i can stand if they can united states senator benjamin wade of ohio henry winter davis of maryland and wendell phillips were strongly opposed to president lincoln's re-election and wade and davis issued a manifesto phillips made several warm speeches against lincoln and his policy when asked if he had read the manifesto or any of phillips speeches the president replied i have not seen them nor do i care to see them i have seen enough to satisfy me that i am a failure not only in the opinion of the people in rebellion but of many distinguished politicians of my own party but time will show whether i am right or they are right and i am content to abide its decision i have enough to look after without giving much of my time to the consideration of the subject of who shall be my successor in office the position is not an easy one and the occupant whoever he may be for the next four years will have little leisure to pluck a thorn or plant a rose in his own pathway it was urged that this opposition must be embarrassing to his administration as well as damaging to the party he replied yes that is true but our friends wade davis phillips and others are hard to please i am not capable of doing so i cannot please them without wantonly violating not only my oath but the most vital principles upon which our government was founded as to those who like wade and the rest see fit to depreciate my policy and cavil at my official acts i shall not complain of them i accord them the utmost freedom of speech and liberty of the press but shall not change the policy i have adopted in the full belief that i am right i feel on this subject as an old illinois farmer once expressed himself while eating cheese he was interrupted in the midst of his repast by the entrance of his son who exclaimed hold on dad there's skippers in that cheese you're eating never mind tom said he as he kept on munching his cheese if they can stand it i can lincoln mistaken for once president lincoln was compelled to acknowledge that he made at least one mistake in sizing up men one day a very dignified man called at the white house and lincoln's heart fell when his visitor approached the latter was portly his face was full of apparent anxiety and lincoln was willing to wager a year's salary that he represented some society for the easy and speedy repression of rebellions the caller talked fluently but at no time did he give advice or suggest a way to put down the confederacy he was full of humor told a clever story or two and was entirely self-possessed at length the president inquired you are a clergyman are you not sir not by a jugful returned the stranger heartily grasping him by the hand lincoln shook it until the visitor squirmed you must lunch with us i am glad to see you i was afraid you were a preacher i went to the chicago convention the caller said as a friend of mr seward i have watched you narrowly ever since your inauguration and i called merely to pay my respects what i want to say is this i think you are doing everything for the good of the country that is in the power of man to do you are on the right track as one of your constituents i now say to you do in future as you damned please and i will support you this was spoken with tremendous effect why said mr lincoln in great astonishment i took you to be a preacher i thought you'd come here to tell me how to take richmond and he again grasped the hand of his strange visitor accurate and penetrating as mr lincoln's judgment was concerning men for once he had been wholly mistaken the scene was comical in the extreme the two men stood gazing at each other 
a smile broke from the lips of the solemn wag and rippled over the wide expanse of his homely face like sunlight overspreading a continent and mr lincoln was convulsed with laughter he stayed to lunch forgot everything he knew president lincoln while entertaining a few friends is said to have related the following anecdote of a man who knew too much during the administration of president jackson there was a singular young gentleman employed in the public post office in washington his name was g he was from tennessee the son of a widow a neighbor of the president on which account the old hero had a kind feeling for him and always got him out of difficulties with some of the higher officials to whom his singular interference was distasteful among other things it is said of him that while employed in the general post office on one occasion he had to copy a letter to major h a high official in answer to an application made by an old gentleman in virginia or pennsylvania for the establishment of a new post office the writer of the letter said the application could not be granted in consequence of the applicant's proximity to another office when the letter came into g s hand to copy being a great stickler for plainness he altered proximity to nearness to major h observed it and asked g why he altered his letter why replied g because i don't think the man would understand what you meant by proximity well said major h try him put in the proximity again in a few days a letter was received from the applicant in which he very indignantly said that his father had fought for liberty in the second war for independence and he should like to have the name of the scoundrel who brought the charge of proximity or if anything else wrong against him there said g did i not say so g carried his improvement so far that mr barry the postmaster general said to him i don't want you any longer you know too much poor g went out but his old friend got him another place this time g s ideas underwent a change he was one day very busy writing when a stranger called in and asked him where the patent office was i don't know said g can you tell me where the treasury department is said the stranger no said g nor the president's house no the stranger finally asked him if he knew where the capital was no replied g do you live in washington sir yes sir said g good lord and don't you know where the patent office treasury president's house and capital are stranger said g i was turned out of the post office for knowing too much i don't mean to offend in that way again i am paid for keeping this book i believe i know that much but if you find me knowing anything more you may take my head good morning said the stranger he loved a good story judge brees of the supreme bench one of the most distinguished of american jurists and a man of great personal dignity was about to open court at springfield when lincoln called out in his hearty way hold on brees don't open court yet here's bob blackwell just going to tell a story the judge passed on without replying evidently regarding it as beneath the dignity of the supreme court to delay proceedings for the sake of a story heels ran away with them in an argument against the opposite political party at one time during a campaign lincoln said my opponent uses a figurative expression to the effect that the democrats are vulnerable in the heel but they are sound in the heart and head the first branch of the figure that is the democrats are vulnerable in the heel i admit is not merely figuratively but literally true who that looks but for a moment at their hundreds of officials scampering away with the public money to texas to europe and to every spot of the earth where a villain may hope to find refuge from justice can at all doubt that they are most distressingly affected in their heels with a species of running itch it seems that this malady of their heels operates on the sound-headed and honest-hearted creatures very much as the cork leg in the comic song did on its owner which when he once got started on it the more he tried to stop it the more it would run away 
at the hazard of wearing this point threadbare i will relate an anecdote the situation calls to my mind which seems to be too strikingly in point to be omitted a witty irish soldier who was always boasting of his bravery when no danger was near but who invariably retreated without orders at the first charge of the engagement being asked by his captain why he did so replied captain i have as brave a heart as julius caesar ever had but somehow or other whenever danger approaches my cowardly legs will run away with it so with the opposite party they take the public money into their hands for the most laudable purpose that wise heads and honest hearts can dictate but before they can possibly get it out again their rascally vulnerable heels will run away with them wanted to burn him down to the stump preston king once introduced a j bleeker to the president and the latter being an applicant for office was about to hand mr lincoln his vouchers when he was asked to read them bleeker had not read very far when the president disconcerted him by the exclamation stop a minute you remind me exactly of the man who killed the dog in fact you are just like him in what respect asked bleeker not feeling he had received a compliment well replied the president this man had made up his mind to kill his dog an ugly brute and proceeded to knock out his brains with a club he continued striking the dog after the latter was dead until a friend protested exclaiming you needn't strike him any more the dog is dead you killed him at the first blow oh yes said he i know that but i believe in punishment after death so i see you do bleeker acknowledged it was possible to overdo a good thing and then came back at the president with an anecdote of a good priest who converted an indian from heathenism to christianity the only difficulty he had with him was to get him to pray for his enemies this indian had been taught to overcome and destroy all his friends he didn't like said bleeker but the priest told him that while that might be the indian method it was not the doctrine of christianity or the bible st paul distinctly says the priest told him if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink the indian shook his head at this but when the priest added for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head poor lo was overcome with emotion fell on his knees and with outstretched hands and uplifted eyes invoked all sorts of blessings on the heads of all his enemies supplicating for pleasant hunting grounds a large supply of squaws lots of papooses and all other indian comforts finally the good priest interrupted him as you did me mr president exclaiming stop my son you have discharged your christian duty and have done more than enough oh no father replied the indian let me pray i want to burn him down to the stump had a kick coming during the war one of the northern governors who was able earnest and untiring in aiding the administration but always complaining sent dispatch after dispatch to the war office protesting against the methods used in raising troops after reading all his papers the president said in a cheerful and reassuring tone to the adjutant general never mind never mind those dispatches don't mean anything just go right ahead the governor is like a boy i once saw at a launching when everything was ready they picked out a boy and sent him under the ship to knock away the trigger and let her go at the critical moment everything depended on the boy he had to do the job well by a direct vigorous blow and then lie flat and keep still while the boat slid over him the boy did everything right but he yelled as if he were being murdered from the time he got under the keel until he got out i thought the hide was all scraped off his back but he wasn't hurt at all the master of the yard told me that this boy was always chosen for that job that he did his work well that he never had been hurt but that he always squealed in that way that's just the way with governor make up your mind that he is not hurt and that he is doing the work right and pay no attention to his squealing he only wants to make you understand how hard his task is and that he is on hand performing it the case of betsy ann doherty 
many requests and petitions made to mr lincoln when he was president were ludicrous and trifling but he always entered into them with that humor-loving spirit that was such a relief from the grave duties of his great office once a party of southerners called on him in behalf of one betsy ann doherty the spokesman who was an ex-governor said mr president betsy ann doherty is a good woman she lived in my county and did my washing for a long time her husband went off and joined the rebel army and i wish you would give her a protectin paper the solemnity of this appeal struck mr lincoln as uncommonly ridiculous the two men looked at each other the governor desperately earnest and the president masking his humor behind the gravest exterior at last mr lincoln asked with inimitable gravity was betsy ann a good washerwoman oh yes sir she was indeed was your betsy ann an obliging woman yes she was certainly very kind responded the governor soberly could she do other things than wash continued mr lincoln with the same portentous gravity oh yes she was very kind very where is betsy ann she is now in new york and wants to come back to missouri but she is afraid of banishment is any one meddling with her no but she is afraid to come back unless you will give her a protection paper thereupon mr lincoln wrote on a visiting card the following let betsy ann doherty alone as long as she behaves herself a lincoln he handed this card to her advocate saying give this to betsy ann but mr president couldn't you write a few words to the officers that would ensure her protection no said mr lincoln officers have no time now to read letters tell betsy ann to put a string in this card and hang it around her neck when the officers see this they will keep their hands off your betsy ann had to wear a wooden sword captain abe lincoln and his company in the black hawk war were without any sort of military knowledge and both were forced to acquire such knowledge by attempts at drilling which was the more awkward the squad or the commander it would have been difficult to decide in one of lincoln's earliest military problems was involved the process of getting his company endwise through a gate finally he shouted this company is dismissed for two minutes when it will fall in again on the other side of the gate lincoln was one of the first of his company to be arraigned for unmilitary conduct contrary to the rules he fired a gun within the limits and had his sword taken from him the next infringement of rules was by some of the men who stole a quantity of liquor drank it and became unfit for duty straggling out of the ranks the next day and not getting together again until late at night for allowing this lawlessness the captain was condemned to wear a wooden sword for two days these were merely interesting but trivial incidents of the campaign lincoln was from the very first popular with his men although one of them told him to go to the devil abe stirring the black coals under the caption the american difficulty punch printed on may eleventh eighteen sixty one the cartoon reproduced here the following text was placed beneath the illustration president abe what a nice white house this would be if it were not for the blacks it was the idea in england and in fact in all the countries on the european continent that the war of the rebellion was fought to secure the freedom of the negro slaves such was not the case the freedom of the slaves was one of the necessary consequences of the civil war but not the cause of that bloody four years conflict the war was the result of the secession of the states of the south from the union and president abe's main aim was to compel the seceding states to resume their places in the federal union of states the blacks did not bother president abe in the least as he knew he would be enabled to give them their freedom when the proper time came 
he had the project of freeing them in his mind long before he issued his emancipation proclamation the delay in promulgating that document being due to the fact that he did not wish to estrange the hundreds of thousands of patriots of the border states who were fighting for the preservation of the union and not for the freedom of the negro slaves president abe had patience and everything came out all right in the end getting rid of an elephant charles a dana who was assistant secretary of war under mr stanton relates the following a certain thompson had been giving the government considerable trouble dana received information that thompson was about to escape to liverpool calling upon stanton dana was referred to mr lincoln the president was at the white house business hours were over lincoln was washing his hands hello dana said he as he opened the door what is it now well sir i said here is the provost marshal of portland who reports that jacob thompson is to be in town tonight and inquires what orders we have to give what does stanton say he asked arrest him i replied well he continued drawing his words i rather guess not when you have an elephant on your hands and he wants to run away better let him run grotesque yet frightful the nearest lincoln ever came to a fight was when he was in the vicinity of the skirmish at kellogg's grove in the black hawk war the rangers arrived at the spot after the engagement and helped bury the five men who were killed lincoln told noah brooks one of his biographers that he remembered just how those men looked as we rode up the little hill where their camp was the red light of the morning sun was streaming upon them as they lay heads toward us on the ground and every man had a round red spot at the top of his head about as big as a dollar where the redskins had taken his scalp it was frightful but it was grotesque and the red sunlight seemed to paint everything all over lincoln paused as if recalling the vivid picture and added somewhat irrelevantly i remember that one man had on buckskin breeches abe was no dude always indifferent in matters of dress lincoln cut but small figure in social circles even in the earliest days of illinois his trousers were too short his hat too small and as a rule the buttons on the back of his coat were nearer his shoulder blades than his waist no man was richer than his fellows and there was no aristocracy the women wore linsey woolsey of home manufacture and dyed them in accordance with the tastes of the wearers calico was rarely seen and a woman wearing a dress of that material was the envy of her sisters there being no shoemakers the women wore moccasins and the men made their own boots a hunting shirt leggings made of skins buckskin breeches dyed green constituted an apparel no maiden could withstand characteristic of lincoln one man who knew lincoln at new salem says the first time he saw him he was lying on a trundle bed covered with books and papers and rocking a cradle with his foot the whole scene was entirely characteristic lincoln reading and studying and at the same time helping his landlady by quieting her child a gentleman who knew mr lincoln well in early manhood says lincoln at this period had nothing but plenty of friends after the customary handshaking on one occasion in the white house at washington several gentlemen came forward and asked the president for his autograph one of them gave his name as crookshank that reminds me said mr lincoln of what i used to be called when a young man longshank plow all around him governor blank went to the war department one day in a towering rage i suppose you found it necessary to make large concessions to him as he returned from you perfectly satisfied suggested a friend oh no the president replied i did not concede anything you have heard how that illinois farmer got rid of a big log that was too big to haul out too knotty to split and too wet and soggy to burn well now said he in response to the inquiries of his neighbors one sunday as to how he got rid of it 
well now boys if you won't divulge the secret i'll tell you how i got rid of it i plowed around it now remarked lincoln in conclusion don't tell anybody but that's the way i got rid of governor blank i plowed all around him but it took me three mortal hours to do it and i was afraid every minute he'd see what i was at end of part three Part 4 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. I've Lost My Apple. During a public reception, a farmer from one of the border counties of Virginia told the president that the Union soldiers in passing his farm had helped themselves not only to hay, but to his horse, and he hoped the president would urge the proper officer to consider his claim immediately mr lincoln said that this reminded him of an old acquaintance of his jack chase a lumberman on the illinois a steady sober man and the best raftsman on the river it was quite a trick to take the logs over the rapids but he was skillful with a raft and always kept her straight in the channel finally a steamer was put on and jack was made captain of her he always used to take the wheel going through the rapids one day when the boat was plunging and wallowing along the boiling current and jack's utmost vigilance was being exercised to keep her in the narrow channel a boy pulled his coat-tail and hailed him with say mr captain i wish you would just stop your boat a minute i've lost my apple overboard lost his certificate of character mr lincoln prepared his first inaugural address in a room over a store in springfield his only reference works were Henry Clay's Great Compromise Speech of 1850, Andrew Jackson's Proclamation Against Nullification, Webster's Great Reply to Hayne, and a copy of the Constitution. When Mr. Lincoln started for Washington to be inaugurated, the inaugural address was placed in a special satchel and guarded with special care. At Harrisburg, the satchel was given in charge of Robert T. Lincoln, who accompanied his father before the train started from harrisburg the precious satchel was missing robert thought he had given it to a waiter at the hotel but a long search failed to reveal the missing satchel with its precious document lincoln was annoyed angry and finally in despair he felt certain that the address was lost beyond recovery and as it only lacked ten days until the inauguration he had no time to prepare another he had not even preserved the notes from which the original copy had been written. Mr. Lincoln went to Ward Lamon, his former law partner, then one of his bodyguards, and informed him of the loss in the following words, Lamon, I guess I've lost my certificate of moral character, written by myself. Bob has lost my grip sack containing my inaugural address. Of course, the misfortune reminded him of a story i feel said mr lincoln a good deal as the old member of the methodist church did when he lost his wife at the camp meeting and went up to an old elder of the church and asked him if he could tell him whereabouts in hell his wife was in fact i am in a worse fix than my methodist friend for if it were only a wife that were missing mine would be sure to bob up somewhere the clerk at the hotel told Mr. Lincoln that he would probably find his missing satchel in the baggage room. Arriving there, Mr. Lincoln saw a satchel, which he thought was his, and it was passed out to him. His key fitted the lock, but alas, when it was opened, the satchel contained only a soiled shirt, some paper collars, a pack of cards, and a bottle of whiskey. A few minutes later, the satchel containing the inaugural address was found among the pile of baggage. The recovery of the address also reminded Mr. Lincoln of a story, which is thus narrated by Ward Lamon in his Recollections of Abraham Lincoln. The loss of the address and the search for it was the subject of a great deal of amusement. Mr. Lincoln said many funny things in connection with the incident. One of them was that he knew a fellow once who had saved up fifteen hundred dollars and had placed it in a private banking establishment. The bank soon failed, and he afterward received 10% of his investment. He then took his $150 and deposited it in a savings bank, 
where he was sure it would be safe. In a short time, this bank also failed, and he received at the final settlement 10% on the amount deposited. When the $15 was paid over to him, he held it in his hand and looked at it thoughtfully, and then he said, now, darn you, I have got you reduced to a portable shape, so I'll put you in my pocket. Suiting the action to the word, Mr. Lincoln took his address from the bag and carefully placed it in the inside pocket of his vest, but held on to the satchel with as much interest as if it still contained his certificate of moral character. Note presented for payment. The great English funny paper, London Punch, printed this cartoon on September 27, 1862. It is intended to convey the idea that Lincoln, having asserted that the war would be over in 90 days, had not redeemed his word. The text under the cartoon in Punch was, Mr. South to Mr. North, your 90-day promissory note isn't taken up yet, siree. The tone of the cartoon is decidedly unfriendly. The North finally took up the note, but the South had to pay it. Punch was not pleased with the result, but Mr. North did not care particularly what this periodical thought about it. The United States, since then, has been prepared to take up all of its obligations when due, but it must be acknowledged that at the time this cartoon was published, the outlook was rather dark and gloomy. Lincoln did not despair, however but although business was in rather bad shape for a time, the financial skies finally cleared, business was resumed at the old stand, and Uncle Sam's credit is now as good or better than other nations' cash in hand. Dog was a deedle bit ahead. Lincoln could not sympathize with those Union generals who were prone to indulge in high-sounding promises, but whose performances did not by any means come up to their predictions as to what they would do if they ever met the enemy face to face. He said one day, just after one of these braggarts had been soundly thrashed by the Confederates, These fellows remind me of the fellow who owned a dog, which, so he said, just hungered and thirsted to combat and eat up wolves. It was a difficult matter, so the owner declared, to keep that dog from devoting the entire twenty-four hours of each day to the destruction of his enemies. He just hankered to get at them. One day, a party of this dog owner's friends thought to have some sport. These friends heartily disliked wolves and were anxious to see the dog eat up a few thousand. So they organized a hunting party and invited the dog owner and the dog to go with them. They desired to be personally present when the wolf killing was in progress. It was noticed that the dog owner was not over enthusiastic in the matter. He pleaded a business engagement, but as he was the most notorious and torpid of the town loafers and wouldn't have recognized a business engagement had he met it face to face, his excuse was treated with contempt. Therefore, he had to go. The dog, however, was glad enough to go, and so the party started out. Wolves were in plenty, and soon a pack was discovered, but when the wolfhound saw the ferocious animals, he lost heart, and putting his tail between his legs, endeavored to slink away. At last, after many trials, he was enticed into the small growth of underbrush where the wolves had secreted themselves, and yelps of terror betrayed the fact that the battle was on. Away flew the wolves, the dog among them, the hunting party following on horseback. The wolves seemed frightened, and the dog was restored to public favor. It really looked as if he had the savage creatures on the run, as he was fighting heroically when last sighted. Wolves and dogs soon disappeared, and it was not until the party arrived at a distant farmhouse that news of the combatants was gleaned. "'Have you seen anything of a wolf-dog and a pack of wolves around here?' was the question anxiously put to the male occupant of the house, who stood idly leaning upon the gate. "'Yep,' was the short answer. "'How were they going?' "'Pretty fast. What was their position when you saw them?' "'Well,' replied the farmer, in a most exasperatingly deliberate way, "'the dog was a little bit ahead.' "'Now, gentlemen,' concluded the President, that's the position in which you'll find most of these bragging generals when they get into a fight with the enemy. That's why I don't like military orators.
Abe's Fight with Negroes When Lincoln was 19 years of age, he went to work for a Mr. Gentry, and in company with Gentry's son, took a flatboat load of provisions to New Orleans. At a plantation six miles below Baton Rouge, while the boat was tied up to the shore in the dead hours of the night, and Abe and Allen were fast asleep in the bed, they were startled by footsteps on board. They knew instantly that it was a gang of Negroes come to rob and perhaps murder them. Allen, thinking to frighten the Negroes, called out, Bring guns, Lincoln, and shoot em. Abe came without the guns, but fell among the Negroes with a huge bludgeon, and belabored them most cruelly, following them onto the bank. They rushed back to their boat and hastily put out into the stream. It is said that Lincoln received a scar in this tussle, which he carried with him to his grave. It was on this trip that he saw the workings of slavery for the first time. The sight of New Orleans was like a wonderful panorama to his eyes, for never before had he seen wealth, beauty, fashion, and culture. He returned home with new and larger ideas and stronger opinions of right and justice. Noise like a turnip. Every man has his own peculiar and particular way of getting at and doing things, said President Lincoln one day, and he is often criticized because that way is not the one adopted by others. The great idea is to accomplish what you set out to do. When a man is successful in whatever he attempts, he has many imitators, and the methods used are not so closely scrutinized, although no man who is of good intent will resort to mean, underhanded, scurvy tricks. That reminds me of a fellow out in Illinois who had better luck in getting prairie chickens than anyone in the neighborhood. He had a rusty old gun no other man dared to handle. He never seemed to exert himself, being listless and indifferent when after game. But he always brought home all the chickens he could carry, while some of the others, with their finely trained dogs and latest improved fowling pieces, came home alone. "'How is it, Jake?' inquired one sportsman, who, although a good shot and knew something about hunting, was often unfortunate, that you never come home without a lot of birds.' Jake grinned, half-closed his eyes, and replied, "'Oh, I don't know that there's anything queer about it. I just go ahead and get them. "'Yes, I know you do, but how do you do it?' "'You'll tell.' "'Honest, Jake, I won't say a word. Hope to drop dead this minute.' "'Never say nothing if I tell you. Cross my heart three times.' This reassured Jake, who put his mouth close to the ear of his eager questioner, and said in a whisper, "'All you got to do is just to hide in a fence corner and make a noise like a turnip. That'll bring the chickens every time.' Warding Off God's Vengeance When Lincoln was a candidate for re-election to the Illinois legislature in 1836, a meeting was advertised to be held in the courthouse in Springfield, at which candidates of opposing parties were to speak. This gave men of spirit and capacity a fine opportunity to show the stuff of which they were made. George Forkware was one of the most prominent citizens. He had been a Whig, but became a Democrat, possibly for the reason that by means of the change he secured the position of government land register from President Andrew Jackson. He had the largest and finest house in the city, and there was a new and striking appendage to it called a lightning rod. The meeting was very large. Seven Whig and seven Democratic candidates spoke. Lincoln closed the discussion. A Kentuckian, Joshua F. Speed, who had heard Henry Clay and other distinguished Kentucky orators, stood near Lincoln and stated afterward that he never heard a more effective speaker. The crowd seemed to be swayed by him as he pleased. What occurred during the closing portion of this meeting must be given in full from Judge Arnold's book. Forkwer, although not a candidate, asked to be heard for the Democrats in reply to Lincoln. He was a good speaker and well known throughout the county. His special task that day was to attack and ridicule the young countryman from Salem. Turning to Lincoln, who stood within a few feet of him, he said, This young man must be taken down, and I am truly sorry that the task devolves upon me. He then proceeded in a very overbearing way, and with an assumption of great superiority, to attack Lincoln and his speech. He was fluent and ready with the rough sarcasm of the stump 
and he went on to ridicule the person dress and arguments of lincoln with so much success that lincoln's friends feared that he would be embarrassed and overthrown the clary's grove boys were present and were restrained with difficulty from getting up a fight in behalf of their favorite uh, lincoln they and all his friends feeling that the attack was ungenerous and unmanly lincoln however stood calm but his flashing eye and pale cheek indicated his indignation as soon as forquer had closed he took the stand and first answered his opponent's arguments fully and triumphantly so impressive were his words and manner that a hearer joshua f speed believes that he can remember to this day and repeat some of the expressions among other things he said the gentleman commenced his speech by saying that this young man alluding to me must be taken down i am not so young in years as i am in the tricks and trades of a politician but said he pointing to forquer live long or die young i would rather die now than like the gentleman change my politics and with the change receive an office worth three thousand dollars a year and then continued he feel obliged to erect a lightning rod over my house to protect a guilty conscience from an offended god jeff davis and charles i jefferson davis insisted on being recognized by his official title as commander or president in the regular negotiation with the government this mr lincoln would not consent to mr hunter thereupon referred to the correspondence between king charles i and his parliament as a precedent for a negotiation between a constitutional ruler and rebels mr lincoln's face then wore that indescribable expression which generally preceded his hardest hits and he remarked upon questions of history i must refer you to mr seward for he is posted in such things and i don't profess to be but my only distinct recollection of the matter is that charles lost his head loved soldiers humor lincoln loved anything that savored of wit or humor among the soldiers he used to relate two stories to show he said that neither death nor danger could quench the grim humor of the american soldier a soldier of the army of the potomac was being carried to the rear of battle with both legs shot off who seeing a pie woman called out say old lady are them pies sewed or pegged and there was another one of the soldiers at the battle of chancellorsville whose regiment waiting to be called into the fight was taking coffee the hero of the story put to his lips a crockery mug which he had carried with care through several campaigns a stray bullet just missing the tinker's head dashed the mug into fragments and left only the handle on his finger turning his head in that direction he scowled johnny you can't do that again bad time for a barbecue captain t w s kidd of springfield was the crier of the court in the days when mr lincoln used to ride the circuit i was younger than he says captain kidd but he had a sort of admiration for me and never failed to get me into his stories i was a storyteller myself in those days and he used to laugh very heartily at some of the stories i told him now and then he got me into a good deal of trouble i was a democrat and was in politics more or less a good many of our democratic voters at that time were irishmen they came to illinois in the days of the old canal and did their honest share in making that piece of internal improvement an accomplished fact one time mr lincoln told the story of one of those important young fellows not an irishman who lived in every town and have the cares of state on their shoulders this young fellow met an irishman on the street and called to him officiously oh mike i'm awful glad i met you we've got to do something to wake up the boys the campaign is coming on and we've got to get out voters we've just had a meeting up here and we're going to have the biggest barbecue that ever was heard of in illinois we're going to roast two whole oxen and we're going to have douglas and governor cass and someone from kentucky and all the big democratic guns and we're going to have a great big time by dad that's good says the irishman the buys needs to earn up 
yes and you're on one of the committees and you want to hustle around and get them waked up mike when is the barbecue to be asked mike friday two weeks friday is it well i'll make a nice committee man settin the barbecue on a day with half of the democratic party of sangamon county can't it abide a mate go on with you lincoln told that story in one of his political speeches and when the laugh was over he said now gentlemen i know that story is true for tom kidd told it to me and then the democrats would make trouble for me for a week afterward and i'd have to explain he'd see it again about two years before lincoln was nominated for the presidency he went to bloomington illinois to try a case of some importance his opponent who afterward reached a high place in his profession was a young man of ability sensible but sensitive and one to whom the loss of a case was a great blow he therefore studied hard and made much preparation this particular case was submitted to the jury late at night and although anticipating a favorable verdict the young attorney spent a sleepless night in anxiety early next morning he learned to his great chagrin that he had lost the case lincoln met him in the courthouse some time after the jury had come in and asked him what had become of his case with lugubrious countenance and in a melancholy tone the young man replied it's gone to hell oh well replied lincoln then you will see it again call another witness when arguing a case in court mr lincoln never used a word which the dullest juryman could not understand rarely if ever did a latin term creep into his arguments a lawyer quoting a legal maxim one day in court turned to lincoln and said that is so is it not mr lincoln if that's latin lincoln replied you had better call another witness a contest with little tad mr carpenter the artist relates the following incident some photographers came up to the white house to make some stereoscopic studies for me of the president's office they requested a dark closet in which to develop the pictures and without a thought that i was infringing upon anybody's rights i took them to an unoccupied room of which little tad had taken possession a few days before and with the aid of a couple of servants had fitted up a miniature theater with stage curtains orchestra stalls parquet and all knowing that the use required would interfere with none of his arrangements i led the way to this apartment everything went on well and one or two pictures had been taken when suddenly there was an uproar the operator came back to the office and said tad had taken great offense at the occupation of his room without his consent and had locked the door refusing all admission the chemicals had been taken inside and there was no way of getting at them he having carried off the key in the midst of this conversation tad burst in in a fearful passion he laid all the blame upon me said that i had no right to use his room and the men should not go in even to get their things he had locked the door and they would not go there again they had no business in his room mr lincoln was sitting for a photograph and was still in the chair he said very mildly tad go and unlock the door tad went off muttering into his mother's room refusing to obey i followed him into the passage but no coaxing would pacify him upon my return to the president i found him still patiently in the chair from which he had not risen he said has not the boy opened the door i replied that we could do nothing with him he had gone off in a great pet mr lincoln's lips came together firmly and then suddenly rising he strode across the passage with the air of one bent on punishment and disappeared in the domestic apartments directly he returned with the key to the theatre which he unlocked himself tad said he half apologetically is a peculiar child he was violently excited when i went to him i said tad do you know that you are making your father a great deal of trouble he burst into tears instantly giving me up the key reminded him of a little story when lincoln's attention was called to the fact that at one time in his boyhood he had spelled the name of the deity with a small g 
he replied that reminds me of a little story it came about that a lot of confederate mail was captured by the union forces and while it was not exactly the proper thing to do some of our soldiers opened several letters written by the southerners at the front to their people at home in one of these missives the writer in a postscript jotted down this assertion we'll lick the yanks tomorrow if god almighty that is god almighty spares our lives that fellow was in earnest too as the letter was written the day before the second battle of manassas fetched several short ones the first time i ever remember seeing abe lincoln is the testimony of one of his neighbors was when i was a small boy and had gone with my father to attend some kind of an election one of the neighbors james larkins was there larkins was a great hand to brag on anything he owned this time it was his horse he stepped up before abe who was in a crowd and commenced talking to him boasting all the while of his animal i have got the best horse in the country he shouted to his young listener i ran him nine miles in exactly three minutes and he never fetched a long breath i presume said abe rather dryly he fetched a good many short ones, though. Lincoln Lugs the Old Man On May 3, 1862, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper printed this cartoon over the title of Sandbag Lincoln and the Old Man of the Sea, Secretary of the Navy Wells. It was intended to demonstrate that the head of the Navy Department was incompetent to manage the affairs of the Navy, and also that the Navy was not doing as good work as it might. When this cartoon was published, the United States Navy had cleared and had under control the Mississippi River as far south as Memphis, had blockaded all the cotton ports of the South, had assisted in the reduction of a number of Confederate forts, had aided Grant at Fort Donelson and the Battle of Shiloh, the Monitor had whipped the ironclad terror Merrimack, the Confederates called her the Virginia, Admiral Farragut's fleet had compelled the surrender of the city of New Orleans, the great forts which had defended it, and the federal government obtained control of the lower Mississippi. The old man of the sea was therefore not a drag or a weight upon President Lincoln, and the Navy was not so far behind in making a good record as the picture would have the people of the world believe. It was not long after the Monitor's victory that the United States Navy was the finest that ever plowed the seas. The building of the Monitor also revolutionized naval warfare. End of Part 4《Part Five of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Five. McClellan was entrenching. About a week after the Chicago Convention, a gentleman from New York called upon the President in company with the Assistant Secretary of War, Mr. Dana. In the course of conversation, the gentleman said what do you think mr president is the reason general mcclellan does not reply to the letter from the chicago convention oh replied mr lincoln with a characteristic twinkle of the eye he is entrenching make something out of it anyway from the day of his nomination by the chicago convention gifts poured in upon lincoln many of these came in the form of wearing apparel mr george lincoln of brooklyn who brought to springfield in january eighteen sixty one a handsome silk hat to the president-elect the gift of a new york hatter told some friends that in receiving the hat lincoln laughed heartily over the gifts of clothing and remarked to mrs lincoln well wife if nothing else comes out of this scrape we are going to have some new clothes are we not vicious oxen have short horns in speaking of the many mean and petty acts of certain members of congress the president while talking on the subject one day with friends said i have great sympathy for these men because of their temper and their weakness but i am thankful that the good lord has given to the vicious ox short horns for if their physical courage were equal to their vicious disposition some of us in this neck of the woods would get hurt 
lincoln's name for weeping water i was speaking one time to mr lincoln said governor saunders of nebraska of a little nebraskan settlement on the weeping water a stream in our state weeping water said he then with a twinkle in his eye he continued i suppose the indians out there called many boohoo don't they they ought to if laughing water is many ha ha in their language peter cartwright's description of lincoln peter cartwright the famous and eccentric old methodist preacher who used to ride a church circuit as mr lincoln and others did the court circuit did not like lincoln very well probably because mr lincoln was not a member of his flock and once defeated the preacher for congress this was cartwright's description of lincoln this lincoln is a man six feet four inches tall but so angular that if you should drop a plummet from the center of his head it will cut him three times before it touched his feet no deaths in his house a gentleman was relating to the president how a friend of his had been driven away from new orleans as a unionist and how on his expulsion when he asked to see the writ by which he was expelled the deputation which called on him told him the government would do nothing illegal and so they had issued no illegal writs and simply meant to make him go of his own free will well said mr lincoln that reminds me of a hotel keeper down at st louis who boasted that he never had a death in his hotel for whenever a guest was dying in his house he carried him out to die in the gutter painted his principles the day following the adjournment of the baltimore convention at which president lincoln was renominated various political organizations called to pay their respects to the president while the philadelphia delegation was being presented the chairman of that body in introducing one of the members said mr president this is mr s of the second district of our state a most active and earnest friend of yours and the cause he has among other things been good enough to paint and present to our league rooms a most beautiful portrait of yourself president lincoln took the gentleman's hand in his and shaking it cordially said with a merry voice i presume sir in painting your beautiful portrait you took your idea of me from my principles and not from my person dignifying the statute lincoln was married he balked at the first date set for the ceremony and did not show up at all november four eighteen forty two under most happy auspices the officiating clergyman the rev mr dresser used the episcopal church service for marriage lincoln placed the ring upon the bride's finger and said with this ring i now thee wed and with all my worldly goods i thee endow judge thomas c brown who was present exclaimed good gracious lincoln the statute fixes all that ah well drawled lincoln i just thought i'd add a little dignity to the statute lincoln campaign mottoes the joint debates between lincoln and douglas were attended by crowds of people and the arrival of both at the places of speaking were in the nature of a triumphal procession in these processions there were many banners bearing catchphrases and mottoes expressing the sentiment of the people on the candidates and the issues the following were some of the mottoes on the lincoln banners westward the star of empire takes its way the girls link on to lincoln their mothers were for clay abe the giant killer edgar county for the tall sucker free territories and free men free pulpits and free preachers free press and a free pen free schools and free teachers giving away the case between the first election and inauguration of mr lincoln the disunion sentiment grew rapidly in the south and president buchanan's failure to stop the open acts of secession grieved mr lincoln sorely mr lincoln had a long talk with his friend judge gillespie over the state of affairs one incident of the conversation is thus narrated by the judge when i retired it was the master of the house and chosen ruler of the country who saw me to my room 
joe he said as he was about to leave me i am reminded and i suppose you will never forget that trial down in montgomery county where the lawyer associated with you gave away the whole case in his opening speech i saw you signaling to him but you couldn't stop him now that's just the way with me and buchanan he is giving away the case and i have nothing to say and can't stop him good night posing with a broomstick mr leonard folk the artist relates that being in springfield when lincoln's nomination for president was announced he called upon mr lincoln whom he found looking smiling and happy i exclaimed i am the first man from chicago i believe who has had the honor of congratulating you on your nomination for president then those two great hands took both of mine with a grasp never to be forgotten and while shaking i said now that you will doubtless be the next president of the united states i want to make a statue of you and shall try my best to do you justice said he oh, i don't doubt it for i have come to the conclusion that you are an honest man and with that greeting i thought my hands in a fair way of being crushed on the sunday following by agreement i called to make a cast of mr lincoln's hands i asked him to hold something in his hands and told him a stick would do thereupon he went to the woodshed and i heard the saw go and he soon returned to the dining-room whittling off the end of a piece of broom handle i remarked to him that he need not whittle off the edges oh well said he i thought i would like to have it nice both length and breadth during lincoln's first and only term in congress he was elected in eighteen forty six he formed quite a cordial friendship with stephen a douglas a member of the united states senate from illinois and the beaten one in the contest as to who should secure the hand of miss mary todd lincoln was the winner douglas afterwards beat him for the united states senate but lincoln went to the white house during all of the time that they were rivals in love and in politics they remained the best of friends personally they were always glad to see each other and were frequently together the disparity in their size was always the more noticeable upon such occasions and they well deserved their nicknames of long abe and the little giant lincoln was the tallest man in the national house of representatives and douglas the shortest and perhaps broadest man in the senate and when they appeared on the streets together much merriment was created lincoln when joking about the matter replied in a very serious tone yes that's about the length and breadth of it abe recites a song lincoln couldn't sing and he also lacked the faculty of musical adaptation he had a liking for certain ballads and songs and while he memorized and recited their lines someone else did the singing lincoln often recited for the delectation of his friends the following the authorship of which is unknown the first factional fight in old ireland they say was all on account of st patrick's birthday it was somewhere about midnight without any doubt and certain it is it made a great rout on the eighth day of march as some people say st patrick at midnight he first saw the day while others assert twas the ninth he was born twas all a mistake between midnight and morn some blamed the baby some blamed the clock some blamed the doctor some the crowing cock with all those close questions sure no one could know whether the babe was too fast or the clock was too slow some fought for the eighth for the ninth some would die he who wouldn't see right would have a black eye at length these two factions so positive grew they each had a birthday, and Pat he had too. Till Father Mulcahy, who showed them their sins, he said none could have two birthdays but as twins. Now, boys, don't be fighting for the eight or the nine. Don't quarrel so always. Now, why not combine? Combine eight with nine. It is the mark. Let that be the birthday. Amen, said the clerk so all got blind drunk which completed their bliss and they've kept up the practice from that day to this manage to keep house 
senator john sherman of ohio introduced his brother william t sherman then a civilian to president lincoln in march eighteen sixty one sherman had offered his services but as in the case of grant they had been refused after the senator had transacted his business with the president he said mr president this is my brother colonel sherman who is just up from louisiana he may give you some information you want to this lincoln replied as reported by senator sherman himself ah how are they getting along down there sherman answered they think they are getting along swimmingly they are prepared for war to which lincoln responded oh well i guess we'll manage to keep the house Tecump, whose temper was not the mildest broke out on brother john as soon as they were out of the white house cursed the politicians roundly and wound up with you have got things in a hell of a fix and you may get out as best you can sherman was one of the very few generals who gave lincoln little or no worry grant tumbled right away general grant told this story about lincoln some years after the war just after receiving my commission as lieutenant general the president called me aside to speak to me privately after a brief reference to the military situation he said he thought he could illustrate what he wanted to say by a story said he at one time there was a great war among the animals and one side had great difficulty in getting a commander who had sufficient confidence in himself finally they found a monkey by the name of jocko who said he thought he could command their army if his tail could be made a little longer so they got more tail and spliced it on to his caudal appendage he looked at it admiringly and then said he thought he ought to have still more tail this was added and again he called for more the splicing process was repeated many times until they had coiled jocko's tail around the room filling all the space still he called for more tail and there being no more place to coil it they began wrapping it around his shoulders he continued his call for more and they kept on winding the additional tail around him until its wake broke him down i saw the point and rising from my chair replied mr president i will not call for any more assistance unless i find it impossible to do with what i have already don't kill him with your fist ward lehman marshal of the district of columbia during lincoln's time in washington was a powerful man his strength was phenomenal and a blow from his fist was like unto that coming from the business end of a sledge Layman tells the story, the hero of which is not mentioned by name, but in all probability his identity can be guessed. On one occasion, when the fears of the loyal element of the city, Washington, were excited to fever heat, a free fight near the old National Theater occurred about eleven o'clock one night. An officer, in passing the place, observed what was going on, and seeing the great number of persons engaged, he felt it to be his duty to command the peace. The imperative tone of his voice stopped the fighting for a moment, but the leader, a great bully, roughly pushed back the officer and told him to go away or he would whip him. The officer again advanced and said, I arrest you, attempting to place his hand on the man's shoulder when the bully struck a fearful blow at the officer's face this was parried and instantly followed by a blow from the fist of the officer striking the fellow under the chin and knocking him senseless blood issued from his mouth nose and ears it was believed that the man's neck was broken a surgeon was called who pronounced the case a critical one and the wounded man was hurried away on a litter to the hospital there the physician said there was concussion of the brain and that the man would die all the medical skill that the officer could procure was employed in the hope of saving the life of the man his conscience smote him for having as he believed taken the life of a fellow creature and he was inconsolable being on terms of intimacy with the president about two o'clock that night the officer went to the white house woke up mr lincoln and requested him to come into his office where he told him his story Mr. Lincoln listened with great interest until the narrative was completed and then asked a few questions, after which he remarked, 
i am sorry you had to kill the man but these are times of war and a great many men deserve killing this one according to your story is one of them so give yourself no uneasiness about the matter i will stand by you that is not why i came to you i knew i did my duty and had no fears of your disapproval of what i did replied the officer and then he added why i came to you was i felt great grief over the unfortunate affair and i wanted to talk to you about it mr lincoln then said with a smile placing his hand on the officer's shoulder you go home now and get some sleep but let me give you this piece of advice hereafter when you have occasion to strike a man don't hit him with your fist strike him with a club a crowbar or with something that won't kill him could be arbitrary lincoln could be arbitrary when occasion required this is the letter he wrote to one of the department heads you must make a job of it and provide a place for the bearer of this elias wampole make a job of it with the collector and have it done you can do it for me and you must there was no delay in taking action in this matter mr wampole or eli as he was hereafter known got there a general bustification many amusing stories are told of president lincoln and his gloves at about the time of his third reception he had on a tight-fitting pair of white kids which he had with difficulty got on he saw approaching in the distance an old illinois friend named simpson whom he welcomed with a genuine sangamon county illinois shake which resulted in bursting his white kid glove with an audible sound then raising his brawny hand up before him looking at it with an indescribable expression he said while the whole procession was checked witnessing this scene well my old friend this is a general bustification you and i were never intended to wear these things if they were stronger they might do well enough to keep out the cold but they are a failure to shake hands with between old friends like us stand aside captain and i'll see you shortly simpson stood aside and after the unwelcome ceremony was terminated he rejoined his old illinois friend in familiar intercourse making quartermasters h c whitney wrote in eighteen sixty six i was in washington in the indian service for a few days before august eighteen sixty one and i merely said to president lincoln one day everything is drifting into the war and i guess you will have to put me in the army the president looked up from his work and said good-humoredly i'm making generals now in a few days i will be making quartermasters and then i'll fix you no postmasters in his pocket in the diary of a public man appears this jocose anecdote mr lincoln walked into the corridor with us and as he bade us good-bye and thanked blank for what he had told him he again brightened up for a moment and asked him in an abrupt kind of way laying his hands as he spoke with a queer but not uncivil familiarity on his shoulder you haven't such a thing as a postmaster in your pocket have you blank stared at him in astonishment and i thought a little in alarm as if he suspected a sudden attack of insanity then mr lincoln went on you see it seems to me kind of unnatural that you shouldn't have at least a postmaster in your pocket everybody i've seen for days past has had foreign ministers and collectors and all kinds and i thought you couldn't have got in here without having at least a postmaster get into your pocket he skewed the line when a surveyor mr lincoln first platted the town of petersburg illinois some twenty or thirty years afterward the property owners along one of the outlying streets had trouble in fixing their boundaries they consulted the official plat and got no relief a committee was sent to springfield to consult the distinguished surveyor but he failed to recall anything that would give them aid and could only refer them to the record the dispute therefore went into the courts while the trial was pending an old irishman named mcguire who had worked for some farmer during the summer returned to town for the winter the case being mentioned in his presence he promptly said i can tell you all about it i helped carry the chain when abe lincoln laid out this town 
over there where they are quarreling about the lines when he was locating the street he straightened up from his instrument and said if i run that street right through it will cut three or four feet off the end of blank's house it's all he's got in the world and he never could get another i reckon it won't hurt anything out here if i skew the line a little and miss him the line was skewed and hence the trouble and more testimony furnished as to lincoln's abounding kindness of heart that would not willingly harm any human being whereas he stole nothing one of the most celebrated courts martial during the war was that of franklin w smith and his brother charged with defrauding the government these men bore a high character for integrity. At this time, however, courts martial were seldom invoked for any other purpose than to convict the accused, and the Smiths shared the usual fate of persons whose cases were submitted to such arbitrament. They were kept in prison, their papers seized, their business destroyed, and their reputations ruined, all of which was followed by a conviction. The finding of the court was submitted to the president, who, after a careful investigation, disapproved the judgment, and wrote the following endorsement upon the papers. Whereas Franklin W. Smith had transactions with the Navy Department to the amount of a million and a quarter of dollars, and whereas he had a chance to steal at least a quarter of a million, and was only charged with stealing twenty-two hundred dollars, and the question now is about his stealing one hundred, i don't believe he stole anything at all therefore the record and the findings are disapproved declared null and void and the defendants are fully discharged not like the pope's bull president lincoln after listening to the arguments and appeals of a committee which called upon him at the white house not long before the emancipation proclamation was issued said I do not want to issue a document that the whole world will see must necessarily be inoperative like the Pope's bull against the comet. Could he tell? A high private of the 140th Infantry Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteers, wounded at Chancellorsville, was taken to Washington. One day, as he was becoming convalescent, a whisper ran down the long row of cots that the president was in the building and would soon pass by instantly every boy in blue who was able arose and stood erect hands to the side ready to salute his commander-in-chief the pennsylvanian stood six feet seven inches in his stockings lincoln was six feet four as the president approached this giant towering above him he stopped in amazement and casting his eyes from head to foot and from foot to head as if contemplating the immense distance from one extremity to the other he stood for a moment speechless at length extending his hand he exclaimed hello comrade do you know when your feet get cold darned uncomfortable sitting frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of march second eighteen sixty one two days previous to the inauguration of president-elect lincoln contained the caricature reproduced here it was intended to convey the idea that the national administration would thereafter depend upon the support of bayonets to uphold it and the text underneath the picture ran as follows old abe oh it's all well enough to say that i must support the dignity of my high office by force but it's darned uncomfortable sitting i can tell you this journal was not entirely friendly to the new chief magistrate but it could not see into the future many of the leading publications of the east among them some of those which condemned slavery and were opposed to secession did not believe lincoln was the man for the emergency but instead of doing what they could do to help him along they attacked him most viciously no man save washington was more brutally lied about than lincoln but he bore all the slurs and thrusts not to mention the open cruel antagonism of those who should have been his warmest friends with a fortitude and patience few men have ever shown he was on the right road and awaited the time when his course should receive the approval it merited what's his name got there 
General James B. Fry told a good one on Secretary of War Stanton, who was worsted in a contention with the President. Several Brigadier Generals were to be selected, and Lincoln maintained that something must be done in the interest of the Dutch. Many complaints had come from prominent men, born in the fatherland, but who were fighting for the Union. Now, I want Schempelfennig given one of these brigadier ships. Stanton was stubborn and headstrong, as usual, but his manner and tone indicated that the President would have his own way in the end. However, he was not to be beaten without having made a fight. But, Mr. President, insisted the Iron War Secretary, it may be that this Mr. Shim, Shim what's his name, has no recommendations showing his fitness. Perhaps he can't speak English. Oh, that doesn't matter a bit, Stanton, retorted Lincoln. He may be deaf and dumb, for all I know. But whatever language he speaks, if any, we can furnish troops who will understand what he says. That name of his will make up for any differences in religion, politics, or understanding, and I'll take the risk of his coming out all right. Then, slamming his great hand upon the secretary's desk, he said, Shemel Fennig must be appointed. And he was, there and then. End of Part 5「Part Six of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Six. A really great general. Do you know General A? queried the President one day to a friend who had dropped in at the White House. Certainly, but you are not wasting any time thinking about him, are you? was the rejoinder. Oh, you wrong him, responded the President. He is a really great man, a philosopher. How do you make that out? He isn't worth the powder and ball necessary to kill him, so I've heard the military men say, the friend remarked. He is a mighty thinker, the president returned, because he has mastered that ancient and wise admonition, know thyself. He has formed an intimate acquaintance with himself, knows as well for what he is fitted and unfitted as any man living. Without doubt, he is a remarkable man. This war has not produced anything like him. How is it you are so highly pleased with General A. all at once? For the reason, replied Mr. Lincoln, with a merry twinkle of the eye, greatly to my relief, and to the interests of the country, he has resigned. The country should express its gratitude in some substantial way. Shrunk up north there was no member of the cabinet from the south when attorney general bates handed in his resignation and president lincoln had a great deal of trouble in making a selection finally titian f coffee consented to fill the vacant place for a time and did so until the appointment of mr speed in conversation with mr coffee the president quaintly remarked my cabinet has shrunk up north and i must find a southern man I suppose if the Twelve Apostles were to be chosen nowadays, the shrieks of locality would have to be heeded. Lincoln adopted the suggestion. It is not generally known that President Lincoln adopted a suggestion made by Secretary of the Treasury Salmon P. Chase in regard to the Emancipation Proclamation and incorporated it in that famous document. After the President had read it to the members of the Cabinet, he asked if he had omitted anything which should be added or inserted to strengthen it. It will be remembered that the closing paragraph of the proclamation reads in this way, And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the Constitution, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. President Lincoln's draft of the paper ended with the word mankind, and the words and the gracious favor of Almighty God were those suggested by Secretary Chase. Something for Everyone It was the President's overweening desire to accommodate all persons who came to him soliciting favors, 
but the opportunity was never offered until an untimely and unthinking disease which possessed many of the characteristics of one of the most dreaded maladies confined him to his bed at the white house the rumor spread that the president was afflicted with this disease while the truth was that it was merely a very mild attack of varioloid the office seekers didn't know the facts and for once the executive mansion was clear of them one day a man from the west who didn't read the papers but wanted the post office in his town called at the white house the president being then practically a well man saw him the caller was engaged in a voluble endeavor to put his capabilities in the most favorable light when the president interrupted him with the remark that he would be compelled to make the interview short as his doctor was due why mr president are you sick queried the visitor oh nothing much replied mr lincoln but the physician says he fears the worst what worst may i ask smallpox was the answer but you needn't be scared i'm only in the first stages now the visitor grabbed his hat sprang from his chair and without a word bolted for the door don't be in a hurry said the president placidly sit down and talk a while thank you sir i'll call again shouted the westerner as he disappeared through the opening in the wall now that's the way with people the president said when relating the story afterward when i can't give them what they want they're dissatisfied and say harsh things about me but when i've something to give to everybody they scamper off too many pigs for the teats an applicant for a sutlership in the army relates this story in the winter of eighteen sixty four after serving three years in the union army and being honorably discharged i made application for the post sutlership at point lookout my father being interested we made application to mr stanton the secretary of war we obtained an audience and were ushered into the presence of the most pompous man i ever met as i entered he waved his hand for me to stop at a given distance from him and then put these questions viz did you serve three years in the army i did sir were you honorably discharged i was sir let me see your discharge i gave it to him he looked it over and then said were you ever wounded i told him yes at the battle of williamsburg may five eighteen sixty one he then said i think we can give this position to a soldier who has lost an arm or leg he being more deserving and he then said i looked hardy and healthy enough to serve three years more he would not give me a chance to argue my case the audience was at an end he waved his hand to me i was then dismissed from the august presence of the honorable secretary of war my father was waiting for me in the hallway who saw by my countenance that i was not successful i said to my father let us go over to mr lincoln he may give us more satisfaction he said it would do me no good but we went over mr lincoln's reception room was full of ladies and gentlemen when we entered my turn soon came lincoln turned to my father and said now gentlemen be pleased to be as quick as possible with your business as it is growing late my father then stepped up to lincoln and introduced me to him lincoln then said take a seat gentlemen and state your business as quickly as possible there was but one chair by lincoln so he motioned my father to sit while i stood my father stated the business to him as stated above he then said have you seen mr stanton we told him yes and that he had refused he uh, mr lincoln then said gentlemen this is mr stanton's business i cannot interfere with him he attends to all these matters and i am sorry i cannot help you he saw that we were disappointed and did his best to revive our spirits he succeeded well with my father who was a lincoln man and who was a staunch republican mr lincoln then said now gentlemen i will tell you what it is i have thousands of applications like this every day but we cannot satisfy all for this reason that these positions are like office seekers there are too many pigs for the teats the ladies who were listening to the conversation placed their handkerchiefs to their faces and turned away 
but the joke of old abe put us all in a good humor we then left the presence of the greatest and most just man who ever lived to fill the presidential chair greeley carries lincoln to the lunatic asylum no sooner was abraham lincoln made the candidate for the presidency of the republican party in eighteen sixty than the opposition began to lampoon and caricature him in the cartoon here reproduced which is given the title of the republican party going to the right house lincoln is represented as entering the lunatic asylum riding on a rail carried by horace greeley the great abolitionist lincoln followed by his fellow cranks is assuring the latter that the millennium is going to begin and that all requests will be granted lincoln's followers are depicted as those men and women composing the free love element those who want religion abolished negroes who want it understood that the white man has no rights his black brother is bound to respect women suffragists who demand that men be made subject to female authority tramps who insist upon free lodging houses criminals who demand the right to steal from all they meet and toughs who want the police forces abolished so that the boys can run with the machine and have a muss whenever they feel like it without interference by the authorities the last time he saw douglas speaking of his last meeting with judge douglas mr lincoln said one day douglas came rushing in and said he had just got a telegraph dispatch from some friends in illinois urging him to come out and help set things right in egypt and that he would go or stay in washington just where i thought he could do the most good i told him to do as he chose but that probably he could do best in illinois upon that he shook hands with me and hurried away to catch the next train i never saw him again hurt his legs less lincoln was one of the attorneys in a case of considerable importance court being held in a very small and dilapidated schoolhouse out in the country lincoln was compelled to stoop very much in order to enter the door and the seats were so low that he doubled up his legs like a jackknife lincoln was obliged to sit upon a school bench and just in front of him was another making the distance between him and the seat in front of him very narrow and uncomfortable his position was almost unbearable and in order to carry out his preference which he secured as often as possible and that was to sit as near to the jury as convenient he took advantage of his discomfort and finally said to the judge on the bench your honor with your permission i'll sit up nearer to the gentlemen of the jury for it hurts my legs less to rub my calves against the bench than it does to skin my shins a little shy or grammar when mr lincoln had prepared his brief letter accepting the presidential nomination he took it to dr newton bateman the state superintendent of education mr schoolmaster he said here is my letter of acceptance i am not very strong on grammar and i wish you to see if it is all right i wouldn't like to have any mistakes in it the doctor took the letter and after reading it said there is only one change i would suggest mr lincoln you have written it shall be my care to not violate or disregard it in any part you should have written not to violate never split an infinitive is the rule mr lincoln took the manuscript regarding it a moment with a puzzled air so you think i better put those two little fellows end to end do you he said as he made the change his first satirical writing reuben and charles grigsby were married in spencer county indiana on the same day to elizabeth ray and matilda hawkins respectively they met the next day at the home of reuben grigsby senior and held a double infare to which most of the county was invited with the exception of the lincolns this abraham duly resented and it resulted in his first attempt at satirical writing which he called the chronicles of reuben the manuscript was lost and not recovered until eighteen sixty five when a house belonging to one of the grigsby's was torn down in the loft a boy found a roll of musty old papers and was intently reading them 
when he was asked what he was doing reading a portion of the scriptures that haven't been revealed yet was the response this was lincoln's chronicles which is herewith given the chronicles of reuben now there was a man whose name was reuben and the same was very great in substance in horses and cattle and swine and a very great household it came to pass when the sons of reuben grew up that they were desirous of taking to themselves wives and being too well known as to honor in their own country they took a journey into a far country and there procured for themselves wives it came to pass also that when they were about to make the return home they sent a messenger before them to bear the tidings to their parents these inquiring of the messenger what time their sons and wives would come made a great feast and called all their kinsmen and neighbors in and made great preparation when the time drew nigh they sent out two men to meet the grooms and their brides with a trumpet to welcome them and to accompany them when they came near into the house of reuben the father the messenger came before them and gave a shout and the whole multitude ran out with shouts of joy and music playing on all kinds of instruments some were playing on harps some on viols and some blowing on ram's horns some also were casting dust and ashes toward heaven and chief among them all was josiah blowing his bugle and making sounds so great the neighboring hills and valleys echoed with the resounding acclamation when they had played and their harps had sounded till the grooms and brides approached the gates reuben the father met them and welcomed them to his house the wedding feast being now ready they were all invited to sit down and eat placing the bridegrooms and their brides at each end of the table. Waiters were then appointed to serve and wait on the guests. When all had eaten and were full and merry, they went out again and played and sung till night. And when they had made an end of feasting and rejoicing, the multitude dispersed, each going to his own home. The family then took seats with their waiters to converse, while preparations were being made in two upper chambers for the brides and grooms this being done the waiters took the two brides upstairs placing one in a room at the right hand of the stairs and the other on the left the waiters came down and nancy the mother then gave directions to the waiters of the bridegrooms and they took them upstairs but placed them in the wrong rooms the waiters then all came downstairs but the mother, being fearful of a mistake, made inquiry of the waiters, and, learning the true facts, took the light and sprang upstairs. It came to pass she ran to one of the rooms and exclaimed, "'Oh, Lord Reuben, you are with the wrong wife!' The young men, both alarmed at this, ran out with such violence against each other, they came near knocking each other down. The tumult gave evidence to those below that the mistake was certain." at last they all came down and had a long conversation about who made the mistake but it could not be decided so ended the chapter the original manuscript of the chronicles of reuben was last in the possession of redmond grigsby of rockport indiana a newspaper which had obtained a copy of the chronicles sent a reporter to interview elizabeth grigsby or aunt betsy as she was called and asked her about the famous manuscript and the mistake made at the double wedding yes they did have a joke on us said aunt betsy they said my man got into the wrong room and charles got into my room but it wasn't so lincoln just wrote that for mischief abe and my man often laughed about that likely to do it an officer having had some trouble with general sherman being very angry presented himself before mr lincoln who was visiting the camp and said mr president i have a cause of grievance this morning i went to general sherman and he threatened to shoot me threatened to shoot you asked mr lincoln well in a stage whisper if i were you i would keep away from him if he threatens to shoot i would not trust him for i believe he would do it the enemy are iron early in the presidential campaign of eighteen sixty four president lincoln said one night to a late caller at the white house we have met the enemy and they're iron i think the cabal of obstructionists are bested i feel certain that if i live i'm going to be re-elected whether i deserve to be or not it is not for me to say 
but on the score even of remunerative chances for speculative service i now am inspired with the hope that our disturbed country further requires the valuable services of your humble servant jordan has been a hard road to travel but i feel now that notwithstanding the enemies i have made and the faults i have committed i'll be dumped on the right side of that stream i hope however that i may never have another four years of such anxiety tribulation and abuse my only ambition is and has been to put down the rebellion and restore peace after which i want to resign my office go abroad take some rest study foreign governments see something of foreign life and in my old age die in peace with all of the good of god's creatures and here i am an old acquaintance of the president visited him in washington lincoln desired to give him a place thus encouraged the visitor who was an honest man but wholly inexperienced in public affairs or business asked for a high office superintendent of the mint the president was aghast and said good gracious why didn't he ask to be secretary of the treasury and have done with it afterwards he said well now i never thought mr blank had anything more than average ability when we were young men together but then i suppose he thought the same thing about me and here i am safe as long as they were good at the celebrated peace conference whereat there was much pow-wow and no result president lincoln in response to certain remarks by the confederate commissioners commented with some severity upon the conduct of the confederate leaders saying that they had plainly forfeited all right to immunity from punishment for their treason being positive and unequivocal in stating his views concerning individual treason his words were of ominous import there was a pause during which commissioner hunter regarded the speaker with a steady searching look at length carefully measuring his words mr hunter said then mr president if we understand you correctly you think that we of the confederacy have committed treason are traitors to your government have forfeited our rights and are proper subjects for the hangman is not that about what your words imply yes replied president lincoln you have stated the proposition better than i did that is about the size of it another pause and a painful one succeeded and then hunter with a pleasant smile remarked well mr lincoln we have about concluded that we shall not be hanged as long as you are president if we behave ourselves and hunter meant what he said smelt no royalty in our carriage on one occasion in going to meet an appointment in the southern part of the sucker state that section of illinois called egypt lincoln with other friends was traveling in the caboose of a freight train when the freight was switched off the main track to allow a special train to pass lincoln's more aristocratic rival stephen a douglas was being conveyed to the same town in this special the passing train was decorated with banners and flags and carried a band of music which was playing hail to the chief as the train whistled past lincoln broke out in a fit of laughter and said boys the gentleman in that car evidently smelt no royalty in our carriage hell a mile from the white house ward layman told this story of president lincoln whom he found one day in a particularly gloomy frame of mind layman said the president remarked as i came in i fear i have made senator wade of ohio my enemy for life how i asked well continued the president wade was here just now urging me to dismiss grant and in response to something he said i remarked senator that reminds me of a story what did wade say i inquired of the president he said in a petulant way the president responded it is with you sir all story story you are the father of every military blunder that has been made during the war you are on your road to hell sir with this government by your obstinacy and you are not a mile off this minute what did you say then i good-naturedly said to him the president replied senator that is just about from here to the capital is it not 
He was very angry, grabbed up his hat and cane, and went away. His Glass Hack President Lincoln had not been in the White House very long before Mrs. Lincoln became seized with the idea that a fine new barouche was about the proper thing for the first lady of the land. The president did not care particularly about it one way or the other, and told his wife to order whatever she wanted. Lincoln forgot all about the new vehicle and was overcome with astonishment one afternoon when, having acceded to Mrs. Lincoln's desire to go driving, he found a beautiful barouche standing in front of the door of the White House. His wife watched him with an amused smile, but the only remark he made was, Well, Mary, that's about the slickest glass hack in town, isn't it? Leave him kicking. Lincoln, in the days of his youth, was often unfaithful to his Quaker traditions. On the day of election in 1840, word came to him that one Radford, a Democratic contractor, had taken possession of one of the polling places with his workmen and was preventing the Whigs from voting. Lincoln started off at a gate which showed his interest in the matter at hand. He went up to Radford and persuaded him to leave the polls, remarking at the same time, Radford, you'll spoil and blow if you live much longer. Radford's prudence prevented an actual collision, which, it is said, Lincoln regretted. He told his friend Speed he wanted Radford to show fight so that he might knock him down and leave him kicking. Who commenced this fuss? President Lincoln was at all times an advocate of peace, provided it could be obtained honorably and with credit to the United States. As to the cause of the Civil War, which side of Mason and Dixon's line was responsible for it, who fired the first shots, who were the aggressors, etc., Lincoln did not seem to bother about. He wanted to preserve the Union above all things. Slavery, he was assured, was dead, but he thought the former slaveholders should be recompensed. To illustrate his feelings in the matter, he told this story. Some of the supporters of the Union cause are opposed to accommodate or yield to the South in any manner or way because the Confederates began the war, were determined to take their states out of the Union, and consequently should be held responsible to the last stage for whatever may come in the future. Now this reminds me of a good story I heard once when I lived in Illinois. A vicious bull in a pasture took after everybody who tried to cross the lot and one day a neighbor of the owner was the victim. This man was a speedy fellow and got to a friendly tree ahead of the bull, but not in time to climb the tree. So he led the enraged animal a merry race around the tree, until finally succeeding in seizing the bull by the tail. The bull, being at a disadvantage, not able to either catch the man or release his tail, was mad enough to eat nails. He dug up the earth with his feet, scattered gravel all around, bellowed until you could hear him for two miles or more, and at length broke into a dead run, the man hanging on to his tail all the time, while the bull, much out of temper, was legging it to the best of his ability. His tormentor, still clinging to the tail, asked, "'Darn you, who commenced this fuss?' It's our duty to settle this fuss at the earliest possible moment, no matter who commenced it. That's my idea of it. End of Part 6「Seven of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 7. Abe's Little Joke. When General W. T. Sherman, November 12, 1864, severed all communication with the North and started for Savannah with his magnificent army of 60,000 men, there was much anxiety for a month as to his whereabouts. President Lincoln, in response to an inquiry, said, I know what hole Sherman went in at, but I don't know what hole he'll come out at. Colonel McClure had been in consultation with the president one day, about two weeks after Sherman's disappearance, and in this connection related this incident. 
i was leaving the room and just as i reached the door the president turned around and with a merry twinkling of the eye inquired mcclure wouldn't you like to hear something from sherman the inquiry electrified me at the instant as it seemed to imply that lincoln had some information on the subject i immediately answered well, yes most of all i should like to hear from sherman to this president lincoln answered with a hearty laugh well i'll be hanged if i wouldn't myself what summer thought although himself a most polished even a fastidious gentleman senator sumner never allowed lincoln's homely ways to hide his great qualities he gave him a respect and esteem at the start which others accorded only after experience the senator was most tactful too in his dealings with mrs lincoln and soon had a firm footing in the household that he was proud of this perhaps a little boastful there is no doubt lincoln himself appreciated this sumner thinks he runs me he said with an amused twinkle one day a useless dog when hood's army had been scattered into fragments president lincoln elated by the defeat of what had so long been a menacing force on the borders of tennessee was reminded by its collapse of the fate of a savage dog belonging to one of his neighbors in the frontier settlements in which he lived in his youth the dog he said was the terror of the neighborhood and its owner a churlish and quarrelsome fellow took pleasure in the brute's forcible attitude finally all other means having failed to subdue the creature a man loaded a lump of meat with a charge of powder to which was attached a slow fuse this was dropped where the dreaded dog would find it and the animal gulped down the tempting bait there was a dull rumbling a muffled explosion and fragments of the dog were seen flying in every direction the grieved owner picking up the shattered remains of his cruel favorite said he was a good dog but as a dog his days of usefulness are over hood's army was a good army said lincoln by way of comment and we were all afraid of it but as an army its usefulness is gone origin of the influence story judge baldwin of california being in washington called one day on general halleck then commander-in-chief of the union forces and presuming upon a familiar acquaintance in california a few years since solicited a pass outside of our lines to see a brother in virginia not thinking that he would meet with a refusal as both his brother and himself were good union men we have been deceived too often said general halleck and i regret i can't grant it judge b then went to stanton and was very briefly disposed of with the same result finally he obtained an interview with mr lincoln and stated his case have you applied to general halleck inquired the president yes and met with a flat refusal said judge b then you must see stanton continued the president i have and with the same result was the reply well then said mr lincoln with a smile i can do nothing for you must know that i have very little influence with this administration although i hope to have more with the next felt sorry for both many ladies attended the famous debates between lincoln and douglas and they were the most unprejudiced listeners i can recall only one fact of the debates says mrs william crotty of seneca illinois that i felt so sorry for lincoln while douglas was speaking and then to my surprise i felt so sorry for douglas when lincoln replied the disinterested to whom it was an intellectual game felt the power and charm of both men where did it come from what made the deepest impression upon you inquired a friend one day when you stood in the presence of the falls of niagara the greatest of natural wonders oh the thing that struck me most forcibly when i saw the falls lincoln responded with characteristic deliberation was where in the world did all that water come from long abe four years longer the second election of abraham lincoln to the presidency of the united states was the reward of his courage and genius bestowed upon him by the people of the union states general george b mcclellan was his opponent in eighteen sixty four upon the platform that the war is a failure 
and carried but three states new jersey delaware and kentucky the states which did not think the war was a failure were those in new england new york pennsylvania all the western commonwealths west virginia tennessee louisiana arkansas and the new state of nevada admitted into the union on october thirty first president lincoln's popular majority over mcclellan who never did much toward making the war a success was more than four hundred thousand underneath the cartoon reproduced here from harper's weekly of november twenty sixth eighteen sixty four were the words long abraham lincoln a little longer but the beloved president's time upon earth was not to be much longer as he was assassinated just one month and ten days after his second inauguration indeed the words a little longer printed below the cartoon were strangely prophetic although not intended to be such the people of the united states had learned to love long abe their affection being of a purely personal nature in the main no other chief executive was regarded as so sincerely the friend of the great mass of the inhabitants of the republic as lincoln he was in truth one of the common people having been born among them and lived as one of them lincoln's great height made him an easy subject for the cartoonist and they used it in his favor as well as against him all sicker in your man a commissioner to the hawaiian islands was to be appointed and eight applicants had filed their papers when a delegation from the south appeared at the white house on behalf of a ninth not only was their man fit so the delegation urged but was also in bad health and a residence in that balmy climate would be of great benefit to him the president was rather impatient that day and before the members of the delegation had fairly started in suddenly closed the interview with this remark gentlemen i am sorry to say that there are eight other applicants for that place and they are all sicker than your man easier to empty the potomac an officer of low volunteer rank persisted in telling and retelling his troubles to the president on a summer afternoon when lincoln was tired and careworn after listening patiently he finally turned upon the man and looking wearily out upon the broad potomac in the distance said in a peremptory tone that ended the interview now my man go away go away i cannot meddle in your case i could as easily bail out the potomac river with a teaspoon as attend to all the details of the army he wanted a steady hand when the emancipation proclamation was taken to mr lincoln by secretary seward for the president's signature mr lincoln took a pen dipped it in the ink moved his hand to the place for the signature held it a moment then removed his hand and dropped the pen after a little hesitation he again took up the pen and went through the same movement as before mr lincoln then turned to mr seward and said i have been shaking hands since nine o'clock this morning and my right arm is almost paralyzed if my name ever goes into history it will be for this act and my whole soul is in it if my hand trembles when i sign the proclamation all who examine the document hereafter will say he hesitated he then turned to the table took up the pen again and slowly firmly wrote abraham lincoln with which the whole world is now familiar he then looked up smiled and said that will do lincoln saw stanton about it mr lovejoy heading a committee of western men discussed an important scheme with the president and the gentlemen were then directed to explain it to secretary of war stanton upon presenting themselves to the secretary and showing the president's order the secretary said did lincoln give you an order of that kind he did sir then he is a damned fool said the angry secretary do you mean to say that the president is a damned fool asked lovejoy in amazement yes sir if he gave you such an order as that the bewildered illinoisan betook himself at once to the president and related the result of the conference did stanton say i was a damn fool asked lincoln at the close of the recital he did sir and repeated it after a moment's pause and looking up the president said if stanton said i was a damned fool then i must be one for he is nearly always right and generally says what he means 
i will slip over and see him mrs lincoln's surprise a good story is told of how mrs lincoln made a little surprise for her husband in the early days it was customary for lawyers to go from one county to another on horseback a journey which often required several weeks on returning from one of these trips late one night mr lincoln dismounted from his horse at the familiar corner and then turned to go into the house but stopped a perfectly unknown structure was before him surprised and thinking there must be some mistake he went across the way and knocked at a neighbor's door the family had retired and so called out who's there abe lincoln was the reply i'm looking for my house i thought it was across the way but when i went away a few weeks ago there was only a one-story house there and now there is a two-story house in its place i think i must be lost the neighbors explained then that mrs lincoln had added another story during his absence and mr lincoln laughed and went to his remodeled house menace to the government the persistence of office-seekers nearly drove president lincoln wild they slipped in through the half-opened doors of the executive mansion they dogged his steps if he walked they edged their way through the crowds and thrust their papers in his hands when he rode and taking it all in all they well-nigh worried him to death he once said that if the government passed through the rebellion without dismemberment there was the strongest danger of its falling a prey to the rapacity of the office-seeking class this human struggle and scramble for office for a way to live without work will finally test the strength of our institutions were the words he used troops couldn't fly over it on april twentieth a delegation from baltimore appeared at the white house and begged the president that troops for washington be sent around and not through baltimore president lincoln replied laughingly if i grant this concession you will be back tomorrow asking that no troops be marched round it the president was right that afternoon and again on sunday and monday committees sought him protesting that maryland soil should not be polluted by the feet of soldiers marching against the south the president had but one reply we must have troops and as they can neither crawl under maryland nor fly over it they must come across it pat was forenst the government the governor-general of canada with some of his principal officers visited president lincoln in the summer of eighteen sixty four they had been very troublesome in harboring blockade runners and they were said to have carried on a large trade from their ports with the confederates lincoln treated his guests with great courtesy after a pleasant interview the governor alluding to the coming presidential election said jokingly but with a grain of sarcasm i understand mr president that everybody votes in this country if we remain until november can we vote you remind me replied the president of a countryman of yours a green immigrant from ireland pat arrived on election day and perhaps was as eager as your excellency to vote and to vote early and late and often so upon landing at castle garden he hastened to the nearest voting place and as he approached the judge who received the ballots inquired who do you want to vote for on which side are you poor pat was embarrassed he did not know who were the candidates he stopped scratched his head then with the readiness of his countrymen he said i'm forence the government anyhow tell me if your honor plays which is the rebellion side and i tell you how i want to vote in old ireland i was always on the rebellion side and by st patrick i'll do that same in america your excellency said mr lincoln would i should think not be at all at a loss on which side to vote can't spare this man one night about eleven o'clock colonel a k mcclure whose intimacy with president lincoln was so great that he could obtain admittance to the executive mansion at any and all hours called at the white house to urge mr lincoln to remove general grant from command after listening patiently for a long time the president gathering himself up in his chair said with the utmost earnestness i can't spare this man he fights in relating the particulars of this interview colonel mcclure said that was all he said but i knew that it was enough 
and that Grant was safe in Lincoln's hand against his countless host of enemies. The only man in all the nation who had the power to save Grant was Lincoln, and he had decided to do it. He was not influenced by any personal partiality for Grant, for they had never met. It was not until after the Battle of Shiloh, fought on the 6th and 7th of April, 1862, that Lincoln was placed in a position to exercise a controlling influence in shaping the destiny of Grant. The first reports from the Shiloh battlefield created profound alarm throughout the entire country, and the wildest exaggerations were spread in a flood tide of vituperation against Grant. The few up today who can recall the inflamed condition of public sentiment against Grant, caused by the disastrous first day's battle at Shiloh, will remember that he was denounced as incompetent for his command by the public journals of all parties in the North, and with almost entire unanimity by senators and congressmen, regardless of political affinities. I appealed to Lincoln for his own sake to remove Grant at once, and in giving my reasons for it, I simply voiced the admittedly overwhelming protest from the loyal people of the land against Grant's continuance in command. I did not forget that Lincoln was the one man who never allowed himself to appear as wantonly defying public sentiment. It seemed to me impossible for him to save Grant without taking a crushing load of condemnation upon himself. But Lincoln was wiser than all those around him, and he not only saved Grant, but he saved him by such well-concerted effort that he soon won popular applause from those who were most violent in demanding Grant's dismissal. His Teeth Chattered During the Lincoln-Douglas joint debates of 1858, the latter accused Lincoln of having, when in Congress, voted against the appropriation for supplies to be sent the United States soldiers in Mexico. In reply, Lincoln said, This is a perversion of the facts. I was opposed to the policy of the administration in declaring war against Mexico. But when war was declared, I never failed to vote for the support of any proposition looking to the comfort of our poor fellows who were maintaining the dignity of our flag in a war that I thought unnecessary and unjust. He gradually became more and more excited. His voice thrilled and his whole frame shook. Sitting on the stand was O.B. Ficklin, who had served in Congress with Lincoln in 1847. Lincoln reached back, took Ficklin by the coat collar back of his neck, and in no gentle manner lifted him from his seat as if he had been a kitten, and roared, "'Fellow citizens, here is Ficklin, who was at that time in Congress with me, and he knows it is a lie.' He shook Ficklin until his teeth chattered. Fearing he would shake Ficklin's head off, Ward Lehman grasped Lincoln's hand and broke his grip. After the speaking was over, Ficklin, who had warm personal friendship with him, said, Lincoln, you nearly shook all the democracy out of me today. Aaron got his commission. President Lincoln was censored for appointing one that had zealously opposed his second term. He replied, Well, I suppose Judge E., having been disappointed before, did behave pretty ugly, but that wouldn't make him any less fit for the place and I think I have scriptural authority for appointing him. You remember when the Lord was on Mount Sinai getting out a commission for Aaron, that same Aaron was at the foot of the mountain, making a false god for the people to worship. Yet Aaron got his commission, you know. Lincoln and the Ministers At the time of Lincoln's nomination at Chicago, Mr. Newton Bateman, superintendent of public instruction for the state of Illinois, occupied a room adjoining and opening into the executive chamber at Springfield. Frequently, this door was open during Mr. Lincoln's receptions, and throughout the seven months or more of his occupation, he saw him nearly every day. Often, when Mr. Lincoln was tired, he closed the door against all intruders and called Mr. Bateman into his room for a quiet talk. On one of these occasions, Mr. Lincoln took up a book containing canvas of the city of Springfield, in which he lived, 
showing the candidate for whom each citizen had declared it his intention to vote in the approaching election mr lincoln's friends had doubtless at his own request placed the result of the canvass in his hands this was towards the close of october and only a few days before election calling mr bateman to a seat by his side having previously locked all the doors he said let us look over this book i wish particularly to see how the ministers if springfield are going to vote the leaves were turned one by one and as the names were examined mr lincoln frequently asked if this one and that one was not a minister or an elder or a member of such and such a church and sadly expressed his surprise on receiving an affirmative answer in that manner he went through the book and then he closed it and sat silently for a few minutes regarding a memorandum in pencil which lay before him at length he turned to mr bateman with a face full of sadness and said here are twenty-three ministers of different denominations and all of them are against me but three and here are a great many prominent members of churches a very large majority are against me mr bateman i am not a christian god knows i would be one but i have carefully read the bible and i do not so understand this book and he drew forth a pocket new testament these men well know he continued that i am for freedom in the territories freedom everywhere as free as the constitution and the laws will permit and that my opponents are for slavery they know this and yet with this book in their hands in the light of which human bondage cannot live a moment they are going to vote against me i do not understand it at all here mr lincoln paused paused for long minutes his features surcharged with emotion then he rose and walked up and down the reception room in the effort to retain or regain his self-possession stopping at last he said with a trembling voice and cheeks wet with tears i know there is a god and that he hates injustice and slavery i see the storm coming and i know that his hand is in it if he has a place and work for me and i think he has i believe i am ready i am nothing but truth is everything i know i am right because i know that liberty is right for christ teaches it and christ is god i have told them that a house divided against itself cannot stand and christ and reason say the same and they will find it so douglas doesn't care whether slavery is voted up or down but god cares and humanity cares and i care and with god's help i shall not fail i may not see the end but it will come and i shall be vindicated and these men will find they have not read their bible right much of this was uttered as if he were speaking to himself and with a sad earnest solemnity of manner impossible to be described after a pause he resumed doesn't it seem strange that men can ignore the moral aspect of this contest no revelation could make it plainer to me that slavery or the government must be destroyed the future would be something awful as i look at it but for this rock on which i stand alluding to the testament which he still held in his hand especially with the knowledge of how these ministers are going to vote it seems as if god had borne with this thing slavery until the teachers of religion have come to defend it from the bible and to claim for it a divine character and sanction and now the cup of iniquity is full and the vials of wrath will be poured out everything he said was of a peculiarly deep tender and religious tone and all was tinged with a touching melancholy he repeatedly referred to his conviction that the day of wrath was at hand and that he was to be an actor in the terrible struggles which would issue in the overthrow of slavery although he might not live to see the end after further reference to a belief in the divine providence and the fact of god in history the conversation turned upon prayer he freely stated his belief in the duty privilege and efficacy of prayer and intimated in no unmistakable terms that he had sought in that way divine guidance and favor 
the effect of this conversation upon the mind of mr bateman a christian gentleman whom mr lincoln profoundly respected was to convince him that mr lincoln had in a quiet way found a path to the christian standpoint that he had found god and rested on the eternal truth of god as the two men were about to separate mr bateman remarked i have not supposed that you were accustomed to think so much upon this class of subjects certainly your friends generally are ignorant of the sentiments you have expressed to me he replied quickly i know they are but i think more on these subjects than upon all others and i have done so for years and i am willing you should know it hardtack better than generals secretary of war stanton told the president the following story which greatly amused the latter as he was especially fond of a joke at the expense of some high military or civil dignitary stanton had little or no sense of humor when secretary stanton was making a trip up the broad river in north carolina in a tugboat a federal picket yelled out what have you got on board of that tug the severe and dignified answer was the secretary of war and major general foster instantly the picket roared back we've got major generals enough up here why don't you bring us up some hardtack got the preacher a story told by a cabinet member tended to show how accurately lincoln could calculate political results in advance a faculty which remained with him all his life a friend who was a democrat had come to him early in the canvass and told him he wanted to see him elected but did not like to vote against his party still he would vote for him if the contest was to be so close that every vote was needed a short time before the election lincoln said to him i have got the preacher and i don't want your vote big joke on halleck when general halleck was commander-in-chief of the union forces with headquarters at washington president lincoln unconsciously played a big practical joke upon that dignified officer the president had spent the night at the soldier's home and the next morning asked captain derrickson commanding the company of pennsylvania soldiers which was the presidential guard at the white house and the home wherever the president happened to be to go to town with him captain derrickson told the story in a most entertaining way when we entered the city mr lincoln said he would call at general halleck's headquarters and get what news had been received from the army during the night i informed him that general Cullum, chief aide to general halleck was raised in meadville and that i knew him when i was a boy he replied then we must see both the gentlemen when the carriage stopped he requested me to remain seated and said he would bring the gentlemen down to see me the office being on the second floor in a short time the president came down followed by the other gentlemen when he introduced them to me general cullum recognized and seemed pleased to see me in general halleck i thought i discovered a kind of quizzical look as much as to say isn't this rather a big joke to ask the commander-in-chief of the army down to the street to be introduced to a country captain end of part seven Part eight of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part eight. Stories better than doctors. A gentleman visiting a hospital at Washington heard an occupant of one of the beds laughing and talking about the president, who had been there a short time before, and gladdened the wounded with some of his stories. The soldier seemed in such good spirits that the gentleman inquired, Oh, you must be very slightly wounded yes replied the brave fellow very slightly i have only lost one leg and i'd be glad enough to lose the other if i could hear some more of old abe's stories short but exciting william b wilson employed in the telegraph office at the war department ran over to the white house one day to summon mr lincoln he described the trip back to the war department in this manner calling one of his two younger boys to join him we then started from the white house between stately trees along a gravel path which led to the rear of the old war department building 
it was a warm day and mr lincoln wore as part of his costume a faded gray linen duster which hung loosely around his long gaunt frame his kindly eye was beaming with good nature and his ever thoughtful brow was unruffled we had barely reached the gravel walk before he stooped over picked up a round smooth pebble and shooting it off his thumb challenged us to a game of followings which we accepted each in turn tried to hit the outlying stone which was being constantly projected onward by the president the game was short but exciting the cheerfulness of childhood the ambition of young manhood and the gravity of the statesman were all injected into it the game was not won until the steps of the war department were reached every inch of progression was toughly contested and when the president was declared victor it was only by a handspan he appeared to be as much pleased as if he had won a battle mr bull didn't get his cotton because of the blockade by the union fleets of the southern cotton ports england was deprived of her supply of cotton and scores of thousands of british operatives were thrown out of employment by the closing of the cotton mills at manchester and other cities in great britain england john bull felt so badly about this that the british wanted to go to war on account of it but when the united states eagle ruffled up its wings the english thought over the business and concluded not to fight harper's weekly of may sixteenth eighteen sixty three contained the cartoon we reproduce which shows john bull as manifesting much anxiety regarding the cotton he had bought from the southern planters but which the latter could not deliver beneath the cartoon is this bit of dialogue between john bull and president lincoln mr bull confiding creature i want my cotton i bought a fence and a pound mr lincoln don't know anything about it my dear sir your friends the rebels are burning all the cotton they can find and i confiscate the rest good morning john as president lincoln has a big fifteen-inch gun at his side the black muzzle of which is pressed tightly against mr bull's waistcoat the president to all appearances has the best of the argument by a long shot anyhow mr bull had nothing more to say but gave the cotton matter up as a bad piece of business and pocketed the loss stick to american principles president lincoln's first conclusion that mason and slidell should be released was the real ground on which the administration submitted we must stick to american principles concerning the rights of neutrals it was to many as secretary of the treasury chase declared it was to him gall and wormwood james russell lowell's verse expressed best the popular feeling we give the critters back john cos abram thought twas right and warn't your bully and clack john provokin us to fight the decision raised mr lincoln immeasurably in the view of thoughtful men especially in england used rude tact general john c fremont with headquarters at st louis astonished the country by issuing a proclamation declaring among other things that the property real and personal of all the persons in the state of missouri who should take up arms against the united states or who should be directly proved to have taken an active part with its enemies in the field would be confiscated to public use and their slaves if they had any declared freemen the president was dismayed he modified that part of the proclamation referring to slaves and finally replaced fremont with general hunter mrs fremont daughter of senator t h benton her husband's real chief of staff flew to washington and sought mr lincoln it was midnight but the president gave her an audience without waiting for an explanation she violently charged him with sending an enemy to missouri to look into fremont's case and threatening that if fremont desired to he could set up a government for himself i had to exercise all the rude tact i have to avoid quarrelling with her said mr lincoln afterwards abe on a woodpile lincoln's attempt to make a lawyer of himself under adverse and unpromising circumstances he was a barefooted farmhand excited comment and it was not to be wondered 
one old man who was yet alive as late as 1901 had often employed Lincoln to do farm work for him, and was surprised to find him one day sitting barefoot on the summit of a woodpile and attentively reading a book. This being an unusual thing for farm hands in that early day to do, said the old man when relating the story, I asked him what was he reading. I'm not reading, he answered. I'm studying. Studying what? I inquired. Law, sir, was the emphatic response it was really too much for me as i looked at him sitting there proud as cicero great god almighty i exclaimed and passed on lincoln merely laughed and resumed his studies taking down a dandy in a political campaign lincoln once replied to colonel richard taylor a self-conceited dandified man who wore a gold chain and ruffled shirt his party at that time was posing as the hard-working bone and sinew of the land, while the Whigs were stigmatized as aristocrats, ruffled shirt gentry. Taylor making a sweeping gesture, his overcoat became torn open, displaying his finery. Lincoln, in reply, said, laying his hand on his jeans-clad breast, Here is your aristocrat, one of your silk-stocking gentry, at your service then spreading out his hands bronzed and gaunt with toil here is your rag basin with lily-white hands yes i suppose according to my friend taylor i am a bloated aristocrat when old abe got mad soon after hostilities broke out between the north and south congress appointed a committee on the conduct of the war this committee beset mr lincoln and urged all sorts of measures its members were aggressive and patriotic, and one thing they determined upon was that the Army of the Potomac should move, but it was not until March that they became convinced that anything should be done. One day early in that month, Senator Chandler of Michigan, a member of the committee, met George W. Julian. He was in high glee. Old Abe is mad, said Julian, and the war will now go on wanted to borrow the army during one of the periods when things were at a standstill the washington authorities being unable to force general mcclellan to assume an aggressive attitude president lincoln went to the general's headquarters to have a talk with him but for some reason he was unable to get an audience mr lincoln returned to the white house much disturbed at his failure to see the commander of the union forces and immediately sent for two general officers to have a consultation on their arrival he told them he must have someone to talk to about the situation and as he had failed to see general mcclellan he wished their views as to the possibility or probability of commencing active operations with the army of the potomac something's got to be done said the president emphatically and done right away or the bottom will fall out of the whole thing now if mcclellan doesn't want to use the army for a while i'd like to borrow it from him and see if i can't do something or other with it if mcclellan can't fish he ought at least to be cutting bait at a time like this young sucker visitors after mr lincoln's nomination for the presidency the executive chamber a large fine room in the state house at springfield was set apart for him where he met the public until after his election as illustrative of the nature of many of his calls the following incident was related by mr holland an eyewitness mr lincoln being in conversation with a gentleman one day two raw plainly dressed young suckers entered the room and bashfully lingered near the door as soon as he observed them and saw their embarrassment, he rose and walked to them, saying, How do you do, my good fellows? What can I do for you? Will you sit down? The spokesman of the pair, the shorter of the two, declined to sit and explained the object of the call thus. He had had a talk about the relative height of Mr. Lincoln and his companion and had asserted his belief that they were of exactly the same height. He had come in to verify his judgment. Mr. Lincoln smiled, went and got his cane, and placing the end of it upon the wall, said, Here, young man, come under here. The young man came under the cane as Mr. Lincoln held it, and when it was perfectly adjusted to his height, Mr. Lincoln said, Now come out and hold the cane. 
this he did while mr lincoln stood under rubbing his head back and forth to see that it worked easily under the measurement he stepped out and declared to the sagacious fellow who was curiously looking on that he had guessed with remarkable accuracy that he and the young man were exactly the same height then he shook hands with them and sent them on their way mr lincoln would just as soon have thought of cutting off his right hand as he would have thought of turning those boys away with the impression that they had in any way insulted his dignity and you don't wear hoop skirts an ohio senator had an appointment with president lincoln at six o'clock and as he entered the vestibule of the white house his attention was attracted toward a poorly clad young woman who was violently sobbing he asked her the cause of her distress she said she had been ordered away by the servants after vainly waiting many hours to see the president about her only brother who had been condemned to death her story was this she and her brother were foreigners and orphans they had been in this country several years her brother enlisted in the army but through bad influences was induced to desert he was captured tried and sentenced to be shot the old story the poor girl had obtained the signature of some persons who had formerly known him to a petition for a pardon and alone had come to washington to lay the case before the president thronged as the waiting rooms always were she had passed the long hours of two days trying in vain to get an audience and had at length been ordered away the gentleman's feelings were touched he said to her that he had come to see the president but did not know as he should succeed he told her however to follow him upstairs and he would see what could be done for her just after reaching the door mr lincoln came out and meeting his friend said good-humouredly are you not ahead of time the gentleman showed him his watch with the hand upon the hour of six well returned mr lincoln i have been so busy to-day that i have not had time to get a lunch go in and sit down i will be back directly the gentleman made the young woman accompany him into the office and when they were seated said to her now my good girl i want you to muster all the courage you have in the world when the president comes back he will sit down in that armchair i shall get up to speak to him and as i do so you must force yourself between us and insist upon his examination of your papers telling him it is a case of life and death and admits of no delay these instructions were carried out to the letter mr lincoln was at first somewhat surprised at the apparent forwardness of the young woman but observing her distressed appearance he ceased conversation with his friend and commenced an examination of the document she had placed in his hands glancing from it to the face of the petitioner whose tears had broken forth afresh he studied its expression for a moment and then his eye fell upon her scanty but neat dress instantly his face lighted up my poor girl said he you have come here with no governor or senator or member of congress to plead your cause you seem honest and truthful and you don't wear hoop skirts and i will be whipped but i will pardon your brother and he did lieutenant tad lincoln's sentinels president lincoln's favorite son tad having been sportively commissioned a lieutenant in the united states army by secretary stanton procured several muskets and drilled the men servants of the house in the manual of arms without attracting the attention of his father and one night to his consternation he put them all on duty and relieved the regular sentries who seeing the lad in full uniform or perhaps appreciating the joke gladly went to their quarters his brother objected but tad insisted upon his rights as an officer the president laughed but declined to interfere but when the lad had lost his little authority in his boyish sleep the commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states went down and personally discharged the sentries his son had put on the post douglas held lincoln's hat when mr lincoln delivered his first inaugural he was introduced by his friend united states senator e d baker of oregon he carried a cane and a little roll the manuscript of his inaugural address there was moment's pause after the introduction as he vainly looked for a spot where he might place his high silk hat 
stephen a douglas the political antagonist of his whole public life the man who had pressed him hardest in the campaign of eighteen sixty was seated just behind him douglas stepped forward quickly and took the hat which mr lincoln held helplessly in his hand if i can't be president douglas whispered smilingly to mrs brown a cousin of mrs lincoln and a member of the president's party i at least can hold his hat the dead man spoke mr lincoln once said in a speech fellow citizens my friend mr douglas made the startling announcement today that the whigs are all dead if that be so fellow citizens you will now experience the novelty of hearing a speech from a dead man and i suppose you might properly say in the language of the old hymn hark from the tombs a doleful sound military snails not speedy president lincoln as he himself put it in conversation one day with a friend fairly ached for his generals to get down to business these slow generals he termed snails grant sherman and sheridan were his favorites for they were aggressive they did not wait for the enemy to attack too many of the others were lingerers as lincoln called them they were magnificent in defense and stubborn and brave but their names figure too much on the waiting list the greatest fault lincoln found with so many of the commanders on the union side was their unwillingness to move until everything was exactly to their liking lincoln could not understand why these leaders of northern armies hesitated outran the jackrabbit when the union forces were routed in the first battle of bull run there were many civilians present who had gone out from washington to witness the battle among the number were several congressmen one of these was a tall long-legged fellow who wore a long-tailed coat and a high plug hat when the retreat began this congressman was in the lead of the entire crowd fleeing toward washington he outran all the rest and was the first man to arrive in the city no person ever made such good use of long legs as this congressman his immense stride carried him yards at every bound he went over ditches and gullies at a single leap and cleared a six-foot fence with a foot to spare as he went over the fence his plug hat blew off but he did not pause with his long coat-tails flying in the wind he continued straight ahead for washington many of those behind him were scared almost to death but the flying congressman was such a comical figure that they had to laugh in spite of their terror mr lincoln enjoyed the description of how this congressman led the race from bull's run and laughed at it heartily i never knew but one fellow who could run like that he said and he was a young man out in illinois he had been sparking a girl much against the wishes of her father in fact the old man took such a dislike to him that he threatened to shoot him if he ever caught him around his premises again one evening the young man learned that the girl's father had gone to the city and he ventured out to the house he was sitting in the parlor with his arm around betsy's waist when he suddenly spied the old man coming round the corner of the house with a shotgun leaping through a window into the garden he started down a path at the top of his speed he was a long-legged fellow and could run like greased lightning just then a jackrabbit jumped up in the path in front of him in about two leaps he overtook the rabbit giving it a kick that sent it high in the air he exclaimed get out of the road gosh darn you and let somebody run that knows how i reckon said mr lincoln that the long-legged congressman when he saw the rebel muskets must have felt a good deal like that young fellow did when he saw the old man's shotgun fooling the people lincoln was a strong believer in the virtue of dealing honestly with the people if you once forfeit the confidence of your fellow citizens he said to a caller at the white house you can never regain their respect and esteem it is true that you may fool all the people some of the time you can even fool some of the people all the time but you can't fool all of the people all the time abe you can't play that on me the night president-elect lincoln arrived at washington one man was observed watching lincoln very closely as he walked out of the railroad station standing a little to one side the man looked very sharply at lincoln and as the latter passed seized hold of his hand and said in a loud tone of voice 
abe you can't lay that on me lord layman and the others with lincoln were instantly alarmed and would have struck the stranger had not lincoln hastily said don't strike him it is washburn don't you know him mr seward had given congressman washburn a hint of the time the train would arrive and he had the right to be at the station when the train steamed in but his indiscreet manner of loudly addressing the president-elect might have led to serious consequences to the latter his broad stories mrs rose lender wilkinson who often accompanied her father judge linder in the days when he rode circuit with mr lincoln tells the following story at night as a rule the lawyers spent a while in the parlor and permitted the women who happened to be along to sit with them but after half an hour or so we would notice it was time for us to leave them i remember traveling the circuit one season when the young wife of one of the lawyers was with him the place was so crowded that she and i were made to sleep together when the time came for banishing us from the parlor we went up to our room and sat there till bedtime listening to the roars that followed each other swiftly while those lawyers downstairs told stories and laughed till the rafters rang in the morning mr lincoln said to me rose did we disturb your sleep last night i answered no i had no sleep which was not entirely true but the retort amused him then the young lawyer's wife complained to him that we were not fairly used we came along with them young women and when they were having the best time we were sent away like children to go to bed in the dark but madam said mr lincoln you would not enjoy the things we laugh at and then he entered into a discussion of what have been termed his broad stories he deplored the fact that men seemed to remember them longer and with less effort than any others my father said but lincoln i don't remember the broad part of your story so much as i do the moral that is in them and it was a thing in which they were all agreed sorry for the horses when president lincoln heard of the confederate raid at fairfax in which a brigadier general and a number of valuable horses were captured he gravely observed well i am sorry for the horses sorry for the horses mr president exclaimed the secretary of war raising his spectacles and throwing himself back in his chair in astonishment yes replied mr lincoln i can make brigadier general in five minutes but it is not easy to replace a hundred and ten horses mild rebuke to a doctor dr jerome walker of brooklyn told how mr lincoln once administered to him a mild rebuke the doctor was showing mr lincoln through the hospital at city point finally after visiting the wards occupied by our invalid and convalescing soldiers said dr walker we came to three wards occupied by sick and wounded southern prisoners with a feeling of patriotic duty i said mr president you won't want to go in there they are only rebels i will never forget how he stopped and gently laid his large hand upon my shoulder and quietly answered you mean confederates and i have met confederates ever since there was nothing left for me to do after the president's remark but to go with him through these three wards and i could not see but that he was just as kind his handshakings just as hearty his interest just as real for the welfare of the men as when he was among our own soldiers cold molasses was swifter old pap as the soldiers called general george h thomas was aggravatingly slow at a time when the president wanted him to get a move on in fact the gallant rock of chickamauga was evidently entered in a snail race some of my generals are so slow regretfully remarked lincoln one day that molasses in the coldest days of winter is a racehorse compared to them they're brave enough but somehow or other they get fastened in a fence corner and can't figure their way out lincoln calls medell a coward joseph medell for many years editor of the chicago tribune not long before his death told the following story regarding the talking to president lincoln gave himself and two other chicago gentlemen who went to washington to see about reducing chicago's quota of troops after the call for extra men was made by the president in eighteen sixty four 
in eighteen sixty four when the call for extra troops came chicago revolted she had already sent twenty two thousand troops up to that time and was drained when the call came there were no young men to go and no aliens except what were bought the citizens held a mass meeting and appointed three persons of whom i was one to go to washington and ask stanton to give cook county a new enrollment on reaching washington we went to stanton with our statement he refused entirely to give us the desired aid then we went to lincoln i cannot do it he said but i will go with you to the war department and stanton and i will hear both sides so we all went over to the war department together stanton and general fry were there and they of course contended that the quota should not be changed the argument went on for some time and was finally referred to lincoln who had been sitting silently listening i shall never forget how he suddenly lifted his head and turned on us a black and frowning face gentlemen he said in a voice full of bitterness after boston chicago has been the chief instrument in bringing war on this country the northwest has opposed the south as new england has opposed the south it is you who are largely responsible for making blood flow as it has you called for war until we had it you called for emancipation and i have given it to you whatever you have asked you have had now you come here begging to be let off from the call for men which i have made to carry out the war which you demanded you ought to be ashamed of yourselves i have a right to expect better things of you go home and raise your six thousand extra men and you medal you are acting like a coward you and your tribune have had more influence than any paper in the northwest in making this war you can influence great masses and yet you cry to be spared at a moment when your cause is suffering go home and send us those men i couldn't say anything it was the first time i ever was whipped and i didn't have an answer we all got up and went out and when the door closed one of my colleagues said well gentlemen the old man is right we ought to be ashamed of ourselves let us never say anything about this but go home and raise the men and we did six thousand men making twenty eight thousand in the war from a city of one hundred and fifty six thousand but there might have been crape on every door almost in chicago for every family had lost a son or a husband i lost two brothers it was hard for the mothers they didn't build it in eighteen sixty two a delegation of new york millionaires waited upon president lincoln to request that he furnish a gunboat for the protection of new york harbor mr lincoln after listening patiently said gentlemen the credit of the government is at a very low ebb greenbacks are not worth more than forty or fifty cents on the dollar it is impossible for me in the present condition of things to furnish you a gunboat and in this condition of things if i was worth half as much as you gentlemen are represented to be and as badly frightened as you seem to be i would build a gunboat and give it to the government End of part eight. part nine of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part nine stanton's abuse of lincoln president lincoln's sense of duty to the country together with his keen judgment of men often led to the appointment of persons unfriendly to him some of these appointees were as well not loyal to the national government for that matter regarding secretary of war stanton's attitude toward lincoln colonel a k mcclure who was very close to president lincoln said after stanton's retirement from the buchanan cabinet when lincoln was inaugurated he maintained the closest confidential relations with buchanan and wrote him many letters expressing the utmost contempt for lincoln the cabinet the republican congress and the general policy of the administration these letters speak freely of the painful imbecility of lincoln and of the venality and corruption which ran riot in the government and expressed the belief that no better condition of things was possible until jeff davis turns out the whole concern 
he was firmly impressed for some weeks after the battle of bull run that the government was utterly overthrown as he repeatedly refers to the coming of davis into the national capital in one letter he says that in less than thirty days davis will be in possession of washington and it is an open secret that stanton advised the revolutionary overthrow of the lincoln government to be replaced by general mcclellan as military dictator these letters bad as they are are not the worst letters written by stanton to buchanan some of them were so violent in their expressions against lincoln and the administration that they have been charitably withheld from the public but they remain in the possession of the surviving relatives of president buchanan of course lincoln had no knowledge of the bitterness exhibited by stanton to himself personally and to his administration but if he had known the worst that stanton ever said or wrote about him i doubt not that he would have called him to the cabinet in january eighteen sixty two the disasters the army suffered made lincoln forgetful of everything but the single duty of suppressing the rebellion lincoln was not long in discovering that in his new secretary of war he had an invaluable but most troublesome cabinet officer but he saw only the great and good offices that stanton was performing for the imperiled republic confidence was restored in financial circles by the appointment of stanton and his name as war minister did more to strengthen the faith of the people in the government credit than would have been probable from the appointment of any other man of that day he was a terror to all the hordes of jobbers and speculators and camp followers whose appetites had been whetted by a great war and he enforced the strictest discipline throughout our armies he was seldom capable of being civil to any officer away from the army on leave of absence unless he had been summoned by the government for conference or special duty and he issued the strictest orders from time to time to drive the throng of military idlers from the capital and keep them at their posts he was stern to savagery in his enforcement of military law the wearied sentinel who slept at his post found no mercy in the heart of stanton and many times did lincoln's humanity overrule his fiery minister any neglect of military duty was sure of the swiftest punishment and seldom did he make even just allowance for inevitable military disaster he had profound unfaltering faith in the union cause and above all he had unfaltering faith in himself he believed that he was in all things except in name commander-in-chief of the armies and the navy of the nation and it was with unconcealed reluctance that he at times deferred to the authority of the president the negro and the crocodile in one of his political speeches judge douglas made use of the following figure of speech as between the crocodile and the negro i take the side of the negro but as between the negro and the white man i would go for the white man every time lincoln at home noted that and afterwards when he had occasion to refer to the remark he said i believe that this is a sort of proposition in proportion which may be stated thus as the negro is to the white man so is the crocodile to the negro and as the negro may rightfully treat the crocodile as a beast or reptile so the white man may rightfully treat the negro as a beast or reptile lincoln was ready to fight on one occasion colonel baker was speaking in a courthouse which had been a storehouse and on making some remarks that were offensive to certain political rowdies in the crowd they cried take him off the stand immediate confusion followed and there was an attempt to carry the demand into execution directly over the speaker's head was an old skylight at which it appeared mr lincoln had been listening to the speech in an instant mr lincoln's feet came through the skylight followed by his tall and sinewy frame and he was standing by colonel baker's side he raised his hand and the assembly subsided into silence gentlemen said mr lincoln let us not disgrace the age and country in which we live this is a land where freedom of speech is guaranteed mr baker has a right to speak and ought to be permitted to do so i am here to protect him and no man shall take him from this stand if i can prevent it 
the suddenness of his appearance his perfect calmness and fairness and the knowledge that he would do what he had promised to do quieted all disturbance and the speaker concluded his remarks without difficulty it was uphill work two young men called on the president from springfield illinois lincoln shook hands with them and asked about the crops the weather etc finally one of the young men said mother is not well and she sent me up to inquire of you how the suit about the wells property is getting on lincoln in the same even tone with which he had asked the question said give my best wishes and respects to your mother and tell her i have so many outside matters to attend to now that i have put that case and others in the hands of a lawyer friend of mine and if you will call on him giving name and address he will give you the information you want after they had gone a friend who was present said mr lincoln you did not seem to know the young men he laughed and replied no i'd never seen them before and i had to beat around the bush until i found who they were it was uphill work but i topped it at last lee's slim animal president lincoln wrote to general hooker on june five eighteen sixty three warning hooker not to run any risk of being entangled on the rappahannock like an ox jumped half over a fence and liable to be torn by dogs front and rear without a fair chance to give one way or kick the other on the tenth he warned hooker not to go south of the rappahannock upon lee's moving north of it i think lee's army and not richmond is your true objective power if he comes toward the upper potomac follow on his flank and on the inside track shortening your lines while he lengthens his fight him too when opportunity offers if he stay where he is fret him and fret him on the fourteenth again he says so far as we can make out here the enemy have milroy surrounded at winchester and tyler at martinburg if they could hold out for a few days could you help them if the head of lee's army is at martinsburg and the tail of it on the flank road between fredericksburg and chancellorsville the animal must be very slim somewhere could you not break him mrs north and her attorney in the issue of london punch of september twenty fourth eighteen sixty four president lincoln is pictured as sitting at a table in his law office while in a chair to his right is a client mrs north the latter is a fine client for any attorney to have on his list being wealthy and liberal but as the lady is giving her counsel who has represented her in a legal way for four years notice that she proposes to put her legal business in the hands of another lawyer the dejected look upon the face of attorney lincoln is easily accounted for punch puts these words in the lady's mouth mrs north you see mr lincoln we have failed utterly in our course of action i want peace and so if you cannot effect an amicable arrangement i must put the case into other hands in this cartoon punch merely reflected the idea or sentiment current in england in eighteen sixty four that the north was much dissatisfied with the war policy of president lincoln and would surely elect general mcclellan to succeed the westerner in the white house at the election mcclellan carried but one northern state new jersey where he was born president lincoln sweeping the country like a prairie fire punch had evidently been deceived by some bold bad man who wanted a little spending money and sold the prediction to the funny journal with a certificate of character attached written by possibly a member of the horse marines punch was very much disgusted to find that its credulity and faith in mankind had been so imposed upon especially when the election returns showed that the war is a failure candidate ran so slowly that lincoln passed him as easily as though the democratic nominee was tied to a post satisfaction to the soul in the faraway days when abe went to school in indiana they had exercises exhibitions and speaking meetings in the schoolhouse or the church and abe was the star his father was a democrat and at that time abe agreed with his parent 
he would frequently make political and other speeches to the boys and explain tangled questions boonville was the county seat of warwick county situated about fifteen miles from gentryville thither abe walked to be present at the sittings of the court and listened attentively to the trials and the speeches of the lawyers one of the trials was that of a murderer he was defended by mr john breckinridge and at the conclusion of his speech abe was so enthusiastic that he ventured to compliment him breckinridge looked at the shabby boy thanked him and passed on his way many years afterwards in eighteen sixty two breckinridge called on the president and he was told it was the best speech that i up to that time had ever heard if i could as i then thought make as good a speech as that my soul would be satisfied withdrew the colt mr alcott of elgin illinois tells of seeing mr lincoln coming away from church unusually early one sunday morning the sermon could not have been more than halfway through says mr alcott tad was slung across his left arm like a pair of saddlebags and mr lincoln was striding along with long deliberate steps toward his home on one of the street corners he encountered a group of his fellow townsmen mr lincoln anticipated the question which was about to be put by the group and taking his figure of speech from practices with which they were only too familiar said gentlemen i entered this colt but he kicked around so i had to withdraw him tad got his dollar no matter who was with the president or how intently absorbed his little son tad was always welcome he almost always accompanied his father once on the way to fortress monroe he became very troublesome the president was much engaged in conversation with the party who accompanied him and he at length said tad if you will be a good boy and not disturb me any more until we get to fortress monroe i will give you a dollar the hope of reward was effectual for a while in securing silence but boy-like tad soon forgot his promise and was as noisy as ever upon reaching their destination however he said very promptly father i want my dollar mr lincoln looked at him half reproachfully for an instant and then taking from his pocket-book a dollar note he said well my son at any rate i will keep my part of the bargain tells an editor about nasby henry j raymond the famous new york editor thus tells of mr lincoln's fondness for the nasby letters it has been well said by a profound critic of shakespeare and it occurs to me as very appropriate in this connection that the spirit which held the woe of lear and the tragedy of hamlet would have broken had it not also had the humour of the merry wives of windsor and the merriment of the midsummer night's dream this is as true of mr lincoln as it was of shakespeare the capacity to tell and enjoy a good anecdote no doubt prolonged his life the saturday evening before he left washington to go to the front just previous to the capture of richmond i was with him from seven o'clock till nearly twelve it had been one of his most trying days the pressure of office seekers was greater at this juncture than i ever knew it to be and he was almost worn out among the callers that evening was a party composed of two senators a representative an ex-lieutenant governor of a western state and several private citizens they had business of great importance involving the necessity of the president's examination of voluminous documents pushing everything aside he said to one of the party have you seen the nasby papers no i have not was the reply who is nasby there is a chap out in ohio returned the president who has been writing a series of letters in the newspapers over the signature of petroleum v nasby some one sent me a pamphlet collection of them the other day i'm going to write to petroleum to come down here and i intend to tell him if he will communicate his talent to me i will swap places with him thereupon he arose went to a drawer in his desk and taking out the letters sat down and read one to the company finding in their enjoyment of it the temporary excitement and relief which another man would have found in a glass of wine the instant he had ceased the book was thrown aside 
his countenance relapsed into its habitual serious expression and the business was entered upon with the utmost earnestness long and short of it on the occasion of a serenade the president was called for by the crowd assembled he appeared at a window with his wife who was somewhat below the medium height and made the following brief remarks here i am and here is mrs lincoln that's the long and short of it more pegs than holes some gentlemen were once finding fault with the president because certain generals were not given commands the fact is replied president lincoln i have got more pegs than i have holes to put them in webster couldn't have done more lincoln got even with the illinois central railroad company in 1855 in a most substantial way at the same time secured sweet revenge for an insult unwarranted in every way put upon him by one of the officials of that corporation lincoln and herndon defended the illinois central railroad in an action brought by mclean county illinois in august 1853 to recover taxes alleged to be due the county from the road the legislature had granted the road immunity from taxation and this was a case intended to test the constitutionality of the law the road sent a retainer fee of two hundred and fifty dollars in the lower court the case was decided in favor of the railroad an appeal to the supreme court followed was argued twice and finally decided in favor of the road this last decision was rendered some time in 1855. Lincoln then went to Chicago and presented the bill for legal services. Lincoln and Herndon only asked for $2,000 more. The official to whom he was referred, after looking at the bill, expressed great surprise. Why, sir, he exclaimed, this is as much as Daniel Webster himself would have charged. We cannot allow such a claim. Why not? asked Lincoln we could have hired first-class lawyers at that figure was the response we won the case didn't we queried lincoln certainly replied the official daniel webster then retorted lincoln in no amiable tone couldn't have done more and abe walked out of the official's office lincoln withdrew the bill and started for home on the way he stopped at bloomington where he met grant goodrich archibald williams norman b judd o h browning and other attorneys who on learning of his modest charge for the valuable service rendered the railroad induced him to increase the demand to five thousand dollars and bring suit for that sum this was done at once on the trial six lawyers certified that the bill was reasonable and judgment for that sum went by default the judgment was promptly paid and of course his partner herndon got your half billy without delay lincoln met clay when a member of congress lincoln went to lexington kentucky to hear henry clay speak the westerner a kentuckian by birth and destined to reach the great goal clay had so often sought wanted to meet the mill boy of the slashes the address was a tame affair as was the personal greeting when lincoln made himself known clay was courteous but cold he may never have heard of the man then in his presence who was to secure without solicitation the prize which he for many years had unsuccessfully sought lincoln was disenchanted his ideal was shattered one reason why clay had not realized his ambition had become apparent clay was cool and dignified lincoln was cordial and hearty clay's hand was bloodless and frosty with no vigorous grip in it lincoln's was warm and its clasp was expressive of kindliness and sympathy reminded abe of a little joke president lincoln had a little joke at the expense of general george b mcclellan the democratic candidate for the presidency in opposition to the westerner in 1864 McClellan was nominated by the Democratic National Convention, which assembled at Chicago, but after he had been named, and also during the campaign, the military candidate was characteristic slow in coming to the front. 
president lincoln had his eye upon every move made by general mcclellan during the campaign and when reference was made one day in his presence to the deliberation and caution of the new jerseyite mr lincoln remarked with a twinkle in his eye perhaps he is entrenching the cartoon we reproduce appeared in harper's weekly september seventeenth eighteen sixty four and shows general mcclellan with his little spade in hand being subjected to the scrutiny of the president the man who gave mcclellan when the latter was commander-in-chief of the union forces every opportunity in the world to distinguish himself there is a smile on the face of honest abe which shows conclusively that he does not regard his political opponent as likely to prove formidable in any way president lincoln sized up mcclellan in eighteen sixty one and two and knew to a fraction how much of a man he was and what he could do and how he went about doing it mcclellan was no politician while the president was the shrewdest of political diplomats his dignity saved him when washington had become an armed camp and full of soldiers president lincoln and his cabinet officers drove daily to one or another of these camps very often his outing for the day was attending some ceremony incident to camp life a military funeral a camp wedding a review a flag raising he did not often make speeches i have made a great many poor speeches he said one day in excusing himself and i now feel relieved that my dignity does not permit me to be a public speaker the man he was looking for judge kelly of pennsylvania who was one of the committee to advise lincoln of his nomination and who was himself a great many feet high had been eyeing lincoln's lofty form with a mixture of admiration and possibly jealousy this had not escaped lincoln and as he shook hands with the judge he inquired what is your height six feet three what is yours mr lincoln six feet four then said the judge pennsylvania bows to illinois my dear man for years my heart has been aching for a president that i could look up to and i've at last found him end of part nine Part 10 of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 10. His Cabinet Chances Poor. Mr. Jeriah Bonham, in describing a visit he paid Lincoln at his room in the State House at Springfield, where he found him quite alone, except that two of his children, one of whom was Tad, were with him. The door was open we walked in and were at once recognized and seated the two boys still continuing their play about the room tad was spinning his top and lincoln as we entered had just finished adjusting the string for him so as to give the top the greatest degree of force he remarked that he was having a little fun with the boys at another time at lincoln's residence tad came into the room and putting his hand to his mouth and his mouth to his father's ear said in a boy's whisper ma says come to supper all heard the announcement and lincoln perceiving this said you have heard gentlemen the announcement concerning the interesting state of things in the dining room it will never do for me if elected to make this young man a member of my cabinet for it is plain he cannot be trusted with secrets of state the general was headed in a union general operating with his command in west virginia allowed himself and his men to be trapped and it was feared his force would be captured by the confederates the president heard the report read by the operator as it came over the wire and remarked once there was a man out west who was heading a barrel as they used to call it he worked like a good fellow in driving down the hoops but just about the time he thought he had the job done the head would fall in then he had to do the work all over again all at once a bright idea entered his brain and he wondered how it was he hadn't figured it out before his boy a bright smart lad was standing by very much interested in the business and lifting the young one up he put him inside the barrel telling him to hold the head in its proper place while he pounded down the hoops on the sides 
this worked like a charm and he soon had the heading done then he realized that his boy was inside the barrel and how to get him out he couldn't for his life figure out general blank is now inside the barrel headed in and the job now is to get him out sugar-coated government printer de Fries, when one of the president's messages was being printed was a good deal disturbed by the use of the term sugar-coated and finally went to mr lincoln about it their relations to each other being of the most intimate character he told the president frankly that he ought to remember that a message to congress was a different affair from a speech at a mass meeting in illinois that the messages became a part of history and should be written accordingly what is the matter now inquired the president why said de Fries, you have used an undignified expression in the message and reading the paragraph aloud he added i would alter the structure of that if i were you de Fries, replied the president that word expresses exactly my idea and i am not going to change it the time will never come in this country when people don't know exactly what sugar-coated means could make rabbit tracks when a grocery clerk at new salem the annual election came around a mr graham was clerk but his assistant was absent and it was necessary to find a man to fill his place lincoln a tall young man had already concentrated on himself the attention of the people of the town and graham easily discovered him asking him if he could write abe modestly replied i can make a few rabbit tracks his rabbit tracks proved to be legible and even graceful he was employed the voters soon discovered that the new assistant clerk was honest and fair and performed his duties satisfactorily and when the work done he began to entertain them with stories they found that their town had made a valuable personal and social acquisition lincoln protected currency issues marshal ward layman was in president lincoln's office in the white house one day and casually asked the president if he knew how the currency of the country was made greenbacks were then under full headway of circulation these bits of paper being the representatives of united states money our currency was the president's answer is made as the lawyers would put it in their legal way in the following manner to wit the official engraver strikes off the sheets passes them over to the register of the currency who after placing his earmarks upon them signs the same the register turns them over to old father spinner who proceeds to embellish them with his wonderful signature at the bottom father spinner sends them to secretary of the treasury chase and he as a final act in the matter issues them to the public as money and may the good lord help any fellow that doesn't take all he can honestly get of them taking from his pocket a five dollar greenback with a twinkle in his eye the president then said look at spinner's signature was there ever anything like it on earth yet it is unmistakable no one will ever be able to counterfeit it layman then goes on to say but i said you certainly don't suppose that spinner actually wrote his name on that bill do you certainly i do why not queried mr lincoln i then asked how much of this currency have we afloat he remained thoughtful for a moment and then stated the amount i continued how many times do you think a man can write a signature like spinner's in the course of twenty-four hours the beam of hilarity left the countenance of the president at once he put the greenback into his vest pocket and walked the floor after a while he stopped heaved a long sigh and said this thing frightens me he then rang for a messenger and told him to ask the secretary of the treasury to please come over to see him mr chase soon put in an appearance president lincoln stated the cause of his alarm and asked mr chase to explain in detail the operations methods system of checks etc in his office and a lengthy discussion followed president lincoln contending there were not sufficient safeguards afforded in any degree in the money-making department and secretary chase insisting that every protection was afforded he could devise afterward the president called the attention of congress to this important question 
and devices were adopted whereby a check was put upon the issue of greenbacks that no spurious ones ever came out of the treasury department at least counterfeiters were busy though but this was not the fault of the treasury lincoln's apology to grant general grant is a copious worker and fighter president lincoln wrote to general burnside in july eighteen sixty three but a meagre writer or telegrapher grant never wrote a report until the battle was over president lincoln wrote a letter to general grant on july thirteenth eighteen sixty three which indicated the strength of the hold the successful fighter had upon the man in the white house it ran as follows i do not remember that you and i ever met personally i write this now as a grateful acknowledgment for the almost inestimable service you have done the country i write to say a word further when you first reached the vicinity of vicksburg i thought you should do what you finally did march the troops across the neck run the batteries with the transports and thus go below and i never had any faith except a general hope that you knew better than i that the yazoo pass expedition and the like could succeed when you got below and took port gibson grand gulf and vicinity i thought you should go down the river and join general banks and when you turned northward east of big black i feared it was a mistake i now wish to make the personal acknowledgment that you were right and i was wrong lincoln said by jing lincoln never used profanity except when he quoted it to illustrate a point in a story his favorite expression when he spoke with emphasis were by dear and by jing just preceding the civil war he sent ward layman on a ticklish mission to south carolina when the proposed trip was mentioned to secretary seward he opposed it saying mr president i fear you are sending layman to his grave i am afraid they will kill him in charleston where the people are excited and desperate we can't spare layman and we shall feel badly if anything happens to him mr lincoln said in reply i have known layman to be in many a close place and he has never been in one that he didn't get out of somehow by jing i'll risk him go ahead layman and god bless you if you can't bring back any good news bring a palmetto layman brought back a palmetto branch but no promise of peace it tickled the little woman lincoln had been in the telegraph office at springfield during the casting of the first and second ballots in the republican national convention at chicago and then left and went over to the office of the state journal where he was sitting conversing with friends while the third ballot was being taken in a few moments came across the wires the announcement of the result the superintendent of the telegraph company wrote on a scrap of paper mr lincoln you are nominated on the third ballot and a boy ran with the message to lincoln he looked at it in silence amid the shouts of those around him then rising and putting it in his pocket he said quietly there's a little woman down at our house would like to hear this i'll go down and tell her shall all fall together after lincoln had finished that celebrated speech in egypt as a section of southern illinois was formerly designated in the course of which he seized congressman ficklin by the coat collar and shook him fiercely he apologized in return ficklin said lincoln had nearly shaken the democracy out of him to this lincoln replied well, that reminds me of what paul said to agrippa which in language and substance was about this i would to god that such democracy as you folks here in egypt have were not only almost but altogether shaken out of not only you but all that heard me this day and that you would all join in assisting in shaking off the shackles of the bondman by all legitimate means so that this country may be made free as the good lord intended it said ficklin in rejoinder lincoln i remember of reading somewhere in the same book from which you get your agrippa story that paul whom you seem to desire to personate admonished all servants slaves to be obedient to them that are their masters according to the flesh in fear and trembling 
it would seem that neither our saviour nor paul saw the iniquity of slavery as you and your party do but you must not think that where you fail by argument to convince an old friend like myself and win him over to your heterodox abolition opinions you are justified in resorting to violence such as you practised on me to-day why i never had such a shaking up in the whole course of my life recollect that that good old book that you quote from somewhere says in effect this woe be unto him who goeth to egypt for help for he shall fall the holpen shall fall and they shall all fall together dead dog no cure lincoln's quarrel with shields was his last personal encounter in later years it became his duty to give an official reprimand to a young officer who had been court-martialed for a quarrel with one of his associates the reprimand is probably the gentlest on record quarrel not at all no man resolved to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention still less can he afford to take all the consequences including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control yield larger things to which you can show no more than equal right and yield lesser ones though clearly your own better give your path to a dog than be bitten by him in contesting for the right even killing the dog would not cure the bite thorough is a good word someone that came to the president with a story about a plot to accomplish some mischief in the government lincoln listened to what was a very superficial and ill-formed story and then said there is one thing that i have learned and that you have not it is only one word thorough then bringing his hand down on the table with a thump to emphasize his meaning he added thorough the cabinet was a setting being in washington one day the rev robert collier thought he'd take a look around in passing through the grounds surrounding the white house he cast a glance toward the presidential residence and was astonished to see three pairs of feet resting on the ledge of an open window in one of the apartments of the second story the divine paused for a moment calmly surveyed the unique spectacle and then resumed his walk toward the war department seeing a laborer at work not far from the executive mansion mr collier asked him what it all meant to whom did the feet belong and particularly the mammoth ones you old fool answered the workman that's the cabinet which is the settin and them thar big feet belongs to old abe a bullet through his hat a soldier tells the following story of an attempt upon the life of mr lincoln one night i was doing sentinel duty at the entrance to the soldier's home this was about the middle of august eighteen sixty four about eleven o'clock i heard a rifle shot in the direction of the city and shortly afterwards i heard approaching hoof-beats in two or three minutes a horse came dashing up i recognized the belated president the president was bareheaded the president simply thought that his horse had taken fright at the discharge of the firearms on going back to the place where the shot had been heard we found the president's hat it was a plain silk hat and upon examination we discovered a bullet hole through the crown the next day upon receiving the hat the president remarked that it was made by some foolish marksman and was not intended for him but added that he wished nothing said about the matter the president said philosophically i long ago made up my mind that if anybody wants to kill me he will do it besides in this case it seems to me the man who would succeed me would be just as objectionable to my enemies if i have any one dark night as he was going out with a friend he took along a heavy cane remarking good-naturedly mother uh, mrs lincoln hasn't got a notion into her head that i shall be assassinated and to please her i take a cane when i go over to the war department at night when i don't forget it no kind to get to heaven on two ladies from tennessee called at the white house one day and begged mr lincoln to release their husbands who were rebel prisoners at johnson's island 
one of the fair petitioners urged as a reason for the liberation of her husband that he was a very religious man and rang the changes on this pious plea madam said mr lincoln you say your husband is a religious man perhaps i am not a good judge of such matters but in my opinion the religion that makes men rebel and fight against their government is not the genuine article nor is the religion the right sort which reconciles them to the idea of eating their bread in the sweat of other men's faces it is not the kind to get to heaven on later however the order of release was made president lincoln remarking with impressive solemnity that he would expect the ladies to subdue the rebellious spirit of their husbands and to that end he thought it would be well to reform their religion true patriotism said he is better than the wrong kind of piety the only real peacemaker during the presidential campaign of eighteen sixty four much ill feeling was displayed by the opposition to president lincoln the democratic managers issued posters of large dimensions picturing the washington administration as one determined to rule or ruin the country while the only salvation for the united states was the election of mcclellan we reproduce one of these eighteen sixty four campaign posters on this page the title of which is the true issue or that's what's the matter the dominant idea or purpose of the cartoon poster was to demonstrate mcclellan's availability lincoln the abolitionist and davis the secessionist are pictured as bigots of the worst sort who were determined that peace should not be restored to the distracted country except upon the lines laid down by them mcclellan the patriotic peacemaker is shown as the man who believed in the preservation of the union above all things a man who had no fads nor vagaries this peacemaker mcclellan standing upon the war is a failure platform is portrayed as a military chieftain who would stand no nonsense who would compel mr lincoln and mr davis to cease their quarrelling who would order the soldiers on both sides to quit their bloodletting and send the combatants back to the farm workshop and counting-house and the man whose election would restore order out of chaos and make everything bright and lovely the apple woman's pass one day when president lincoln was receiving callers a buxom irish woman came into the office and standing before the president with her hands on her hips said mr lincoln can't i sell apples on the railroad president lincoln replied certainly madam you can sell all you wish but she said you must give me a pass or the soldiers will not let me president lincoln then wrote a few lines and gave them to her thank you sir god bless you she exclaimed as she departed joyfully split rails by the yard it was in the spring of eighteen thirty that abe lincoln wearing a jean jacket shrunken buckskin trousers a coonskin cap and driving an ox team became a citizen of illinois he was physically and mentally equipped for pioneer work his first desire was to obtain a new and decent suit of clothes but as he had no money he was glad to arrange with nancy miller to make him a pair of trousers he too split four hundred finch rails for each yard of cloth fourteen hundred rails in all abe got the clothes after a while it was three miles from his father's cabin to her woodlot where he made the forest ring with the sound of his axe abe had helped his father plough fifteen acres of land and split enough rails to fence it and he then helped to plough fifty acres for another settler the question of legs whenever people of lincoln's neighborhood engaged in dispute whenever a bet was to be decided when they differed on points of religion or politics when they wanted to get out of trouble or desired advice regarding anything on the earth below it or above it or under the sea they went to abe two fellows after a hot dispute lasting some hours over the problem as to how long a man's legs should be in proportion to the size of his body stamped into lincoln's office one day and put the question to him 
lincoln listened gravely to the arguments advanced by both contestants spent some time in reflecting upon the matter and then turning around in his chair and facing the disputants delivered his opinion with all the gravity of a judge sentencing a fellow being to death this question has been a source of controversy he said slowly and deliberately for untold ages and it is about time it should be definitely decided it has led to bloodshed in the past and there is no reason to suppose it will not lead to the same in the future after much thought and consideration not to mention mental worry and anxiety it is my opinion all side issues being swept aside that a man's lower limbs in order to preserve harmony of proportion should be at least long enough to reach from his body to the ground too many widows already a union officer in conversation one day told this story the first week i was with my command there were twenty-four deserters sentenced by court-martial to be shot and the warrants for their execution were sent to the president to be signed he refused i went to washington and had an interview i said mr president unless these men are made an example of the army itself is in danger mercy to the few is cruelty to the many he replied mr general there are already too many weeping widows in the united states for god's sake don't ask me to add to the number for i won't do it god needed that church in the early stages of the war after several battles had been fought union troops seized a church in alexandria virginia and used it as a hospital a prominent lady of the congregation went to Washington to see Mr. Lincoln and try to get an order for its release. "'Have you applied to the surgeon in charge at Alexandria?' inquired Mr. Lincoln. "'Yes, sir, but I can do nothing with him,' was the reply. "'Well, madam,' said Mr. Lincoln, "'that is an end of it, then. We put him there to attend to just such business, and it is reasonable to suppose that he knows better what should be done under the circumstances than I do. The lady's face showed her keen disappointment. In order to learn her sentiment, Mr. Lincoln asked, How much would you be willing to subscribe toward building a hospital there? She said that the war had depreciated Southern property so much that she could afford to give but little this war is not yet over said mr lincoln and there will likely be another fight very soon that church may be very useful in which to house our wounded soldiers it is my candid opinion that god needs that church for our wounded fellows so madam i can do nothing for you the man down south an amusing instance of the president's preoccupation of mind occurred at one of his levees when he was shaking hands with a host of visitors passing him in a continuous stream an intimate acquaintance received the usual conventional handshake and salutation but perceiving that he was not recognized kept his ground instead of moving on and spoke again when the president roused to a dim consciousness that something unusual had happened perceived who stood before him and seizing his friend's hand shook it again heartily saying how do you do how do you do excuse me for not noticing you i was thinking of a man down south the man down south was general w t sherman then on his march to the sea couldn't let go the hog when governor custer of pennsylvania described the terrible butchery at the battle of fredericksburg mr lincoln was almost broken-hearted the governor regretted that his description had so sadly affected the president he remarked i would give all i possess to know how to rescue you from this terrible war then mr lincoln's wonderful recuperative powers asserted themselves and this marvelous man was himself lincoln's whole aspect suddenly changed and he relieved his mind by telling a story this reminds me governor he said of an old farmer out in illinois that i used to know he took it into his head to go into hog raising he sent out to europe and imported the finest breed of hogs he could buy the prize hog was put in a pen and the farmer's two mischievous boys james and john were told to be sure not to let it out but james the worst of the two let the brute out the next day the hog went straight for the boys and drove john up a tree 
then the hog went for the seat of james trousers and the only way the boy could save himself was by holding on to the hog's tail the hog would not give up his hunt nor the boy his hold after they had made a good many circles around the tree the boy's courage began to give out and he shouted to his brother i say john come down quick and help me let go this hog now governor that is exactly my case i wish someone would come and help me to let the hog go the cabinet lincoln wanted judge joseph gillespie of chicago was a firm friend of mr lincoln and went to springfield to see him shortly before his departure for the inauguration it was said judge gillespie lincoln's gethsemane he feared he was not the man for the great position and the great events which confronted him untried in national affairs unversed in international diplomacy unacquainted with the men who were foremost in the politics of the nation he groaned when he saw the inevitable war of the rebellion coming on it was in humility of spirit that he told me he believed that the american people had made a mistake in selecting him in the course of our conversation he told me if he could select his cabinet from the old bar that had traveled the circuit with him in the early days he believed he could avoid war or settle it without a battle even after the fact of secession but mr lincoln said i those old lawyers are all democrats i know it was his reply but i would rather have democrats whom i know than republicans i don't know ready for butcher day leonard sweat told this eminently characteristic story i remember one day being in his room when lincoln was sitting at his table with a large pile of papers before him and after a pleasant talk he turned quite abruptly and said get out of the way sweat to-morrow is butcher day and i must go through these papers and see if i cannot find some excuse to let those poor fellows off the pile of papers he had were the records of courts martial of men who on the following day were to be shot the bad bird and the mud sill it took quite a long time as well as the lives of thousands of men to say nothing of the cost in money to take richmond the capital city of the confederacy in this cartoon taken from frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of february twenty one eighteen sixty three jeff davis is sitting upon the secession eggs in the richmond nest smiling down upon president lincoln who is up to his waist in the mud of difficulties the president finally waded through the morass in which he had become immersed got to the tree climbed its trunk reached the limb upon which the bad bird had built its nest threw the mother out destroyed the eggs of secession and then took the nest away with him leaving the bad bird without any home at all the bad bird had its laugh first and the last laugh belonged to the mud sill as the cartoonist was pleased to call the president of the united states it is true that the president got his clothes and hat all covered with mud but as the job was a dirty one as well as one that had to be done the president didn't care he was able to get another suit of clothes as well as another hat but the bad bird couldn't and didn't get another nest the laugh was on the bad bird after all gave the soldier his fish once when asked what he remembered about the war with great britain lincoln replied oh nothing but this i had been fishing one day and caught a little fish which i was taking home i met a soldier on the road and having been always told at home that we must be good to the soldiers i gave him my fish this must have been about eighteen fourteen when abe was five years of age a peculiar lawyer lincoln was once associate counsel for a defendant in a murder case he listened to the testimony given by witness after witness against his client until his honest heart could stand it no longer then turning to his associate he said the man is guilty you defend him i can't and when his associate secured a verdict of acquittal lincoln refused to share the fee to the extent of one cent lincoln would never advise clients to enter into unwise or unjust lawsuits always preferring to refuse a retrainer rather than be a party to a case which did not commend itself to his sense of justice
End of part 10part eleven of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part eleven if they'd only skip general creswell called at the white house to see the president the day of the latter's assassination an old friend serving in the confederate ranks had been captured by the union troops and sent to prison he had drawn an affidavit setting forth what he knew about the man, particularly mentioning extenuating circumstances. Creswell found the president very happy. He was greeted with, Creswell, old fellow, everything is bright this morning. The war is over. It has been a tough time, but we have lived it out, or some of us have. And he dropped his voice a little on the last clause of the sentence but it is over. We are going to have good times now and a united country. General Creswell told his story, read his affidavit, and said, I know the man has acted like a fool, but he is my friend and a good fellow. Let him out. Give him to me, and I will be responsible that he won't have anything more to do with the Rebs. Creswell, replied Mr. Lincoln, you make me think of a lot of young folks who once started out maying. To reach their destination, they had to cross a shallow stream, and did so by means of an old flatboat. When the time came to return, they found to their dismay that the old scow had disappeared. They were in sore trouble, and thought over all manner of devices for getting over the water, but without avail. After a time, one of the boys proposed that each fellow should pick up the girl he liked best, and weighed over with her. The masterly proposition was carried out, until all that were left upon the island was a little short chap and a great, long, gothic-built elderly lady. Now, Creswell, you are trying to leave me in the same predicament. You fellows are all getting your own friends out of this scrape, and you will succeed in carrying off one after another, until nobody but Jeff Davis and myself will be left on the island, and then I won't know what to do. How should I feel? How should I look, lugging him over? I guess the way to avoid such an embarrassing situation is to let them all out at once. He made a somewhat similar illustration at an informal cabinet meeting at which the disposition of Jefferson Davis and other prominent Confederates was discussed. Each member of the cabinet gave his opinion. Most of them were for hanging the traitors and for some severe punishment. President Lincoln said nothing. Finally, Joshua F. Speed, his old and confidential friend, who had been invited to the meeting, said, I have heard the opinion of your ministers, and would like to hear yours. Well, Josh, replied President Lincoln, when I was a boy in Indiana, I went to a neighbor's house one morning, and found a boy of my own size holding a coon by the string. I asked him what he had, and what he was doing. He said, It's a coon. Dad caught six last night, and killed all but this poor little cuss. Dad told me to hold him until he came back and I'm afraid he's going to kill this one, too. And, oh, Abe, I do wish he would get away. Well, why don't you let him loose? That wouldn't be right, and if I let him go, Dad would give me hell. But if he got away himself, it would be all right. Now, said the President, if Jeff Davis and those other fellows will only get away, it will be all right. But if we should catch them, and I should let them go dad would give me hell father of the greenback don piat a noted journalist of washington told the story of the first proposition to president lincoln to issue interest-bearing notes as currency as follows amasa walker a distinguished financier of new england suggested that notes issued directly from the government to the people as currency should bear interest this for the purpose not only of making the notes popular but for the purpose of preventing inflation by inducing people to hoard the notes as an investment when the demands of trade would fail to call them into circulation as a currency this idea struck david taylor of ohio with such force that he sought mr lincoln and urged him to put the project into immediate execution the president listened patiently and at the end said 
that is a good idea taylor but you must go to chase he is running that end of the machine and has time to consider your proposition taylor sought the secretary of the treasury and laid before him a mass of walker's plan secretary chase heard him through in a cold unpleasant manner and then said that is all very well mr taylor but there is one little obstacle in the way that makes the plan impractical and that is the constitution saying this he turned to his desk as if dismissing both mr taylor and his proposition at the same moment the poor enthusiast felt rebuked and humiliated he returned to the president however and reported his defeat mr lincoln looked at the would-be financier with the expression at times so peculiar to his homely face that left one in doubt whether he was jesting or in earnest taylor he exclaimed go back to chase and tell him not to bother himself about the constitution say that i have that sacred instrument here at the white house and i am guarding it with great care taylor demurred to this on the ground that secretary chase showed by his manner that he knew all about it and didn't wish to be bored by any suggestion we'll see about that said the president and taking a card from the table he wrote upon it the secretary of the treasury will please consider mr taylor's proposition we must have money and i think this is a good way to get it a lincoln major anderson's bad memory among the men whom captain lincoln met in the black hawk campaign were lieutenant colonel zachary taylor lieutenant jefferson davis president of the confederacy and lieutenant robert anderson all of the united states army judge arnold in his life of abraham lincoln relates that lincoln and anderson did not meet again until some time in eighteen sixty one after anderson had evacuated fort sumter on visiting washington he called at the white house to pay his respects to the president lincoln expressed his thanks to anderson for his conduct at fort sumter and then said major do you remember of ever meeting me before no mr president i have no recollection of ever having had that pleasure my memory is better than yours said lincoln you mustered me into the service of the united states in eighteen thirty two at dixon's ferry in the black hawk war no vanderbilt in february eighteen sixty not long before his nomination for the presidency lincoln made several speeches in eastern cities to an illinois acquaintance whom he met at the astor house in new york he said i have the cottage at springfield and about three thousand dollars in money if they make me vice president with seward as some say they will i hope i shall be able to increase it to twenty thousand and that is as much as any man ought to want squashed a brutal lie in september eighteen sixty four a new york paper printed the following brutal story a few days after the battle of antietam the president was driving over the field in an ambulance accompanied by marshal layman general mcclellan and other officers heavy details of men were engaged in the task of burying the dead the ambulance had just reached the neighborhood of the old stone bridge where the dead were piled highest when mr lincoln suddenly slapping marshal layman on the knee exclaimed come layman give us that song about picayune butler mcclellan has never heard it not now if you please said general mcclellan with a shudder i would prefer to hear it some other place and time president lincoln refused to pay any attention to the story would not read the comments made upon it by the newspapers and would permit neither denial nor explanation to be made the national election was coming on and the president's friends appealed to him to settle the matter from once and all marshal lehman was particularly insistent but the president merely said let the thing alone if i have not established character enough to give the lie to this charge i can only say that i am mistaken in my own estimate of myself in politics every man must skin his own skunk these fellows are welcome to the hide of this one its body has already given forth its unsavory odor but lehman would not let the thing alone he submitted to Lincoln a draft of what he conceived to be a suitable explanation, after reading which the president said, 
layman your uh, explanation is entirely too belligerent in tone for so grave a matter there is a heap of cussedness mixed up with your usual amiability and you are at times too fond of a fight if i were you i would simply state the facts as they were i would give the statement as you have here without the pepper and salt let me try my hand at it the president then took up a pen and wrote the following which was copied and sent out as marshal layman's refutation of the shameless slander the president has known me intimately for nearly twenty years and has often heard me sing little ditties the battle of antietam was fought on the seventeenth day of september eighteen sixty two on the first day of october just two weeks after the battle the president with some others including myself started from washington to visit the army reaching harper's ferry at noon of that day in a short while general mcclellan came from his headquarters near the battleground joined the president and with him reviewed the troops at bolivar heights that afternoon and at night returned to his headquarters leaving the president at harper's ferry on the morning of the second the president with general sumner reviewed the troops respectively at loudon heights and maryland heights and about noon started to general mcclellan's headquarters reaching there only in time to see very little before night on the morning of the third all started on a review of the third corps and the cavalry in the vicinity of the antietam battleground after getting through with general burnside's corps at the suggestion of general mcclellan he and the president left their horses to be led and went into an ambulance to go to general fitz john porter's corps which was two or three miles distant i am not sure whether the president and general mcclellan were in the same ambulance or in different ones but myself and some others were in the same with the president on the way and on no part of the battleground and on what suggestions i do not remember the president asked me to sing the little sad song that follows twenty years ago tom which he had often heard me sing and had always seemed to like very much after it was over some one of the party i do not think it was the president asked me to sing something else and i sang two or three little comic things of which picayune butler was one porter's corps was reached and reviewed then the battleground was passed over and the most noted parts examined then in succession the cavalry and franklin's corps were reviewed and the president and party returned to general mcclellan's headquarters at the end of a very hard hot and dusty day's work next day the fourth the president and general mcclellan visited such of the wounded as still remained in the vicinity including the now lamented general richardson then proceeded to and examined the south mountain battleground at which point they parted general mcclellan returning to his camp and the president returning to washington seeing on the way general hartsoff who lay wounded at fredericktown this is the whole story of the singing and its surroundings neither general mcclellan nor anyone else made any objection to the singing the place was not on the battlefield the time was sixteen days after the battle no dead body was seen during the whole time the president was absent from washington nor even a grave that had not been rained on since the time it was made one war at a time nothing in lincoln's entire career better illustrated the surprising resources of his mind than his manner of dealing with the trent affair the readiness and ability with which he met this perilous emergency in a field entirely new to his experience was worthy the most accomplished diplomat and statesman admirable also was his cool courage and self-reliance in following a course radically opposed to the prevailing sentiment throughout the country and in congress and contrary to the advice of his own cabinet secretary of the navy wells hastened to approve officially the act of captain wilkes in apprehending the confederate commissioners mason and slidell secretary stanton publicly applauded and even secretary of state seward whose long public career had made him especially conservative stated that he was opposed to any concession or surrender of mason and slidell but lincoln with great sagacity simply said 
one war at a time president lincoln's last public address the president made his last public address on the evening of april eleventh eighteen sixty five to a gathering at the white house said he we meet this evening not in sorrow but in gladness of heart the evacuation of petersburg and richmond and the surrender of the principal insurgent army give hope of a righteous and speedy peace whose joyous expression cannot be restrained in the midst of this however he from whom all blessings flow must not be forgotten nor must those whose harder part gives us the cause of rejoicing be overlooked their honors must not be parceled out with others i myself was near the front and had the high pleasure of transmitting the good news to you but no part of the honor for plan or execution is mine to general grant his skillful officers and brave men all belongs no others like them one day an old lady from the country called on president lincoln her tanned face peering up to his through a pair of spectacles her errand was to present mr lincoln a pair of stockings of her own make a yard long kind tears came to his eyes as she spoke to him and then holding the stockings one in each hand dangling wide apart for general inspection he assured her that he should take them with him to washington where and here his eyes twinkled he was sure he should not be able to find any like them quite a number of well-known men were in the room with the president when the old lady made her presentation among them was george s butwell who afterwards became secretary of the treasury the amusement of the company was not at all diminished by mr butwell's remark that the lady had evidently made a very correct estimate of mr lincoln's latitude and longitude cash was at hand lincoln was appointed postmaster at new salem by president jackson the office was given him because everybody liked him and because he was the only man willing to take it who could make out the returns lincoln was pleased because it gave him a chance to read every newspaper taken in the vicinity he had never been able to get half the newspapers he wanted before years after the post office had been discontinued and lincoln had become a practicing lawyer at springfield an agent of the post office department entered his office and inquired if abraham lincoln was within lincoln responded to his name and was informed that the agent had called to collect the balance due the department since the discontinuance of the new salem office a shade of perplexity passed over lincoln's face which did not escape the notice of friends present one of them said at once lincoln if you are in want of money let us help you he made no reply but suddenly rose and pulled out from a pile of books a little old trunk and returning to the table asked the agent how much the amount of his debt was the sum was named and then lincoln opened the trunk pulled out a little package of coin wrapped in a cotton rag and counted out the exact sum amounting to more than seventeen dollars after the agent had left the room he remarked quietly that he had never used any man's money but his own although this sum had been in his hands during all those years he had never regarded it as available even for any temporary use of his own welcomed the little girls at a saturday afternoon reception at the white house many persons noticed three little girls poorly dressed the children of some mechanic or laboring man who had followed the visitor into the white house to gratify their curiosity they passed around from room to room and were hastening through the reception room with some trepidation when the president called to them little girls are you going to pass me without shaking hands then he bent his tall awkward form down and shook each little girl warmly by the hand everybody in the apartment was spellbound by the incident so simple in itself don't swap horses uncle sam was pretty well satisfied with his horse old abe and as shown at the presidential election of eighteen sixty four made up his mind to keep him and not swap the tried and true animal for a strange one 
Harper's Weekly of November 12, 1864, had a cartoon which illustrated how the people of the United States felt about the matter better than anything published at the time. We reproduce it on this page. Beneath the picture was this text. John Bull, why don't you ride the other horse a bit? He's the best animal, pointing to McClellan in the bushes at the rear. Brother Jonathan, well, that may be, but the fact is, old Abe is just where I can put my finger on him. And as for the other, though they say he's some when out in the scrub yonder, I never know where to find him. Most Valuable Political Attribute one time, I remember I asked Mr. Lincoln what attribute he considered most valuable to the successful politician, said Captain T.W.S. Kidd of Springfield. He laid his hand on my shoulder and said very earnestly, to be able to raise a cause which shall produce an effect and then fight the effect. The more you think about it, the more profound does it become. Abe resented the insult. A cashiered officer, seeking to be restored through the power of the executive, became insolent because the president, who believed the man guilty, would not accede to his repeated requests. At last said, Well, Mr. President, I see you are fully determined not to do me justice. This was too aggravating even for Mr. Lincoln. Rising, he suddenly seized the disgraced officer by the coat collar and marched him forcibly to the door, saying as he ejected him into the passage, Sir, I give you fair warning never to show your face in this room again. I can bear censure, but not insult. I never wish to see your face again. One man isn't missed. Salmon P. Chase, when Secretary of the Treasury, had a disagreement with other members of the Cabinet and resigned. The President was urged not to accept it, as Secretary Chase is today a national necessity, his adviser said. How mistaken you are, Lincoln quietly observed. Yet it is not strange. I used to have similar notions. No, if we should all be turned out tomorrow and could come back here in a week, we should find our places filled by a lot of fellows doing just as well as we did, and in many instances, better. Now, this reminds me of what the Irishman said. His verdict was that in this country one man is as good as another, and for the matter of that, very often a great deal better. No, this government does not depend upon the life of any man. Stretched the Facts George B. Lincoln, a prominent merchant of Brooklyn, was traveling through the West in 1855-56 and found himself one night in a town on the Illinois River by the name of Naples. The only tavern of the place had evidently been constructed with reference to business on a small scale. Poor as the prospect seemed, Mr. Lincoln had no alternative but to put up at the place. The supper room was also used as a lodging room. Mr. Lincoln told his host that he thought he would go to bed. Bed, echoed the landlord. There is no bed for you in this house unless you sleep with that man yonder. He is the only one we have to spare. Well, returned Mr. Lincoln, the gentleman has possession and perhaps would not like a bedfellow. Upon this, a grisly head appeared out of the pillows and said, What is your name? They call me Lincoln at home, was the reply. Lincoln, repeated the stranger, any connection to our Illinois, Abraham? No, replied Mr. Lincoln, I fear not. Well, said the old gentleman, I will let any man by the name of Lincoln sleep with me just for the sake of the name. You have heard of Abe? he inquired. Oh, yes, very often, replied Mr. Lincoln. No man could travel far in this state without hearing of him, and I would be very glad to claim connection if I could do so honestly. Well, said the old gentleman, my name is Simmons. Abe and I used to live and work together when young men. Many a job of woodcutting and rail splitting have I done up with him. Abe Lincoln was the likeliest boy in God's world. He would work all day as hard as any of us and study by firelight in the log house half the night. And in this way he made himself a thorough practical surveyor. Once, during these days, I was in the upper part of the state, and I met General Ewing, whom President Jackson had sent to the Northwest to make surveys. 
i told him about abe lincoln what a student he was and that i wanted he should give him a job he looked over his memorandum and holding out a paper said there is county must be surveyed if your friend can do the work properly i shall be glad to have him undertake it the compensation will be six hundred dollars pleased as i could be i hastened to abe after i got home with an account of what i had secured for him he was sitting before the fire in the log cabin when i told him and what do you think was his answer when i finished he looked up very quietly and said mr simmons i thank you very sincerely for your kindness but i don't think i will undertake the job in the name of wonder said i why six hundred does not grow upon every bush out here in illinois i know that said abe and i need the money bad enough simmons as you know but i have never been under obligation to a democratic administration and i never intend to be so long as i can get my living another way general ewing must find another man to do his work a friend related this story to the president one day and asked him if it were true pollard simmons said lincoln well do i remember him it is correct about our working together but the old man must have stretched the facts somewhat about the survey of the county i think i should have been very glad of the job at the time no matter what administration was in power it lengthened the war president lincoln said long before the national political campaign of eighteen sixty four had opened if the unworthy ambition of politicians and the jealousy that exists in the army could be repressed and all unite in a common aim and a common endeavor the rebellion would soon be crushed his theory of the rebellion the president once explained to a friend the theory of the rebellion by the aid of the maps before him running his long forefinger down the map he stopped at virginia we must drive them away from here manassas gap he said and clear them out of this part of the state so that they cannot threaten us here washington and get into maryland we must keep up a good and thorough blockade of their ports we must march an army into east tennessee and liberate the union sentiment there finally we must rely on the people growing tired and saying to their leaders we have had enough of this thing we will bear it no longer such was president lincoln's plan for heading off the rebellion in the summer of eighteen sixty one how it enlarged as the war progressed from a call for seventy thousand volunteers to one for five hundred thousand men and five hundred million dollars is a matter of well-known history ran away when victorious three or four days after the battle of bull run some gentlemen who had been on the field called upon the president he inquired very minutely regarding all the circumstances of the affair and after listening with the utmost attention said with a touch of humor so it is your notion that we whipped the rebels and then ran away from them wanted stanton spanked old dennis hanks was sent to washington at one time by persons interested in securing the release from jail of several men accused of being copperheads it was thought old dennis might have some influence with the president the latter heard dennis's story and then said i will send for mr stanton it is his business secretary stanton came into the room stormed up and down said the men ought to be punished more than they were mr lincoln sat quietly in his chair and waited for the tempest to subside and then quietly said to stanton he would like to have the papers next day when he had gone dennis said abe if i was as big and as ugly as you are i would take him over my knee and spank him the president replied no a stanton is an able and valuable man for this nation and i am glad to bear his anger for the service he can give the nation stanton was out of town the quaint remark of the president to an applicant my dear sir i have not much influence with the administration was one of lincoln's little jokes 
Mr. Stanton, Secretary of War, once replied to an order from the President to give a colonel a commission in place of the resigning brigadier, I shan't do it, sir, I shan't do it, it isn't the way to do it, sir, and I shan't do it, I don't propose to argue the question with you, sir. A few days after, the friend of the applicant who had presented the order to Secretary Stanton called upon the President and related his reception. A look of vexation came over the face of the President, and he seemed unwilling to talk of it, and desired the friend to see him another day. He did so, and when he gave his visitor a positive order for the promotion, the latter told him he would not speak to Secretary Stanton again until he apologized. "'Oh,' said the President, "'Stanton has gone to Fortress Monroe, and Dana is acting. He will attend to it for you.' This he said with a manner of relief, as if it was a piece of good luck to find a man there who would obey his orders. The nomination was sent to the Senate and confirmed. End of Part 11「Twelve of Lincoln's Yarns and Stories by Alexander K. McClure. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 12. Identified the Colored Man. Many applications reached Lincoln as he passed to and from the White House and the War Department. One day, as he crossed the park, he was stopped by a Negro who told him a pitiful story. The President wrote him out a check which read, Pay to the colored man with one leg five dollars. Office Seekers Worse Than War When the Republican Party came into power, Washington swarmed with office seekers. They overran the White House and gave the President great annoyance. The incongruity of a man in his position, and with the very life of the country at stake, pausing to appoint postmasters, struck Mr. Lincoln forcibly. "'What is the matter, Mr. Lincoln?' said a friend one day, when he saw him looking particularly grave and dispirited. "'Has anything gone wrong at the front?' "'No,' said the President, with a tired smile. "'It isn't the war. It's the post office at Brownsville, Missouri.' He set him up. Immediately after Mr. Lincoln's nomination for President at the Chicago Convention, a committee of which Governor Morgan of New York was chairman, visited him in springfield illinois where he was officially informed of his nomination after this ceremony had passed mr lincoln remarked to the company that as a fit ending to an interview so important and interesting as that which had just taken place he supposed good manners would require that he should treat the committee with something to drink and opening the door that led into the rear he called out mary mary a girl responded to the call, to whom Mr. Lincoln spoke a few words in an undertone, and, closing the door, returned again and talked with his guests. In a few minutes, the maid entered, bearing a large waiter containing several glass tumblers and a large pitcher, and placed them upon the center table. Mr. Lincoln arose, and, gravely addressing the company, said, gentlemen we must pledge our mutual health in the most healthy beverage that god has given to man it is the only beverage i have ever used or allowed my family to use and i cannot conscientiously depart from it on the present occasion it is pure adam's ale from the spring and taking the tumbler he touched it to his lips and pledged them his highest respects in a cup of cold water of course, all his guests admired his consistency and joined in his example. Wasn't Stanton's say? A few days before the President's death, Secretary Stanton tendered his resignation as Secretary of War. He accompanied the act with a most heartfelt tribute to Mr. Lincoln's constant friendship and faithful devotion to the country, saying also that he as secretary had accepted the position to hold it only until the war should end and that now he felt his work was done and his duty was to resign mr lincoln was greatly moved by the secretary's words and tearing in pieces the paper containing the resignation and throwing his arms about the secretary he said stanton you have been a good friend and a faithful public servant and it is not for you to say when you will no longer be needed here. 
several friends of both parties were present on the occasion and there was not a dry eye that witnessed the scene jeffy threw up the sponge when the war was fairly on, many people were astonished to find that old Abe was a fighter from way back. No one was the victim of greater amazement than Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States of America. Davis found out that Abe was not only a hard hitter, but had staying qualities of a high order. It was a fight to a finish with Abe, no compromises being accepted over the title north and south the issue of frank leslie's illustrated newspaper of december twenty fourth eighteen sixty four contained the cartoon see reproduced on this page underneath the picture were the lines now jeffy when you think you have had enough of this say so and i'll leave off see president's message in his message to congress december sixth President Lincoln said, No attempt at negotiation with the insurgent leader could result in any good. He would accept of nothing short of the severance of the Union. Therefore, Father Abraham, getting Jeffy's head in chancery, proceeded to change the appearance and size of the secessionist's countenance, much to the grief and discomfort of the Southerner. It was Lincoln's idea to re-establish the Union, and he carried out his purpose to the very letter. But he didn't leave off until Jeffy cried enough. Didn't know Grant's preference. In October 1864, President Lincoln, while he knew his re-election to the White House, was in no sense doubtful, knew that if he lost New York and with it Pennsylvania on the home vote, the moral effect of his triumph would be broken, and his power to prosecute the war and make peace would be greatly impaired. Colonel A. K. McClure was with Lincoln a good deal of the time previous to the November election, and tells this story. His usually sad face was deeply shadowed with sorrow when I told him that I saw no reasonable prospect of carrying Pennsylvania on the home vote although we had about held our own in the hand-to-hand -hand conflict through which we were passing well what is to be done was lincoln's inquiry after the whole situation had been presented to him i answered that the solution of the problem was a very simple and easy one that grant was idle in front of petersburg that sheridan had won all possible victories in the valley and that if five thousand pennsylvania soldiers could be furloughed home from each army the election could be carried without doubt lincoln's face brightened instantly at the suggestion and i saw that he was quite ready to execute it i said to him of course you can trust want to make the suggestion to him to furlough five thousand pennsylvania troops for two weeks to my surprise lincoln made no answer and the bright face of a few moments before was instantly shadowed again i was much disconcerted and i suppose that grant was the one man to whom lincoln could turn with absolute confidence as his friend i then said with some earnestness surely mr president you can trust grant with a confidential suggestion to furlough pennsylvania troops lincoln remained silent and evidently distressed at the proposition i was pressing upon him after a few moments and speaking with emphasis i said it can't be possible that grant is not your friend he can't be such an ingrate lincoln hesitated for some time and then answered in these words well mcclure i have no reason to believe that grant prefers my election to that of mcclellan i believe lincoln was mistaken in his distrust of grant justice versus numbers lincoln was constantly bothered by members of delegations of goody goodies who knew all about running the war but had no inside information as to what was going on yet they poured out their advice in streams until the president was heartily sick of the whole business and wished the war would find some way to kill off these nuisances how many men have the confederates now in the field asked one of these boars one day about one million two hundred thousand replied the president oh my not so many as that surely mr lincoln 
they have fully twelve hundred thousand no doubt of it you see all of our generals when they get whipped say the enemy outnumbers them from three or five to one and i must believe them we have four hundred thousand men in the field and three times four makes twelve don't you see it it is as plain to be seen as the nose on a man's face and at the rate things are now going with the great amount of speculation and the small crop of fighting it will take a long time to overcome twelve hundred thousand rebels in arms if they can get subsistence they have everything else except a just cause yet it is said that thrice is he armed that hath his quarrel just i am willing however to risk our advantage of thrice in justice against their thrice in numbers no false pride in lincoln general mcclellan had little or no conception of the greatness of abraham lincoln as time went on he began to show plainly his contempt of the president frequently allowing him to wait in the anteroom of his house while he transacted business with others this discourtesy was so open that mcclellan's staff noticed it and newspaper correspondents commented on it the president was too keen not to see the situation but he was strong enough to ignore it it was a battle he wanted from mcclellan not deference i will hold mcclellan's horse if he will only bring us success he said one day extra member of the cabinet g h giddings was selected as the bearer of a message from the president to governor sam houston of texas a conflict had arisen there between the southern party and the governor sam houston and on march eighteen the latter had been deposed when mr lincoln heard of this he decided to try to get a message to the governor offering united states support if he would put himself at the head of the union party of the state mr giddings thus told of his interview with the president he said to me that the message was of such importance that before handing it to me he would read it to me before beginning to read he said this is a confidential and secret message no one besides my cabinet and myself knows anything about it and we are all sworn to secrecy i am going to swear you in as one of my cabinet and then he said to me in a jocular way hold out your right hand which i did now said he consider yourself a member of my cabinet how lincoln was abused with the possible exception of president washington whose political opponents did not hesitate to rob the vocabulary of vulgarity and wickedness whenever they desired to vilify the chief magistrate lincoln was the most and best abused man who ever held office in the united states during the first half of his initial term there was no epithet which was not applied to him one newspaper in new york habitually characterized him as that hideous baboon at the other end of the avenue and declared that barnum should buy and exhibit him as a zoological curiosity although the president did not to all appearances exhibit annoyance because of the various diatribes printed and spoken yet the fact is that his life was so cruelly embittered by these and other expressions quite as virulent that he often declared to those most intimate with him i would rather be dead than as president thus abused in the house of my friends how fighting joe was appointed general joe hooker the fourth commander of the noble but unfortunately army of the potomac was appointed to that position by president lincoln in january eighteen sixty three general scott for some reason disliked hooker and would not appoint him hooker after some months of discouraging waiting decided to return to california and called to pay his respects to president lincoln he was introduced as captain hooker and to the surprise of the president began the following speech mr president my friend makes a mistake i am not captain hooker but was once lieutenant colonel hooker of the regular army i was lately a farmer in california but since the rebellion broke out i have been trying to get into service but i find i am not wanted i am about to return home but before going i was anxious to pay my respects to you and express my wishes for your personal welfare and success in quelling this rebellion and i want to say to you a word more 
i was at bull run the other day mr president and it is no vanity in me to say i am a darn sight better general than you had on the field this was said not in the tone of a braggart but of a man who knew what he was talking about hooker did not return to california but in a few weeks captain hooker received from the president a commission as brigadier general hooker kept his courage up the president like old king saul when his term was about to expire was in a quandary concerning a further lease of the presidential office he consulted again the prophetess of georgetown immortalized by his patronage she retired to an inner chamber and after raising and consulting more than a dozen of distinguished spirits from hades she returned to the reception parlor where the chief magistrate awaited her and declared that general grant would capture richmond and that honest old abe would be next president she however as the report goes told him to beware of chase a fortune teller's prediction lincoln had been born and reared among people who were believers in premonitions and supernatural appearances all his life and he once declared to his friends that he was from boyhood superstitious he at one time said to judge arnold that the near approach of the important events of his life were indicated by a presentiment or a strange dream or in some other mysterious way it was impressed upon him that something important was to occur this was earlier than 1850. It is said that on his second visit to New Orleans, Lincoln and his companion, John Hanks, visited an old fortune teller, a voodoo negress. Tradition says that during the interview she became very much excited and after various predictions exclaimed, You will be president and all the Negroes will be free that the old voodoo negress should have foretold that the visitor would be president is not at all incredible she doubtless told this to many aspiring lads but lincoln so it is avowed took the prophecy seriously too much powder so great was lincoln's anxiety for the success of the union arms that he considered no labor on his part too arduous and spent much of his time in looking after even the small details admiral dahlgren was sent for one morning by the president who said well captain here's a letter about some new powder after reading the letter he showed the sample of powder and remarked that he had burned some of it and did not believe it was a good article here was too much residuum i will show you he said and getting a small piece of paper placed thereupon some of the powder then went to the fire and with the tongs picked up a coal which he blew clapped it on the powder and after the resulting explosion added you see there is too much left there sleep standing up mcclellan was a thorn in lincoln's side always up in the air as the president put it and yet he hesitated to remove him the young napoleon was a good organizer but no fighter lincoln sent him everything necessary in the way of men ammunition artillery and equipments but he was forever unready instead of making a forward movement at the time expected he would notify the president that he must have more men these were given him as rapidly as possible, and then would come a demand for more horses, more this and that, usually winding up with a demand for still more men. Lincoln bore it all in patience for a long time, but one day when he had received another request for more men, he made a vigorous protest. If I give McClellan all the men he asked for, said the president, they couldn't find room to lie down. They'd have to sleep standing up should have fought another battle general meade after the great victory at gettysburg was again face to face with general lee shortly afterwards at williamsport and even the former's warmest friends agree that he might have won in another battle but he took no action he was not a pushing man like grant it was this negligence on the part of meade that lost him the rank of lieutenant-general conferred upon general sheridan 
a friend of meade's speaking to president lincoln and intimating that meade should have after that battle been made commander-in-chief of the union armies received this reply from lincoln now don't misunderstand me about general meade i am profoundly grateful down to the bottom of my boots for what he did at gettysburg but i think that if i had been general meade i would have fought another battle lincoln upbraided layman in one of his reminiscences of lincoln ward layman tells how keenly the president-elect always regretted the sneaking in act when he made the celebrated midnight ride which he took under protest and landed him in washington known to but a few layman says the president was convinced that he committed a grave mistake in listening to the solicitations of a professional spy and of friends too easily alarmed and frequently upbraided me for having aided him to degrade himself at the very moment in all his life when his behavior should have exhibited the utmost dignity and composure neither he nor the country generally then understood the true facts concerning the dangers to his life it is now an acknowledged fact that there never was a moment from the day he crossed the maryland line up to the time of his assassination that he was not in danger of death by violence and that his life was spared until the night of the fourteenth of april eighteen sixty five only through the ceaseless and watchful care of the guards thrown around him marked out a few words President Lincoln was calm and unmoved when England and France were blustering and threatening war. At Lincoln's instance, Secretary of State Seward notified the English cabinet and the French emperor that, as ours was merely a family quarrel of a strictly private and confidential nature, there was no call for meddling. Also, that they would have a war on their hands in a very few minutes if they didn't keep their hands off many of seward's notes were couched in decidedly peppery terms some expressions being so tart that president lincoln ran his pen through them lincoln silences seward general farnsworth told the writer nearly twenty years ago that being in the war office one day secretary stanton told him that at the last cabinet meeting he had learned a lesson he should never forget and thought he had obtained an insight into mr lincoln's wonderful power over the masses the secretary said a cabinet meeting was called to consider our relations with england in regard to the mason slidell affair one after another of the cabinet presented his views and mr seward read an elaborate diplomatic dispatch which he had prepared finally mr lincoln read what he termed a few brief remarks upon the subject and asked the opinions of his auditors they unanimously agreed that our side of the question needed no more argument than was contained in the president's few brief remarks mr seward said he would be glad to adopt the remarks and giving them more of the phraseology usual in diplomatic circles send them to lord palmerston the british premier then said secretary stanton came the demonstration the president half wheeling in his seat threw one leg over the chair arm and holding the letter in his hand said seward do you suppose palmerston will understand our position from that letter just as it is certainly mr president do you suppose the london times will certainly do you suppose the average englishman of affairs will certainly it cannot be mistaken in england do you suppose that a hackman out on his box pointing to the street will understand it very readily mr president very well seward i guess we'll let her slide just as she is and the letter did slide and settled the whole business in a manner that was effective brought the husband up one morning president lincoln asked major eckert on duty at the white house who is that woman crying out in the hall what is the matter with her eckert said it was a woman who had come a long distance expecting to go down to the army to see her husband an order had gone out a short time before to allow no women in the army except in special cases mr lincoln sat moodily for a moment after hearing this story and suddenly looking up said 
let's send her down you write the order major major eckert hesitated a moment and replied would it not be better for colonel hardy to write the order yes said mr lincoln that is better let hardy write it the major went out and soon returned saying mr president would it not be better in this case to let the woman's husband come to washington mr lincoln's face lighted up with pleasure yes yes was the president's answer in a relieved tone that's the best way bring him up the order was written and the man was sent to washington no war without bloodletting you can't carry on war without bloodletting said lincoln one day the president although almost feminine in his kind-heartedness knew not only this but also that large bodies of soldiers in camp were at the mercy of diseases of every sort the result being a heavy casualty list of the estimated half million men of the union armies who gave up their lives in the war of the rebellion eighteen sixty one to sixty five fully seventy five per cent died of disease the soldiers killed upon the field of battle constituted a comparatively small proportion of the casualties lincoln's two difficulties london punch caricatured president lincoln in every possible way holding him and the union cause up to the ridicule of the world so far as it could on august twenty third eighteen sixty two its cartoon entitled lincoln's two difficulties had the text underneath lincoln what no money no men punch desired to create the impression that the washington government was in a bad way lacking both money and men for the purpose of putting down the rebellion that the united states treasury was bankrupt and the people of the north so devoid of patriotism that they would not send men for the army to assist in destroying the confederacy the truth is that when this cartoon was printed the north had five hundred thousand men in the field and before the war closed had provided fully two million and a half troops the report of the secretary of the treasury which showed the financial affairs and situation of the united states up to july eighteen sixty two the receipts of the national government for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen sixty two were ten million dollars in excess of the expenditures although the war was costing the country two million dollars per day the credit of the united states was good and business matters were in a satisfactory state the navy by august twenty third eighteen sixty two had received eighteen thousand additional men and was in fine shape the people of the North stood ready to supply anything the government needed, so that, all things taken together, the Punch cartoon was not exactly true, as the facts and figures abundantly proved. White Elephant on His Hands An old and intimate friend from Springfield called on President Lincoln and found him much depressed. The President was reclining on a sofa, but rising suddenly, he said to his friend, you know better than any man living that from my boyhood up my ambition was to be president i am president of one part of this divided country at least but look at me oh i wish i had never been born i've a white elephant on my hands one hard to manage with a fire in my front and rear to contend with the jealousies of the military commanders and not receiving that cordial cooperative support from congress that could reasonably be expected with an active and formidable enemy in the field threatening the very lifeblood of the government my position is anything but a bed of roses when lincoln and grant clashed ward layman one of president lincoln's law partners and his most intimate friend in washington had this to relate i am not aware that there was ever a serious discord or misunderstanding between mr lincoln and general grant except on a single occasion from the commencement of the struggle lincoln's policy was to break the backbone of the confederacy by depriving it of its principal means of subsistence cotton was its vital element deprived of this and the rebellion must necessarily collapse the hon elihu b washburn from the outset was opposed to any contraband traffic with the confederates 
lincoln had given permits and passes through the lines to two persons mr joseph maddox of maryland and general singleton of illinois to enable them to bring cotton and other southern products from virginia washburn heard of it called immediately on mr lincoln and after remonstrating with him on the impropriety of such a demarche threatened to have general grant countermand the permits if they were not revoked naturally both became excited lincoln declared that he did not believe general grant would take upon himself the responsibility of such an act i will show you sir i will show you whether grant will do it or not replied it to mr washburn as he abruptly withdrew by the next boat subsequent to this interview the congressman left washington for the headquarters of general grant he returned shortly afterward to the city and so likewise did maddox and singleton grant had countermanded the permits under all the circumstances it was naturally a source of exultation to mr washburn and his friends and of corresponding surprise and mortification to the president the latter however said nothing further than this i wonder when general grant changed his mind on this subject he was the first man after the commencement of this war to grant a permit for the passage of cotton through the lines and that to his own father the president however never showed any resentment toward general grant in referring afterwards to the subject the president said it made me feel my insignificance keenly at the moment but if my friends washburn henry wilson and others derive pleasure from so unworthy a victory over me i leave them to its full enjoyment this ripple on the otherwise unruffled current of their intercourse did not disturb the personal relations between lincoln and grant but there was little cordiality between the president and messrs washburn and wilson afterwards End of part twelve part thirteen of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part thirteen one james gordon bennett support the story as to how president lincoln won the support of james gordon bennett senior founder of the new york herald is a most interesting one it was one of lincoln's shrewdest political acts and was brought about by the tender in an autograph letter of the french mission to bennett the new york times was the only paper in the metropolis which supported him heartily and president lincoln knew how important it was to have the support of the herald he therefore according to the way colonel mcclure tells it carefully studied how to bring its editor into close touch with himself the outlook for lincoln's re-election was not promising bennett had strongly advocated the nomination of general mcclellan by the democrats and that was ominous of hostility to lincoln and when mcclellan was nominated he was accepted on all sides as a most formidable candidate it was in this emergency that lincoln's political sagacity served him sufficiently to win the herald to his cause and it was done by the confidential tender of the french mission bennett did not break over to lincoln at once but he went by gradual approaches his first step was to declare in favor of an entirely new candidate which was an utter impossibility he opened a leader in the herald on the subject in this way lincoln has proved a failure mcclellan has proved a failure fremont has proved a failure let us have a new candidate lincoln mcclellan and fremont were then all in the field as nominated candidates and the fremont defection was a serious threat to lincoln of course neither lincoln nor mcclellan declined and the herald failing to get the new man it knew to be an impossibility squarely advocated lincoln's re-election without consulting any one and without any public announcement whatever lincoln wrote to bennett asking him to accept the mission to france the offer was declined bennett valued the offer very much more than the office and from that day until the day of the president's death he was one of lincoln's most appreciative friends and hearty supporters on his own independent line stood by the silent man 
once in reply to a delegation which visited the white house the members of which were unusually vociferous in their demands that the silent man as general grant was called should be relieved from duty the president remarked what i want and what the people want is generals who will fight battles and win victories grant has done this and i propose to stand by him this declaration found its way into the newspapers and lincoln was upheld by the people of the north who also wanted generals who will fight battles and win victories a very brainy nubbin president lincoln and secretary of state seward met alexander h stevens vice president of the confederacy on february second eighteen sixty five on the river queen at fortress monroe stevens was enveloped in overcoats and shawls and had the appearance of a fair-sized man he began to take off one wrapping after another until the small shriveled old man stood before them lincoln quietly said to seward this is the largest shucking for so small a nubbin that i ever saw president lincoln had a friendly conference but presented his ultimatum that the one and only condition of peace was that the confederates must cease their resistance sent to his friends during the civil war clement l vallandigham of ohio had shown himself in the national house of representatives and elsewhere one of the bitterest and most outspoken of all the men of that class which insisted that the war was a failure he declared that it was the design of those in power to establish a despotism and that they had no intention of restoring the union he denounced the conscription which had been ordered and declared that men who submitted to be drafted into the army were unworthy to be called free men he spoke of the president as king lincoln such utterances at this time when the government was exerting itself to the utmost to recruit the armies were dangerous and Vallandigham was arrested, tried by court-martial at Cincinnati, and sentenced to be placed in confinement during the war. General Burnside, in command at Cincinnati, approved the sentence and ordered that he be sent to Fort Warren in Boston Harbor, but the president ordered that he be sent beyond our lines into those of his friends. He was therefore escorted to the Confederate lines in Tennessee, thence going to Richmond he did not meet with a very cordial reception there, and finally sought refuge in Canada. Vallandigham died in a most peculiar way some years after the close of the war, and it was thought by many that his death was the result of premeditation upon his part. Go down with colors flying. In August 1864, the president called for 500,000 more men. The country was much depressed, the confederates had in comparatively small force only a short time before been to the very gates of washington and returned almost unharmed the presidential election was impending many thought another call for men at such a time would ensure if not destroy mr lincoln's chance for re-election a friend said as much to him one day after the president had told him of his purpose to make such a call as to my re-election replied mr lincoln it matters not we must have the men if i go down i intend to go like the cumberland with my colors flying all were tragedies the cartoon reproduced below was published in harper's weekly on january thirty first eighteen sixty three the explanatory text underneath reading in this way manager lincoln ladies and gentlemen i regret to say that the tragedy entitled the army of the potomac has been withdrawn on account of quarrels among the leading performers and i have substituted three new and striking farces or burlesques one entitled the repulse of vicksburg by the well-known favorite e m stanton esq and the others the loss of the harriet lane and the exploits of the alabama a very sweet thing in farces i assure you by the veteran composer gideon wells unbounded applause by the copperheads in july after this cartoon appeared the army of the potomac defeated lee at gettysburg and sounded the death knell of the confederacy 
general hooker with his corps from this army opened the tennessee river thus affording some relief to the union troops in chattanooga hooker's men also captured lookout mountain and assisted in taking missionary ridge general grant converted the farce the repulse of vicksburg into a tragedy for the copperheads taking that stronghold on july fourth and captain winslow with the union man-of-war kearsarge meeting the confederate privateer alabama off the coast of france near cherbourg fought the famous ship to a finish and sunk her thus the tragedy of the army of the potomac was given after all and playwright stanton and composer wells were vindicated their compositions having been received by the public with great favor he's the best of us secretary of state seward did not appreciate president lincoln's ability until he had been associated with him for quite a time but he was awakened to a full realization of the greatness of the chief executive all of a sudden having submitted some thoughts for the president's consideration a lengthy paper intended as an outline of the policy both domestic and foreign the administration should pursue he was not more surprised at the magnanimity and kindness of president lincoln's reply than the thorough mastery of the subject displayed by the president a few months later when the secretary had begun to understand mr lincoln he was quick and generous to acknowledge his power executive force and vigor are rare qualities he wrote to mrs seward the president is the best of us how lincoln composed superintendent chandler of the telegraph office in the war department once told how president lincoln wrote telegrams said he mr lincoln frequently wrote telegrams in my office his method of composition was slow and laborious. It was evident that he thought out what he was going to say before he touched his pen to the paper. He would sit looking out of the window, his left elbow on the table, his hand scratching his temple, his lips moving, and frequently he spoke the sentence aloud or in half-whisper. After he was satisfied that he had the proper expression, he would write it out if one examines the originals of mr lincoln's telegrams and letters he will find very few erasures and very little interlining this was because he had them definitely in his mind before writing them in this he was the exact opposite of mr stanton who wrote with feverish haste often scratching out words and interlining frequently sometimes he would seize a sheet which he had filled and impatiently tear it into pieces hamlin might do it several united states senators urged president lincoln to muster southern slaves into the union army lincoln replied gentlemen i have put thousands of muskets into the hands of loyal citizens of tennessee kentucky and western north carolina they have said they could defend themselves if they had guns i have given them guns now these men do not believe in mustering in the negro if i do it these thousands of muskets will be turned against us we should lose more than we should gain being still further urged president lincoln gave them this answer gentlemen he said i can't do it i can't see it as you do you may be right and i may be wrong but i'll tell you what i can do i can resign in favor of mr hamlin perhaps mr hamlin could do it the matter ended there for the time being the gun shot better the president took a lively interest in all new firearm improvements and inventions and it sometimes happened that when an inventor could get nobody else in the government to listen to him the president would personally test his gun a former clerk in the navy department tells an incident illustrative he had stayed late one night at his desk when he heard someone striding up and down the hall muttering i do wonder if they have gone already and left the building all alone looking out the clerk was surprised to see the president good evening said mr lincoln i was just looking for that man who goes shooting with me sometimes the clerk knew mr lincoln referred to a certain messenger of the ordnance department who had been accustomed to going with him to test weapons 
but as this man had gone home the clerk offered his services together they went to the lawn south of the white house where mr lincoln fixed up a target cut from a sheet of white congressional note paper then pacing off a distance of about eighty or a hundred feet writes the clerk he raised the rifle to a level took a quick aim and drove the round of seven shots in quick succession the bullets shooting all around the target like a gatling gun and one striking near the center i believe i can make this gun shoot better said mr lincoln after we had looked at the result of the first fire with this he took from his vest pocket a small wooden sight which he had whittled from a pine stick and adjusted it over the side of the carbine he then shot two rounds and of the fourteen bullets nearly a dozen hit the paper lenient with mcclellan general mcclellan aside from his lack of aggressiveness fretted the president greatly with his complaints about military matters his obtrusive criticism regarding political matters and especially at his insulting declaration to the secretary of war dated june twenty eighth eighteen sixty two just after his retreat to the james river general halleck was made commander-in-chief of the union forces in july eighteen sixty two and september first mcclellan was called to washington the day before he had written his wife that as a matter of self-respect i cannot go there president lincoln and general halleck called at mcclellan's house and the president said as a favor to me i wish you would take command of the fortifications of washington and all the troops for the defense of the capital lincoln thought highly of mcclellan's ability as an organizer and his strength in defense yet any other president would have had him court-martialed for using this language which appeared in mcclellan's letter of june twenty eighth if i save this army now i tell you plainly that i owe no thanks to you or to any other person in washington you have done your best to sacrifice this army this letter though addressed to the secretary of war distinctly embraced the president in the grave charge of conspiracy to defeat mcclellan's army and sacrifice thousands of the lives of his soldiers didn't want a military reputation lincoln was averse to being put up as a military hero when general cass was a candidate for the presidency his friends sought to endow him with a military reputation lincoln at that time a representative in congress delivered a speech before the house which in its allusion to mr cass was exquisitely sarcastic and irresistibly humorous by the way mr speaker said lincoln do you know i am a military hero yes sir in the days of the black hawk war i fought bled and came away speaking of general cass's career reminds me of my own i was not at stillman's defeat but i was about as near it as cass to hull's surrender and like him i saw the place very soon afterwards it is quite certain i did not break my sword for i had none to break but i bent my musket pretty badly on one occasion if general cass went in advance of me picking whortleberries i guess i surpassed him in charging upon the wild onion if he saw any live fighting indians it was more than i did but i had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes and although i never fainted from loss of blood i can truly say that i was often very hungry lincoln concluded by saying that if he ever turned democrat and should run for the presidency he hoped they would not make fun of him by attempting to make him a military hero surrender no slave after march eighteen sixty two general benjamin f butler in command of fortress monroe advised president lincoln that he had determined to regard all slaves coming into his camps as contraband of war and to employ their labor under fair compensation and secretary of war stanton replied to him in behalf of the president approving his course and saying you are not to interfere between master and slave on the one hand nor surrender slaves who may come within your lines this was a significant milestone of progress to the great end that was thereafter to be reached conscripting dead men mr lincoln being found fault with for making another call said that if the country required it he would continue to do so until the matter stood as described by a western provost-marshal who says 
i listened a short time since to a butternut-clad individual who succeeded in making good his escape expatiate most eloquently on the rigidness with which the conscription was enforced south of the tennessee river his response to a question propounded by a citizen ran somewhat in this wise do they conscript close over the river stranger i should think they did they take every man who hasn't been dead more than two days if this is correct the confederacy has at least a ghost of a chance left and of another a methodist minister in kansas living on a small salary who was greatly troubled to get his quarterly installment he at last told the non-paying trustees that he must have his money as he was suffering for the necessaries of life money replied the trustees you preach for money we thought you preached for the good of souls souls responded the reverend i can't eat souls and if i could it would take a thousand such as yours to make a meal the soul is the point sir said the president lincoln's rejected manuscript on february fifth eighteen sixty five president lincoln formulated a message to congress proposing the payment of four hundred million dollars to the south as compensation for slaves lost by emancipation and submitted it to his cabinet only to be unanimously rejected lincoln sadly accepted the decision and filed away the manuscript message together with this endorsement thereon to which his signature was added february five eighteen sixty five today these papers which explain themselves were drawn up and submitted to the cabinet unanimously disapproved by them when the proposed message was disapproved lincoln soberly asked how long will the war last to this none could make answer and he added we are spending now in carrying on the war three million dollars a day which will amount to all this money besides all the lives lincoln as a story writer in his youth mr lincoln once got an idea for a thrilling romantic story one day in springfield he was sitting with his feet on the window sill chatting with an acquaintance when he suddenly changed the drift of the conversation by saying did you ever write out a story in your mind i did when i was a little codger one day a wagon with a lady and two girls and a man broke down near us and while they were fixing up they cooked in our kitchen the woman had books and read us stories and they were the first i had ever heard i took a great fancy to one of the girls and when they were gone i thought of her a great deal and one day when i was sitting out in the sun by the house i wrote out a story in my mind i thought i took my father's horse and followed the wagon and finally i found it and they were surprised to see me i talked with the girl and persuaded her to elope with me and that night i put her on my horse and we started off across the prairie after several hours we came to a camp and when we rode up we found it was one we had left a few hours before and went in the next night we tried again and the same thing happened the horse came back to the same place and then we concluded that we ought not to elope i stayed until i had persuaded her father to give her to me i always meant to write that story out and publish it and i began once but i concluded that it was not much of a story but i think that was the beginning of love with me lincoln's ideas on crossing a river when he got to it lincoln's reply to a springfield illinois clergyman who asked him what was to be his policy on the slavery question was most apt well your question is rather a cool one but i will answer it by telling you a story you know father b the old methodist preacher and you know fox river and its freshets well once in the presence of father b a young methodist was worrying about fox river and expressing fears that he should be prevented from fulfilling some of his appointments by a freshet in the river father b checked him in his gravest manner said he young man i have always made it a rule in my life not to cross fox river till i get to it and said the president i am not going to worry myself over the slavery question till i get to it a few days afterward a methodist minister called on the president and on being presented to him said simply mr president i have come to tell you that i think we have got to fox river 
Lincoln thanked the clergyman and laughed heartily. President nominated first. The day of Lincoln's second nomination for the presidency, he forgot all about the Republican National Convention sitting at Baltimore and wandered over to the War Department. While there, a telegram came announcing the nomination of Johnson as vice president. What, said Lincoln to the operator, do they nominate a vice president before they do a president? Why, replied the astonished official, have you not heard of your own nomination? It was sent to the White House two hours ago. It is all right, replied the president. I shall probably find it on my return. Them Guillotines the illustrated newspaper of the United States and England had a good deal of fun not only with President Lincoln, but the latter's cabinet officers and military commanders as well. It was said by these funny publications that the President had set up a guillotine in his backyard, where all those who offended were beheaded with both neatness and dispatch. Harper's Weekly of January 3rd, 1863, contained a cartoon labeled Those Guillotines, a Little Incident at the White House, the personages figuring in the incident being Secretary of War Stanton and a Union general who had been unfortunate enough to lose a battle to the Confederates. Beneath the cartoon was the following dialogue. Servant, if you please, sir, them guillotines has a robe. Mr. Lincoln, all right, Michael. Now, gentlemen, will you be kind enough to step out in the back yard? The hair and whiskers of Secretary of War Stanton are ruffled and awry, and his features are not calm and undisturbed, indicating that he has an idea of what's the matter in that back yard. The countenance of the officer in the rear of the Secretary of War wears rather an anxious or worried look, and his hair isn't combed smoothly either. President Lincoln's frequent changes among army commanders before he found Grant, Sherman, and Sheridan afforded an opportunity the characterist did not neglect, and some very clever cartoons were the consequence. Consider the Sympathy of Lincoln Consider the Sympathy of Abraham Lincoln. Do you know the story of William Scott, Private? He was a boy from a Vermont farm. There had been a long march, and the night succeeding it he had stood on picket. The next day there had been another long march, and that night William Scott had volunteered to stand guard in the place of a sick comrade who had been drawn for the duty. It was too much for William Scott. He was too tired. He had been found sleeping on his beat. The army was at Chain Bridge. It was in a dangerous neighborhood. Discipline must be kept. William Scott was apprehended, tried by court-martial, sentenced to be shot. News of the case was carried to Lincoln. William Scott was a prisoner in his tent, expecting to be shot next day. But the flaps of his tent were parted, and Lincoln stood before him. Scott said, The President was the kindest man I had ever seen. I knew him at once by a Lincoln medal I had long worn. I was scared at first, for I had never before talked with a great man, but Mr. Lincoln was so easy with me, so gentle, that I soon forgot my fright. He asked me all about the people at home, the neighbors, the farm, and where I went to school, and who my schoolmates were. Then he asked me about mother and how she looked, and I was glad I could take her photograph from my bosom and show it to him. He said how thankful I ought to be that my mother still lived, and how, if he were in my place, he would try to make her a proud mother, and never cause her a sorrow or a tear. I cannot remember it all, but every word was so kind. He had said nothing yet about that dreadful next morning. I thought it must be that he was so kind-hearted that he didn't like to speak of it. But why did he say so much about my mother, and my not causing her a sorrow or a tear, when I knew that I must die the next morning? but I supposed that was something that would have to go unexplained, and so I determined to brace up and tell him that I did not feel a bit guilty, and asked him wouldn't he fix it so that the firing party would not be from our regiment. That was going to be the hardest of all, to die by the hands of my comrades. Just as I was going to ask him this favor, he stood up, and he says to me, My boy, stand up here and look me in the face. I did as he bade me. 
my boy he said you are not going to be shot to-morrow i believe you when you tell me that you could not keep awake i am going to trust you and send you back to your regiment but i have been put to a good deal of trouble on your account i have had to come up here from washington when i have got a great deal to do and what i want to know is how are you going to pay my bill there was a great lump in my throat i could scarcely speak i had expected to die you see and had kind of got used to thinking that way to have it all changed in a minute but i got it crowded down and managed to say i am grateful mr lincoln i hope i am as grateful as ever a man can be to you for saving my life but it comes upon me sudden and unexpected like i didn't lay out for it at all but there is some way to pay you and i will find it after a little there is the bounty in the savings bank i guess we could borrow some money on the mortgage of the farm there was my pay was something and if he would wait until payday i was sure the boys would help so i thought we could make it up if it wasn't more than five or six hundred dollars but it is a great deal more than that he said then i said i didn't see how but i was sure i would find some way if i lived then mr lincoln put his hands on my shoulders and looked into my face as if he was sorry and said my boy my bill is a very large one your friends cannot pay it nor your bounty nor the farm nor all your comrades there is only one man in all the world who can pay it and his name is william scott if from this day william scott does his duty so that if i was there when he comes to die he can look at me in the face as he does now and say i have kept my promise and i have done my duty as a soldier then my debt will be paid will you make that promise and try to keep it the promise was given thenceforward there never was such a soldier as william scott this is the record of the end it was after one of the awful battles of the peninsula he was shot all to pieces he said boys i shall never see another battle i suppose this would be my last i haven't much to say you all know what you can tell them at home about me i have tried to do the right thing if any of you ever have the chance i wish you would tell president lincoln that i have never forgotten the kind words he said to me at the chain bridge that i have tried to be a good soldier and true to the flag that i should have paid my whole debt to him if i had lived and that now when i know that i am dying i think of his kind face and thank him again because he gave me the chance to fall like a soldier in battle and not like a coward by the hands of my comrades what wonder that secretary sandon said as he gazed upon the tall form and kindly face as he lay there smitten down by the assassin's bullet there lies the most perfect ruler of men who ever lived End of part 13part fourteen of lincoln's yarns and stories by alexander k mcclure this librivox recording is in the public domain part fourteen saved a life one day during the black hawk war a poor old indian came into the camp with a paper of safe conduct from general lewis cass in his possession the members of lincoln's company were greatly exasperated by late indian barbarities among them the horrible murder of a number of women and children and were about to kill him they said the safe conduct paper was a forgery and approached the old savage with muskets cocked to shoot him lincoln rushed forward struck up the weapons with his hands and standing in front of the victim declared to the indian that he should not be killed it was with great difficulty that the men could be kept from their purpose but the courage and firmness of lincoln thwarted them lincoln was physically one of the bravest of men as his company discovered lincoln played ball frank p blair of chicago tells an incident showing mr lincoln's love for children and how thoroughly he entered into all of their sports during the war my grandfather francis p blair sr lived at silver springs north of washington seven miles from the white house it was a magnificent place of four or five hundred acres with an extensive lawn in the rear of the house 
the grandchildren gathered there frequently there were eight or ten of us our ages ranging from eight to twelve years although i was but seven or eight years of age mr lincoln's visits were of such importance to us boys as to leave a clear impression on my memory he drove out to the place quite frequently we boys for hours at a time played town ball on the vast lawn and mr lincoln would join ardently in the sport i remember vividly how he ran with the children how long were his strides and how far his coat tails stuck out behind and how we tried to hit him with the ball as he ran the bases he entered into the spirit of the play as completely as any of us and we invariably hailed his coming with delight his passes to richmond not honored a man called upon the president and solicited a pass for richmond well said the president i would be very happy to oblige if my passes were respected but the fact is sir i have within the past two years given passes to two hundred and fifty thousand men to go to richmond and not one has got there yet the applicant quietly and respectfully withdrew on his tiptoes public hangman for the united states a certain united states senator who believed that every man who believed in secession should be hanged asked the president what he intended to do when the war was over reconstruct the machinery of the government quickly replied lincoln you are certainly crazy was the senator's heated response you talk as if treason was not henceforth to be made odious but that the traitors cutthroats and authors of this war should not only go unpunished but receive encouragement to repeat their treason with impunity they should be hanged higher than haman sir yes higher than any malefactor the world has ever known the president was entirely unmoved but after a moment's pause put a question which all but drove his visitor insane now senator suppose that when this hanging arrangement has been agreed upon you accept the post of chief executioner if you will take the office i will make you a brigadier general and public hangman for the united states that would just about suit you wouldn't it i am a gentleman sir returned the senator and i certainly thought you knew me to be better than to believe me capable of doing such dirty work you are jesting mr president the president was extremely patient exhibiting no sign of ire and to this bit of temper on the part of the senator responded well you speak of being a gentleman yet you forget that in this free country all men are equal the vagrant and the gentleman standing on the same ground when it comes to rights and duties particularly in time of war therefore being a gentleman as you claim and a law-abiding citizen i trust you are not exempt from doing even the dirty work at which your high spirit revolts this was too much for the senator who quitted the room abruptly and never again showed his face in the white house while lincoln occupied it he won't bother me again was the president's remark as he departed few but boisterous lincoln was a very quiet man and went about his business in a quiet way making the least possible noise he heartily disliked those boisterous people who were constantly deluging him with advice and shouting at the tops of their voices whenever they appeared at the white house these noisy people create a great clamor said he one day in conversation with some personal friends and remind me by the way of a good story i heard out in illinois while i was practicing or trying to practice some law there i will say though that i practice more law than i ever got paid for a fellow who lived just out of town on the bank of a large marsh conceived a big idea in the money-making line he took it to a prominent merchant and began to develop his plans and specifications there are at least ten million frogs in that marsh near me and i'll just arrest a couple of carloads of em and hand them over to you you can send them to the big cities and make lots of money for both of us frogs legs are great delicacies in the big towns and not very plentiful it won't take me more than two or three days to pick em they make so much noise my family can't sleep and by this deal i'll get rid of a nuisance and gather in some cash the merchant agreed to the proposition promised the fellow he would pay him well for the two carloads 
two days passed then three and finally two weeks were gone before the fellow showed up again carrying a small basket he looked weary and done up and he wasn't talkative a bit he threw the basket on the counter with the remark there's your frogs you haven't got two carloads in that basket have you inquired the merchant no was the reply and there ain't no two carloads in all this blasted world i thought you said there were at least ten millions of em in that marsh near you according to the noise they made observed the merchant your people couldn't sleep because of em well said the fellow according to the noise they made there was i thought a hundred million of em but when i had waited and swum that there marsh day and night for two blessed weeks i couldn't harvest but six there's two or three left yet and the marsh is as noisy as it used to be we haven't catched up on any of our lost sleep yet now you can have these here six and i won't charge you a cent for em you can see by this little yarn remarked the president that these boisterous people make too much noise in proportion to their numbers keep pegging away being asked one time by an anxious visitor as to what he would do in certain contingencies provided the rebellion was not subdued after three or four years of effort on the part of the government oh replied the president there is no alternative but to keep pegging away beware of the tale after the issue of the emancipation proclamation governor morgan of new york was at the white house one day when the president said i do not agree with those who say that slavery is dead we are like whalers who have been long on a chase we have at last got the harpoon into the monster but we must now look how we steer or with one flop of his tail he will yet send us all into eternity lincoln's dream president lincoln was depicted as a headsman in a cartoon printed in frank leslie's illustrated newspaper on february fourteenth eighteen sixty three the title of the picture being lincoln's dreams or there's a good time coming the cartoon reproduced here represents on the right the union generals who had been defeated by the confederates in battle and had suffered decapitation in consequence mcdowell who lost at bull run mcclellan who failed to take richmond when within twelve miles of that city and no opposition comparatively and burnside who was so badly whipped at fredericksburg to the left of the block where the president is standing with the bloody axe in his hand are shown the members of the cabinet secretary of state seward secretary of war stanton secretary of the navy wells and others each awaiting his turn this part of the dream was never realized however as the president did not decapitate any of his cabinet officers it was the idea of the cartoonist to hold lincoln up as a man who would not countenance failure upon the part of subordinates but visit the severest punishment upon those commanders who did not win victories after burnside's defeat at fredericksburg he was relieved by hooker who suffered disaster at chancellorsville hooker was relieved by meade who won at gettysburg but was refused promotion because he did not follow up and crush lee rosecrans was all but defeated at chickamauga and gave way to grant who of all the union commanders had never suffered defeat grant was lincoln's ideal fighting man and the old commander was never superseded there was no need of a story dr hovey of dansville new york thought he would call and see the president upon arriving at the white house he found the president on horseback ready for a start approaching him he said uh, president lincoln i thought i would call and see you before leaving the city and hear you tell a story the president greeted him pleasantly and asked where he was from from western new york well that's a good enough country without stories replied the president and off he rode lincoln a man of simple habits lincoln's habits at the white house were as simple as they were at his old home in illinois he never alluded to himself as president or as occupying the presidency his office he always designated as the place call me lincoln said he to a friend mr president had become so very tiresome to him 
if you see a newsboy down the street send him up this way said he to a passenger as he stood waiting for the morning news at his gate friends cautioned him about exposing himself so openly in the midst of enemies but he never heeded them he frequently walked the streets at night entirely unprotected and felt any check upon his movements a great annoyance he delighted to see his familiar western friends and he gave them always a cordial welcome he met them on the old footing and fell at once into the accustomed habits of talk and storytelling an old acquaintance with his wife visited washington mr and mrs lincoln proposed to these friends a ride in the presidential carriage it should be stated in advance that the two men had probably never seen each other with gloves on in their lives unless when they were used as protection from the cold the question of each lincoln at the white house and his friend at the hotel was whether he should wear gloves of course the ladies urged gloves but lincoln only put his in his pocket to be used or not according to the circumstances when the presidential party arrived at the hotel to take in their friends they found the gentleman overcome by his wife's persuasions very handsomely gloved the moment he took his seat he began to draw off the clinging kids while lincoln began to draw his on oh no 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 protested his friend tugging at his gloves it is none of my doings put up your gloves mr lincoln so the two old friends were on even and easy terms and had their ride after their old fashion his last speech president lincoln was reading the draft of a speech edward the conservative but dignified butler of the white house was seen struggling with tad and trying to drag him back from the window from which was waving a confederate flag captured in some fight and given to the boy edward conquered and tad rushing to find his father met him coming forward to make as it proved his last speech the speech began with these words we meet this evening not in sorrow but in gladness of heart having his speech written in loose leaves and being compelled to hold a candle in the other hand he would let the loose leaves drop to the floor one by one tad picked them up as they fell and impatiently called for more as they fell from his father's hand forgot everything he knew before president lincoln while entertaining a few select friends is said to have related the following anecdote of a man who knew too much he was a careful painstaking fellow who always wanted to be absolutely exact and as a result he frequently got the ill will of his less careful superiors during the administration of president jackson there was a singular young gentleman employed in the public post office in washington his name was g he was from tennessee the son of a widow a neighbor of the president on which account the old hero had a kind feeling for him and always got him out of difficulties with some of the higher officials to whom his singular interference was distasteful among other things it is said of him that while employed in the general post office on one occasion he had to copy a letter to major h a high official in answer to an application made by an old gentleman in virginia or pennsylvania for the establishment of a new post office the writer of the letter said the application could not be granted in consequence of the applicant's proximity to another office when the letter came into g s hand to copy being a great stickler for plainness he altered proximity to nearness to major h observed it and asked g why he altered his letter why replied g because i don't think the man would understand what you mean by proximity well said major h try him put in the proximity again in a few days a letter was received from the applicant in which he very indignantly said that his father had fought for liberty in the second war for independence and he should like to have the name of the scoundrel who brought the charge of proximity or anything else wrong against him there said g did i not say so g carried his improvement so far that mr barry the postmaster general said to him i don't want you any longer you know too much poor g went out but his old friend got him another place 
This time G's ideas underwent a change. He was one day very busy writing when a stranger called in and asked him where the patent office was. I don't know, said G. Can you tell me where the Treasury Department is, said the stranger. No, said G. Nor the President's house? No. The stranger finally asked him if he knew where the Capitol was. No, replied G. Do you live in Washington, sir? Yes, sir, said G. Good Lord, and don't you know where the patent office is, treasury, president's house, and capital are? Stranger, said G, I was turned out of the post office for knowing too much. I don't mean to offend in that way again. I am paid for keeping this book. I believe I know that much, but if you find me knowing anything more, you may take my head. Good morning, said the stranger. Lincoln believed in education. That every man may receive at least a moderate education, and thereby be enabled to read the histories of his own and other countries, by which he may duly appreciate the value of our free institutions, appears to be an object of vital importance. Even on this account alone, to say nothing of the advantages and satisfaction to be derived from all being able to read the scriptures and other works both of a religious and moral nature for themselves. For my part, I desire to see the time when education, by its means, morality, sobriety, enterprise, and integrity, shall become much more general than at present, and should be gratified to have it in my power to contribute something to the advancement of any measure which might have a tendency to accelerate the happy period. Lincoln on the Dred Scott Decision in a speech at Springfield, Illinois, June 26, 1857, Lincoln referred to the decision of Chief Justice Roger B. Taney of the United States Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case in this manner. The Chief Justice does not directly assert, but plainly assumes as a fact, that the public estimate of the black man is more favorable now than it was in the days of the Revolution. In those days, by common consent, the spread of the black man's bondage in the new countries was prohibited, but now Congress decides that it will not continue the prohibition, and the Supreme Court decides that it could not if it would. In those days, our Declaration of Independence was held sacred by all, and thought to include all, but now, to aid in making the bondage of the Negro universal and eternal, it is assailed and sneered at, and constructed and hawked at, and torn, till, if its framers could rise from their graves, they could not at all recognize it. All the powers of earth seem combining against the slave. Mammon is after him, ambition follows, philosophy follows, and the theology of the day is fast joining the cry. Lincoln made many notable speeches. Abraham Lincoln made many notable addresses and speeches during his career previous to the time of his election to the presidency. However, beautiful in thought and expression as they are, they were not appreciated by those who heard and read them until after the people of the United States and the world had come to understand the man who delivered them. Lincoln had the rare and valuable faculty of putting the most sublime feeling into his speeches, and he never found it necessary to encumber his wisest, wittiest, and most famous sayings with a weakening mass of words. He put his thoughts into the simplest language so that all might comprehend, and he never said anything which was not full of the deepest meanings. What Ailed the Boys Mr. Roland Diller, who was one of Mr. Lincoln's neighbors in Springfield, tells the following. I was called to the door one day by the cries of children in the street, and there was Mr. Lincoln striding by with two of his boys, both of whom were wailing aloud. Why, Mr. Lincoln, what is the matter with the boys? I asked. Just what's the matter with the whole world, Lincoln replied. I've got three walnuts and each wants two tad's confederate flag one of the prettiest incidents in the closing days of the civil war occurred when the troops marching home again passed in grand form if with well-worn uniforms and tattered bunting before the white house 
naturally an immense crowd had assembled on the streets the lawns porches balconies and windows even those of the executive mansion itself being crowded to excess a central figure was that of the president abraham lincoln who with bared head unfurled and waved our nation's flag in the midst of lusty cheers but suddenly there was an unexpected sight a small boy leaned forward and sent streaming to the air the banner of the boys in gray it was an old flag which had been captured from the confederates and which the urchin the president's second son tad had obtained possession of and considered an additional triumph to unfurl on this all-important day vainly did the servant who had followed him to the window plead with him to desist no master tad pet of the white house was not to be prevented from adding to the loyal demonstration of the hour to his surprise however the crowd viewed it differently had it floated from any other window in the capitol that day no doubt it would have been the target of contempt and abuse but when the president understanding what had happened turned with a smile on his grand plain face and showed his approval by a gesture and expression cheer after cheer rent the air called blessings on the american women president lincoln attended a ladies fair for the benefit of the union soldiers at washington march sixteenth eighteen sixty four in his remarks he said i appear to say but a word this extraordinary war in which we are engaged falls heavily upon all classes of people but the most heavily upon the soldiers for it has been said all that a man hath will he give for his life and while all contribute of their substance the soldier puts his life at stake and often yields it up in his country's cause the highest merit then is due the soldiers in this extraordinary war extraordinary developments have manifested themselves such as have not been seen in former wars and among these manifestations nothing has been more remarkable than these fairs for the relief of suffering soldiers and their families and the chief agents in these fairs are the women of america i am not accustomed to the use of language of eulogy i have never studied the art of paying compliments to women but i must say that if all that has been said by orators and poets since the creation of the world in praise of women were applied to the women of america it would not do them justice for their conduct during the war i will close by saying god bless the women of america lincoln's order number two five two after the united states had enlisted former negro slaves as soldiers to fight alongside the northern troops for the maintenance of the integrity of the union so great was the indignation of the confederate government that president davis declared he would not recognize blacks captured in battle and in uniform as prisoners of war this meant that he would have them return to their previous owners have them flogged and fined for running away from their masters or even shot if he felt like it this attitude of the president of the confederate states of america led to the promulgation of president lincoln's famous order number no. two five two which in effect was a notification to the commanding officers of the southern forces that if negro prisoners of war were not treated as such the union commanders would retaliate harper's weekly of august fifteenth eighteen sixty three contained a clever cartoon which we reproduce representing president lincoln holding the south by the collar while old abe shouts the following words of warning to jeff davis who cat a nine tails in hand is in pursuit of a terrified little negro boy mr lincoln look here jeff davis if you lay a finger on that boy to hurt him i'll lick this ugly cub of yours within an inch of his life much to the surprise of the confederates the negro soldiers fought valiantly they were fearless when well led obeyed orders without hesitation were amenable to discipline and were eager and anxious at all times to do their duty in battle they were formidable opponents and in using the bayonet were the equal of the best trained troops the southerners hated them beyond power of expression talked to the negroes of richmond 
the president walked through the streets of richmond without a guard except a few seamen in company with his son tad and admiral porter on april fourth eighteen sixty five the day following the evacuation of the city colored people gathered about him on every side eager to see and thank their liberator mr lincoln addressed the following remarks to one of these gatherings my poor friends you are free free as air you can cast off the name of slave and trample upon it it will come to you no more liberty is your birthright god gave it to you as he gave it to others and it is a sin that you have been deprived of it for so many years but you must try to deserve this priceless boon let the world see that you merit it and are able to maintain it by your good work don't let your joy carry you into excesses learn the laws and obey them obey god's commandments and thank him for giving you liberty for to him you owe all things there now let me pass on i have but little time to spare i want to see the capital and must return at once to washington to secure to you that liberty which you seem to prize so highly abe added a saving clause lincoln fell in love with miss mary s owens about eighteen thirty three or so and while she was attracted toward him she was not passionately fond of him lincoln's letter of proposal of marriage sent by him to miss owens while singular unique and decidedly unconventional was certainly not very ardent he after the fashion of the lawyer presented the matter very cautiously and pleaded his own cause then presented her side of the case advised her not to do it and agreed to abide by her decision miss owens respected lincoln but promptly rejected him really very much to abe's relief how jack was done up not far from new salem illinois at a place called clary's grove a gang of frontier ruffians had established headquarters and the champion wrestler of the grove was jack armstrong a bully of the worst type learning that abraham was something of a wrestler himself jack sent him a challenge at that time and in that community a refusal would have resulted in social and business ostracism not to mention the stigma of cowardice which would attach it was a great day for new salem and the grove when lincoln and armstrong met settlers within a radius of fifty miles flocked to the scene and the wagers laid were heavy and many armstrong proved a weakling in the hands of the powerful kentuckian and jack's adherents were about to mob lincoln when the latter's friend saved him from probable death by rushing to the rescue End of part fourteen